Um, okay, guys, everybody, we're going to get uh, started today. Um, Education, Energy, and Environment Committee has 11 bills today. And I'm just looking around to make sure we've got a quorum of which we we do. We've got six members, so we're, we're good to go. Um, let me just go through, since we're up to a bigger number, I'm going to go through what the, or, the sequence, at least tentatively, subject to change later. But the bill order will be as follows. Uh, we're going to start with Senate Bill 386, then Senate Bill 320, Senate Bill 447, Senate Bill 392, Senate Bill 517, Senate Bill 407, Senate Bill 275, Senate Bill 390, Senate Bill 483, and then the last two bills, Senate Bill 417 and Senate Bill 327. And if you're watching um, online, this order will be on the, the website, the General Assembly website. So uh, the sequence um, is there if you want to go take a look at it later. In any event, we're going to start with uh, Senator Hester uh, on Senate Bill 386 to lead off and start the day. So, Senator, if you want to go up on Senate Bill 386, we don't have a designated um, sponsor panel, so we do have several witnesses signed up in favor, but uh, no sponsor panel. So why don't you lead off and then we'll go to the uh, in-person witnesses and um, take it from there. So, Senator Esther. Thank you very much, Chair, members of the Triple E Committee, um, for your consideration of Senate Bill 386. If any of you have gone fishing recently in the Chesapeake Bay or its many tributaries, you've probably caught a blue catfish. In fact, I would be surprised if you haven't, considering that they make up more than 70% of the fish biomass in some of our rivers. However, you may be surprised to hear that blue catfish is not native to Maryland. It's an invader from Mississippi, Missouri, Ohio, and the Rio Grande River basins. Now, these invasive species pose a significant threat to the health of the Chesapeake Bay. They decimate our native species of blue crabs, striped bass, oysters, and a result threaten the health of our ecosystems and the livelihoods of our watermen. One method of managing invasive species is to increase market demand for them in culinary settings. Thankfully, blue catfish is both delicious and nutritious. Delicious and nutritious, everyone. And we've already have a mechanism to increase market demand for local food. For those of you who were here a couple of years ago, we sponsored and passed legislation to strengthen local food markets by incentivizing Maryland schools and our state agencies to purchase from the certified local farm enterprises. This program has gotten off to an excellent start since, since its establishment. However, a few technical changes are necessary to include the invasive species, such as catfish, in this program. So just for an example, in all of our, our state institution contracts right now, there is a specific line item for local food. Um, DGS also holds bi-monthly meetings with over 300 uh, people in procurement to talk about this issue, um, mm -hmm. and they already have a contract for the purchase of blue catfish. So what Senate Bill 386 does is it makes these technical changes and places reasonable guardrails to ensure that we are only incentivizing the capture of specific invasive, invasive species. We've also requested a technical amendment um, after speaking with the Department of Agriculture to move the effective date forward and to add a reporting requirement, as well as to update the program's name. Senate Bill 386 will support restoration of the Chesapeake Bay by transforming an economic and environmental burden into a state asset. For these reasons, I respectfully request a favorable report on Senate Bill 386. Okay, thank you. Any uh, questions for the sponsor, Senator Hester? Okay, seeing none, we're going to go now to a uh, list of three witnesses signed up favorable in person. Uh, Mark Powell, Matt Stegman, and Allison uh, Colden. And so if you three could come up, uh, you're all signed up favorable with no amendments. And um, why don't we start in maybe the order I, I called you up, Mr. Powell, do you want to lead off? And then we'll go to the other two witnesses. And each of you have two and a half minutes. Thank you, uh, Chair and, and members of the uh, of the committee. <clears throat> My name is Mark Powell. I'm chief of the marketing section at the Department of Agriculture. We run the certified uh, local farm enterprise program uh, and, and my section. 
We have worked really hard to make sure that all the state agencies are aware of the program and we work to uh, and make sure that all the farmers are aware of this potential market. Um, we've had some success and as, as we started out, uh, the prisons have included local food in their procurements um, and we've had some success with the University of Maryland. <clears throat> There's still much work to be done, however, and um, we'll push forward with that. The, um, the inclusion of blue catfish will be uh, an amazing achievement for the state, um, and we ask for your support for this bill. Um, the, uh, as the senator had mentioned, blue catfish is an invasive species, and we at the department with our seafood marketing program have worked diligently to increase demand for the uh, blue catfish. Uh, we have reached out to something in the neighborhood of 90,000 consumers with direct marketing sampling of, of blue catfish and a variety of events uh, since 2017. We have spent in the order of $230,000 to promote blue catfish and advertising promotions. We are currently working with Maryland Public Television on a documentary promoting blue catfish for this year. Um, and we have worked with the Maryland Food Bank, granting them $500,000 through a federal initiative to purchase uh, blue catfish, uh, among other things. The um, harvest of blue catfish has gone from 935,000 pounds in 2015 to over 2.2 million in 2021. Sit, and that value back to the waterman has gone from $341,000 to $1.6 million currently. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Why don't we go through the whole panel and then we'll open up to questions. Um, so why don't you tell us your name, uh, whoever wants to go next, take control of the mic. Okay. Um, Mr. Stegman, why don't you uh, tell us who you are, and then you get two nephews. Sure. Um, Matt Stegman from the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, and uh, I would yield all of my time to my colleague, Allison Gold. Thank Except, you, Mr. Yeah, Chair. we don't really let you yield. You don't get five minutes now. That's not how it works. <laughs> but, uh, Ms. yes, uh, Ms. Colden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, I'm Dr. Allison Colden, Senior Fisheries Scientist with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, here today in support of Senate Bill 386. As been mentioned by Senator Hester and Mr. Powell, these are a significant ecological threat to the Chesapeake Bay. They were first introduced in the 1970s and 80s in Virginia. Um, however, since that time have made their way into nearly every uh, river and tributary in the Chesapeake Bay, including many of our waters in Maryland. They're having a significant ecological impact on our native species, including commercially and recreationally important species like rockfish um, and especially blue crabs, which uh, per last year's winter dredge slavery, we're at the lowest number on record. So we have some significant concerns for the impacts that these blue catfish and other invasive species are having on our native fish and crab species. As was mentioned, uh, Senate Bill 386 would help increase the market demand. Um, not only that, it would help keep that uh, protein here in Maryland, which was also a great goal. Um, I also serve as a member of the Chesapeake Bay Program Invasive Catfish Task Force, which in August 2020 put out a report identifying increased commercial harvest as one of our main management recommendations. So we believe that this bill uh, is in line with helping increase that market demand and help uh, get more of these catfish out of the Chesapeake Bay and hopefully help to mitigate the impacts that they're having on our native species. So I would urge your favorable report. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Segwin, you you uh, indicated you were not testifying. Um, any questions for any of the panelists? Okay, seeing none, uh, we have one additional witness signed up. Steve McHenry signed up fa favorable with amendments. Mr. McHenry, why don't you come on up? And um, again, you've got two and a half minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My name is Steve McHenry. I serve as Executive Director of the Maryland Agricultural and Resource-Based Industry Development Corporation otherwise known as Mar Bidcal. Uh, we actually have a, a potential role to play in what's being proposed here today in that we administer the local certified farm enterprise program, aggreg aggregation grant program, which is now uh, going into its third year. We have $435,000 annually appropriated to this program with uh, two more years coming. And what this legislation would do would be to allow us to 
make grants once the bill is effective to help uh, seafood processors uh, aggregate and process blue catfish for institutional and wholesale resale purposes. So we strongly support this bill. Uh, blue catfish is a high priority uh, for Marbitco. We've uh, just written a, a large USDA grant to try to get some grant funding to deal with the blue catfish prob uh, problem. We don't know whether we're going to get the grant or not, but it's something we're working on. And uh, the amendment I would suggest is the effective date of this bill is October 1st. I would ask that you move forward to July 1st, the effective date, so we could make grants sooner uh, once this legislation is approved. And we're hoping that you do that. And as such, we support this bill with the amendment. Thank you. Okay. Um... We've got Senator Carroza. You've got a question for Mr. McHenry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I really appreciated that uh, testimony. And when you were talking about the, the grant fund that you administer and involving seafood processors, uh, can you just very quickly, how many now, any from the shore? Just was looking for an update there. Well, the legislation as it currently exists, the laws that exist does not speak to seafood processors. It, it seeks specifically only to food aggregation and processing for the certified local farm enterprise program, which is targeted to, to conventional farmers, not seafood processors per se. What this legislation would do would be to allow us to make grants to seafood processors in the future if they were processing blue catfish. Thank you. Okay, any additional questions for this witness? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the bill hearing on uh, Senate Bill 386. We're going to next turn to uh, Senate Bill 320, Senator Brooks, and I'm going to call up your two sponsor panelists. We've got Stephanie Boyles Griffin, uh, and actually the other sponsor panelist is virtual, so let's hold off on uh, your virtual witness until we're done with the live. Okay. So is um, Ms. Ms. Stephanie Boyles Griffin, why don't you con come on up? And um, Senator Brooks, you've got the time you need to uh, present Senate Bill 320. All right, thanks, Chair. Uh, Chair Feldman, Vice Chair Kagan, and members of my, uh, my committee. Uh, for the record, I'm uh, Senator Ben Brooks, representing the 10th Legislative District in Baltimore County. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you on uh, SB 320, that's the Natural Resources Wildlife Advisory Commission membership. Uh, the purpose, purpose of this bill is to expand the membership of the Wild, Wildlife Advisory Committee. Uh, currently, the commission members must include representation from farming community. Uh, SB uh, 320 expands the membership from nine to 10 members. It also expands the composition of the commission to include the hunting community the wildlife preservation community, the passive wildlife recreation community, and, and academic research with expertise in wildlife biology, wildlife conservation, wildlife management, or ecology. Uh, the Maryland Wildlife Advisory Commission was created to advise the Secretary of the Department of Natural Resources on Wildlife Matters. Uh, their task ranges from overseeing hunting licenses to protecting and conserving Maryland's wildlife resources. For the commission to adequately perform its duties, it must include a diverse array of stakeholders. Now, SB 320, as amended, will enhance the commission by combining scientific and naturalist expertise. Uh, for that reason, I request a favorable report. Now. Okay, yeah, let's go to the two uh, sponsor panelists, witness one. In person, one virtual, and then we'll open up to questions. So, Ms. Stephanie Boyles Griffin. You thank you, up. Chair, and thank you, members of the committee. So, I'm Stephanie Boyles Griffin, and I serve as a senior scientist for the Humane Society of the United States. I also served as a commissioner on the Maryland Wildlife Advisory Commission for 11 years. Um, SB 320 codifies a historical practice of having a wildlife preservation group represented and participating as a member of the Wildlife Advisory Commission. This ensures diverse voices on the commission at a time when we have seen some significant transitions and historic practice of including a preservation member has recently been disregarded. This bill also ensures that the Wildlife Advisory Commission includes at least one biologist as a member of the commission. 
The Wildlife and Heritage Service staff are consummate professionals, and there is tremendous value in having biologists serve as members of the Wildlife Commission who understand wildlife science and can help translate their hard work to the full commission. The Humane Society of the United States is proud to have support from hunters of Maryland behind this bill. We believe that the amendments that have been worked out to the satisfaction of all parties involved and those amendments noted uh, by the Senator are uh, the 10th member to be added and then striking and or fishing from uh, the, uh, the proposed bill uh, as requested by the sponsor. So thank you. Okay, thank you for your testimony. We're gonna let's go uh, to our virtual witness, who's also signed up favorable um, on part of the sponsor panel, uh, Kimberly Fullerton. Um, I see you. You've got two and a half minutes to um, weigh in here. Okay, Miss Fullerton. Good afternoon. Thank you. My name is Kim Fullerton. I'm chair of the American Bar Association's Wildlife Subcommittee. And today I represent the Maryland State Bar Association's Animal Law Section. And the MSBA supports this bill for two very easy reasons. The first being that board membership should include diverse representation from key stakeholders. And the updates outlined in this bill <clears throat> make sure that the very different voices of all of your constituents will be heard. But equally important is that DNR absolutely needs and will benefit from an academic advisor. Environmental science is a complex technical field that is deeply intertwined with DNR's responsibilities. DNR should be guided by reliable scientific data and institutional knowledge. Fortunately, Maryland has some of the best environmental policy programs in the country. This means that we have a deep well of top tier talent that we are capable of attracting and retaining and that are ready to serve on this commission. Maryland academia is a powerhouse in environmental policy and the University of Maryland Law School's environmental program actually serves as the secretariat for the International Union for Conservation of Nature, which is an incredibly prestigious honor. The IUCN is the global authority on sustainable development. They consult with governments worldwide and the United Nations. And I highlight this fact because it shows just how impressive Maryland's academic researchers are to the entire world. Even at our last Bar Association meeting, we had GW's environmental law dean speaking to our legal community. He's another world-renowned expert. This is something that no matter what field you're in, their advice is relevant and it's very important. This bill ensures that this gold mine of information will be available to DNR and will directly benefit our state. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions for either the sponsor or his two sponsor panelists? Yep. Uh, Senator Augustine. Thank you, Chair Feldman. Um, thank you, Senator, for bringing the bill. As always, I just kind of look at people's testimony and I know that we're going to hear from the, I'm assuming we're gonna hear from the Maryland Horse Council, but I did wanna just ask you if you had seen their favorable request with amendment that would include um, mounted fox chasers, uh, foot pack chasers, et cetera, um, that they shared. Did you get it? Did you receive that? Uh, yes, I did. And, and, and did you consider that, have you, have you and your folks, have you considered that and whether or not that makes sense to incorporate into this? Uh, we, um, we saw it, but, uh, I thought that they had gotten together and agreed that, uh, uh concluded on that, the, on the amendment, the amendment that was submitted was, 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 uh, was, was good as is. Okay. The one that you had, the one that you previously submitted, you felt covered. What? Yes, yes, yes. They, yeah. They, they had met and agreed to that. So. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Sure. Okay, well, we're going to have the horse council to clarify. Any other additional uh, questions for either uh, the two sponsor panelists, witnesses, or the sponsor? And before we go to the next witness, Senator Brooks, uh, looks like you somebody's pointing something out. If you want to amend or clarify your response, Senator Augustine, we're good. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, yes. Uh, the, well, the horse council not considering two specific chasers can still fit in the in using any of the enumerated slots or any unenumerated slot. Well, we're good. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll figure it out. Okay. okay. We'll any out. additional uh, questions for the the panel? 
Okay, seeing none. Um, so let's next move to the aforementioned Maryland Horse Council okay. testimony. Jane Sigler, um, Ms. Sigler, why don't you con oh, come up you. here on behalf of the Maryland Horse Council? And you've got two and a half minutes. And if you want to address in part Senator Augustine's uh, question about amendments when you proffering and what was discussed earlier. Yes, I will. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My name again is Jane Sigler, and I'm here for the Maryland Horse Council. Um, uh, first of all, we really applaud this intention to expand the diversity of viewpoints and, and perspectives on the Wildlife Advisory Commission. As Senator Augustine pointed out, we do want to request an additional clarification. Um, although we agree with the additional categories that have been added, and we agree with what I understand the um, hunters have asked for, which is changing um, in line C, changing the word preservation to conservation. If that happens, that would be good. But we also wanted to point out that there's an additional category of participants historic that has historically had representation on the commission um, that are not really covered effectively by any of the listed categories here. And that's the mounted fox chasers and the unmounted foot packs, the beaglers and things like that, because they don't really cat they don't really qualify as passive because they are active and they don't really qualify as hunters because they have no intent to harvest the quarry. And so as some of you may be familiar that there is a kind of rule of statutory construction that once you start listing things, that when you omit something, that there's an intent to omit it. And so we wanted to make sure that that we didn't run into that problem in the future by adding an additional category, which is just, it would be uh, number E, the mounted and unmounted chasing communities. So with those amendments, we would urge the favorable report of the bill. Okay, do we have any questions for Ms. Sigler? Okay, seeing none, uh, that concludes the bill hearing on Senate Bill 320. Uh, we're gonna next turn to Senator Carroza. Senate Bill 447. I'm going to call up your two sponsor panelists, Andrew Cassily, somebody familiar to the General Assembly, and um, Holly Porter. Ms. Porter. Senator Carroza, um, you've got the time you need to present Senate Bill 447. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, for the record, Senator Mary Beth Carosa representing Worcester, Wicomico, and Somerset counties. And I want to uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to present Senate Bill 447, Anaerobic Digestion Work Group, and to respectfully ask for your support. And I thank my co sponsors, uh, Senators Hester and Gallian, as well. Um, this simply would create a work group composed of the stakeholders to identify recommendations for the thoughtful expansion of anaerobic digesters throughout the state. The work group would look at the design, construction, and operation of these facilities, identify and examine categories of digested produced during the anaerobic digestion, and appropriate uses to recycle the digested and examine options for incentivizing the use of the digested as agricultural fertilizer and manufactured topsoil. The digested produced by anaerobic digestion currently is classified as an approved soil conditioner under the Maryland Commercial Fertil Fertilizer Law. The work group would consider incentives for the use of this organic soil amendment produced by this process. Uh, and for my colleagues, um, I actually was able to see this in person. So now uh, reading this, I kind of better understand this. Um, anaerobic digestion is a process through which bacteria breaks down organic matter, such as animal manure, wastewater, biosolids, and food waste. This process creates a product known as biogas, and when purified, Biogas is a renewable energy that can be used to provide heat, generate electricity, fuel our vehicles, and create other energy products. And one of the um, witnesses, Andrew Castley with Bioenergy Devco, will go into a little bit more detail about that process. Um, many of you may know that anaerobic digestion is hugely beneficial to our farmers in ways that more traditional waste management sim systems simply do not offer. 
For example, anaerobic digesters can destroy more than 90% of disease-causing bacteria. It helps keep the soil healthy and it protects local water resources by reducing nutrient runoff. It also allows farms to be more energy independent. As an example, uh, right in my district in uh, Pocomoke in Worcester County, Millennium Farms is a 50 acre farm with an anaerobic digester facility that has been in operations since 2017. And this facility converts 1,200 tons of poultry litter from the farm into a nutrient rich soil conditioner sold under the brand name Element Soil. And based on the success of this facility, the operating company is currently working on building a second larger anaerobic digestion facility in Somerset County and intends to work on various agriculture related projects in cooperation with the University of Maryland Eastern Shore which I represent and which supports this legislation. I also wanted to note that during my visit um, early on when uh, this was just getting off the ground, there were um, scientists on the site um, that were involved with uh, from UMES and University of Maryland College Park. I also wanted to point out uh, the support of um, uh, Clean Bay Renewables. And this is an EnviroTech company founded in 2013 and focus on the sustainable management of agricultural byproducts through anaerobic digestion and nutrient recovery technologies. And there, again, are many benefits of biomass anaerobic digestion and clean bays closed loop process is clean from start to finish. Each of clean bays utility scale facilities will safely recycle more than 15, 150,000 tons of poultry litter each year, offering a sustainable byproduct management solution for the agricultural community. According to uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, anaerobic digesters on livestock farms generate enough energy to supply 53,000 homes in 2013. So that was 10 years ago. My colleagues, this is an untapped renewable energy source in Maryland. And the establishment of the anaerobic digestion work group to include all stakeholders would address current and future needs of this important industry. I would like to uh, point out the support of the uh, Maryland Department of the Environment, uh, Maryland Coastal Bays, University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Um, anticipating Senator Augustine's question, I have gone through the testimony and it has come to my attention that others may want to be included in the work group. We welcome their involvement. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, I really believe that right now we have a really unique opportunity through the work group to pull together the stakeholders and to really um, take this process forward. And there will be opportunities, some of you may know that the Biden administration has also uh, set aside a large amount of money uh, for this um, process. So again, um, all this bill does is establishes the work group, we want to work with all of those um, who are interested um, in this process. And I would ask for a favorable report of SB 447. Okay, thank you, Senator Carroza. Uh, do you have a preference as to who goes next? Uh, I think um, Mr. Castley. Okay, Mr. Castley, you've got two and a half minutes. Thank you, Chair Feldman, uh, Vice Chair Kagan, esteemed members of the E3 committee for the record. Andrew Castley testifying on behalf of Bioenergy Devco. Before I get started, I wanted to thank some of you who have actually come out to our organics recycling facility and taken a tour. Uh, we always appreciate that. And any of you that would like to come pay us a visit during the interim, please reach out. We'd love to have you. Um, everyone we can get, uh, a big part of what we're trying to do is educate the uh, community at large. So with that, 
Ladies and gentlemen, global scientists and environmentalists alike all agree that anaerobic digesters hold great promise for our future. Promise to capture harmful greenhouse gases and recycle them as renewable energy source. Promise in diverting organic material from landfills and incinerators and reducing emissions. And promise in reducing man-made synthetic fertilizers through production of organic nutrient-rich soil amendment. While this technology holds great promise, we need to make sure that we're getting off on the right foot. As you may recall, some of you in 2017, this body created a work group to look at organic waste diversion and commercial composting. At that meeting, the resulting uh, a report, that was report that came out of that work group created a framework for our composting industry as we know today. Several of their recommendations have now become law. That work group, like the one that we're asking for today in this legislation, brought all the stakeholders together so that we could make sure that we were considering all the impacts of this new industry. As anaerobic digesting continues to grow and expand across the state, this work group will help ensure we're identifying best practices, ensure that we have positive success. And with that, I would ask for a favorable report. Thank you. And, and I was one of the folks I did take that tour and I enjoyed it. Um, we're going to next move to uh, to Holly Porter. Uh, Ms. Porter, you got two and a half minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Holly Porter. I'm the executive director of the Delmarva Chicken Association, who represents our chicken companies, growers, and allied businesses on the Maryland's eastern shore. We are here today in support of Senate Bill 447. The chicken community has been leaders among agriculture and sustainability and environmental awareness since our beginnings 100 years ago this year, actually. It takes 75% fewer resources to produce the same amount of chicken today than in the 1960s, and 95% of poultry litter is recycled and reused as organic locally produced fertilizer for crops. We were one of the first groups to in the region to adopt the use of solar energy, and we were one of the first to study and implement ways in which our processing waste and byproducts can be reused with the Purdue Agro Recycle Center. The burgeoning technology of anaerobic digestion has the potential to recycle poultry processing waste and, produ and produce clean burning natural gas for Delmarva consumers. The byproduct can then be used as a nutritious soil amendment with little to no smell for area grain farmers, which is part of our three-legged stool. This is a green technology through and through, and just one of many tools in the toolbox that agriculture is looking at for sustainability. It prevents waste from going to landfills, being land applied, or burdening wastewater treatment plants, and it decreases reliance on natural grass gas from other resources. It really is a win-win. Despite the Eastern Shore having one of the highest concentrations of poultry in the U.S., anaerobic digestion is really still in its infancy on Delmarva. This work group will bring diverse stakeholders together from various backgrounds and be able to help us better understand, utilize, and regulate in Maryland. It's, simp it's not a stamp of approval or an incentive. It is simply bringing folks together to talk more and better understand how we, this can be beneficial to our state. And with that, we urge a favorable report. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions for the sponsor or for two witnesses? We've got Vice Chair Kagan, and then we'll go to Senator Heston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm in the testimony, and there is there are folks who have concerns about this. And I note I'm in the Clean Water Action um, testimony. And one of the things that they are concerned about is the timetable. They think it's too brief. Um, I'm not sure whether I agree with that, but and they are also concerned about the breadth and expertise of the members of the work group. And so I wonder two things. Um, uh, one is it says this goes out of existence after a year. And I think that makes sense in terms of uh, if there's no other action taken, because you want to possibly have legislation next year. But also, are you open to expanding, diversifying, including more folks and with more background on this work group so that everyone can feel like they are heard? Because this um, is going to go fast. Uh, right? Thank you, Vice Chair. I'll answer part of it. And then I'll defer to um, Mr. Castley since um, given his experience with the composting work group. Um, 
when we saw, when I saw the testimony yesterday and there were some concerns, I actually immediately got on the phone and just started to um, try to make some contacts there to say, you know, we want to bring the right people together. And what I also tried to demonstrate um, is that my experience so far with this um, technology has been that they have been including, you know, as I said, when I was literally on this farm in Pocomoke, we have scientists on the ground in University of Maryland, Eastern Shore. So um, I absolutely um, appreciate the suggestions um, as far as, um, you know, making sure that we have, you know, all the stakeholders involved. We don't necessarily want to, um, you know, do the amendment here at this hearing, but we can, you know, maybe work through. But um, that was the reason why, as soon as I saw the testimony, I started to make some phone calls to say, we want to, you know, we want to work with you. Senator, thanks for the thoughtful question. I'll, I'll address this. The first part of, to your question about having experts, as you know, um, it's not uncommon having served on these work groups. And I know how much legislators appreciate the opportunity to serve on these work groups. Um, it's not uncommon for the work group to bring in professionals to to report to the the work group as a whole. So um, it, it's the idea is not to bring in all of the experts, but to have the experts available for the work group to hear um, reports and things like that. So the fact that we haven't brought in soil experts and things like that on the work group does not preclude them from coming before the work group to to testify. Um, thank you both for those responses. Let me just suggest, like in my 911 commission, sometimes it helps when people know they have a vote, they're invested, and they they know that their voice is heard, not just for a few minutes at one meeting. So I leave it to you all to think about it if this bill is going to move forward. Um, but I have always thought chicken litter to energy is kind of like, you know, making lemonade out of lemons and making a good thing happen out of something that is going to exist. And the question is how, where, whether, how, you know, and, and just the parameters and devils in the details, but um, learning more and having conversation makes sense to me personally. And former delegate, former uh, gubernatorial staffer, Cassily, it's great to have you back. Thank Glad you're still going to be around. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, Senator. We're going to go to Senator Hester. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you to the bill sponsor. I really appreciate this this thoughtful bill. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of it. And quick funny story: I when I went to a certain agricultural college in upstate New York, and one of my professors there had a, a nonprofit called Cow Power. So 25 years ago, he was trying to use this technology to turn you know manure into into energy. But anyways, um, long story short, I'm aware that this the technology has changed and that the industry is growing rapidly. And so um, it seems like there is some urgency around this work group. It's not just like any old work group. Like, why is this necessary now? I, um, I will respond probably more parochial and then I will turn that over to um, Mr. Castley. Um, it was clear to me being um, on the ground, seeing this um, in my district that, um, they had, you know, they had the goals in mind, but the the structure and um, process that 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 you normally would build around an industry wasn't there yet. And now that I see that with success, um, you know, that they've been able to convert this chicken waste um, into not not only energy but also um, soil. But then. Um, and they're talking about expanding in another part of my district and working more closely with UMES. It occurred to me that they're doing a lot on their own and that if we, and this is an industry that obviously should be statewide and have some um, guardrails and regulations in place. And, and that is the sense of urgency right now. And you, you may want to sure. expand on Thank that. Thank you, Senator. So uh, another aspect to this is um, if we were to simplify it, anything that rots can be digested. And so this industry has great promise, not only for rural areas, but urban areas as well. And that's why I welcome you to come take a look at our facility in Jessup, where we're doing 100% food scrap recycling, because it will break down just like manure and multiple other things. Um, we see the industry really as it's moving forward with new incentives. There's going to be multiple players and we see it kind of emerging into different marks. The markets, there'll be uh, kind of like an agricultural type of a market. There will be an urban 
market. Um, and we're going to see this technology being used on other types of um, existing industries, like, for example, the wastewater treatment industry. Um, it's oftentimes it's difficult in our rural areas to maintain those facilities, the cost to maintain them. And right now they're currently flaring off methane. So it would only make sense to capture that, to, to kind of mitigate some of the costs in operating those facilities. So because of that, we see it emerging in so many different areas. That's, that is the importance of why we get this right, because it's not going to move forward in one area. It's going to move forward across the board. And we're going to see that um, as it starts to take off, we really better make sure that we have our guardrails in place so that we're not seeing unintended consequences down the line. Thank you for the question. Sure. So it, and I'll add uh, two points as well, too. So speaking specifically with millennials, so we have a number of farmers and, and growers out there who are always looking for um, ways to be better. And so, again, you know, speaking millennial farm, I think, did very much uh, start from the ground up in a lot of ways. And I think that this is just a great opportunity where we can get it right. We can just see more on-farm opportunities that may be out there. The second thing I would say to the why now would be for any uh, farmers who have looked at commercial fertilizer prices right now. And I'm sure Senator Gallion, who's also on this, can speak to that. Um, you know, the that is very, very important um, in order to grow a crop, in order to grow those uh, grain crops that we need. Um, but it's also a very expensive part of the input. So again, if there are other ways, and I will say too, it's a finite resource in, in many ways. Uh, phosphorus uh, itself and the commercial side is is not is finite in getting, but we do know that we have it very much in our chicken litter. So again, if we have ways that we can utilize and have uh, products that are, um, as locally sourced as possible and reduce that need on commercial fertilizer. Again, that's really, really important for farmers and for producing our food right now. Okay, any additional questions? Okay, Senator, uh, Vice Chair Kagan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick thing, and I'm just going to sort of, I'm not going to put you on the spot, Senator, but for you to think about, I see that there's one Senator and one delegate and Often that's appropriate, but if we want to get rural and environmentalists and Democrats and Republicans in different parts of the state, so we bring the expertise and a diversity of attitudes and, and all that, maybe if you want to think about increasing that to two and two or something, but again, I'm not looking for an answer. I'm just looking to put that out there for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, any additional questions for the panel? Okay, seeing none, we're going to move to a fable with amendment witness, Pam Casemeyer. Um, Ms. Casemeyer, why don't you come up? You're signed up uh, able with an amendment or amendments. And you get you have two and a half minutes. I'm going to give you some time back, <laughs> hopefully. Um, hello, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Pam Casemeyer. I'm here on behalf of the Maryland Delaware Solid Waste Association. We're essentially, we're the Maryland chapter for the National Waste and Recycling Association. Basically, we're the private sector side. We're the haulers, collectors. We have recycling facilities and, and a lot of other things. And we're here supporting this bill because, as you heard from the proponents, anaerobic digestion is a new, not new technology, but there's, as we're struggling to figure out how to deal with organic waste, it's it's potentially a great um component part of doing that effectively and efficiently. As you've heard, there's other people who want to be added to the committee. I just wanted to say that um, already in the bill, there are two members from two different national associations that are in the waste industry. They're local members, um, but there's no, pri that SWANA is really public sector and the recycling network is, is a different component part. And we're really the private sector and you kind of need a little bit of all of those to figure out how to do this effectively. So we submitted an amendment to be added along with everyone else. Other than that, we uh, recommend a favorable report because we think it is technology that we need to um, better focus in on. Okay, any uh, questions for Ms. Casemeyer? Okay, seeing none, thank you. We've got two witnesses signed up virtual, both unfavorable. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna start with uh, Sophia Jones. So um, we're gonna try to, I see, okay, there you are, Sophia Jones. Uh, unmute yourself. And you've got two and a half minutes. You're signed up unfavorable. 
Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. I'm Sophia Jones testifying today on behalf of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. My organization has been working for decades to advance infrastructure for organics processing in Maryland and across the country. While we're honored to be named as one of the members of this work group, unfortunately, we must oppose the bill for a number of reasons. Firstly, we're not in favor of work groups in general because they often delay implementation of needed policy and generally produce skewed reports that disproportionately reflect the vested interests at the table and rarely incorporate minority stakeholder viewpoints. Our initial director, Brenda Platt, served on Maryland's 2018 study group on organics materials diversion and infrastructure. That study group already studied organics management options, including anaerobic digestion. We don't need to reinvent the wheel here, especially considering that many of that study group's recommendations have yet to be addressed. A minor point to add is that the Institute for Local Self-Reliance was not consulted before being explicitly named as a member of this work group, though we do consider it important for us to be included in order to balance the vested interests at the table. We do also question the impetus for the bill and the narrow focus on anaerobic digestion, as if it's the sole system to handle the state's organic materials. We must ask why would the state spend its resources focusing on building markets for just one industry and essentially one company, potentially shutting out farmers and other appropriate technologies and systems. To be clear, we do support anaerobic digestion as an organics management option. What we're concerned about is the likelihood of anaerobic digestion facilities producing contaminated products. We believe that PFAS, as well as physical and other chemical contamination, should be a primary issue area addressed by this work group. So overall, we think that in order to be successful in making infrastructure recommendations, this bill would have to be completely rewritten to change the work group's work mandate and composition. For these reasons, we must sadly oppose this bill. Thank you. Okay, any questions for Ms. Jones? Okay, seeing none. Uh, we have one final witness on the bill. We've got uh, also signed up unfavorable. We've got uh, Gab Gabrielle uh, Ross. Ms. Ross, I'm gonna try to cue you up. There you are. Uh, Ms. Ross, uh, you're signed up again unfavorable and you've got a total of two minutes, two and a half minutes. Thanks very much, Senator. Appreciate that. Uh, dear members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity today to submit testimony in opposition to SB 447. On behalf of our partners that have co-signed this um, and Sentinels for Eastern Shore Health who couldn't be here today, um, we are strongly opposing this bill. Uh, and ILSR, ILSR submitted uh, testimony unfavorable too for reasons we definitely agree on as well. To date, um, there have been numerous studies done on this topic, including a financial feasibility study from the University of Maryland, uh, permitting guidance from MDE, and as well as several University of Maryland studies, uh, as well as operating facilities down in Pocomoke, as the Senator Carosa mentioned. Uh, to date, we invested many dollars on these studies. We are currently concerned and have a few questions that we would like to raise for the committee. One is why do more taxpayer dollars need to be fund to uh, to be funded for additional research? Why were groups like ILSR not consulted before this bill was even drafted? And number three is why is this work group lacking environmental and public health scientists, Maryland Commission on Environmental Justice and Sustainable Communities, and community stakeholder groups? The work group makeup is heavily biased and in, even including a trade group for the industry and industry leaders, but seems to be lacking in scientists, public health experts, and environmental justice leaders. The language in the bill seems to have a predetermined outcome before the work even starts. And tasking the group to identify and ex examine options for incentivizing the use of the digestate produced during anaerobic digestion as uh, agricultural fertilizer and manufactured topsoil. Again, we are talking about incentives before the work group ever meets, even though there have been several studies done on this already. The work group has also not been tasked with researching the various health and safety concerns. There is no mention of the research for PFAS or PFOAs in the digestate, which is the byproduct, the forever chemicals which are contaminating our farmland and also found in biosolids, which is also considered an approved soil amendment. 
Um, there is no mention of research regarding emissions or the safety of those emissions of the communities that will be nearby these anaerobic digesters. Any major industry seeking incentives to operate should have clear peer-reviewed and third-party study information that their business will not adversely affect the local residents. The proposals we've seen to date on the Delmarva Peninsula, thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Ms. Ross. Any questions for the witness? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the uh, bill hearing on Senate Bill 447, and we're going to next turn to Senator McCray uh, to come up here on Senate Bill 392, and we are, this bill is uh, jointly assigned to the Budget and Taxation Committee, and we are joined by Senator Sarah Elfrith from that committee. Um, Senator McCray, uh, we've got five witnesses uh, designated as sponsor panelists. We've got four seats up there, so we'll I'll call all five. One of you may have to take a the seat in the front row there, and we'll make room for you uh, when somebody else is done testifying. But I'm going to uh, call up Matt Stegman, Michael Hallman, Nina Themelis, Jason Mitchell. Let's see, until we fill up uh, the seats here. Okay, and then the fifth witness is uh, um, Jennifer Iosa. Siosa. Okay, so Miss, uh, why don't you get in the front row there, and then when somebody's done, we'll they'll yield a seat to you, and then we'll go through the panel and we'll take questions. So Senator McCray, uh, you've got uh, the time you need to present Senate Bill three nine two. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. First, I just want to start by apologizing. You all will see that I never have this many people on a panel for any bill that's ever been presented before EEE. But I would like to say that just the level of seriousness is why I thought that it was incumbent and important to be able to bring it so that you all have uh, all facts as to why this bill is important. So, Mr. Chair, uh, Madam Vice Chair, when I think about uh, our wastewater treatment facilities, unfortunately, I live in a city that kind of made national news uh, uh, this year in reference to one of our water treatment facilities. And as uh, chair at the time of PST, Public Safety, Transportation and Environment, and a member of the Maryland State Senate for Baltimore City, I thought it was incumbent that I just dig into the issue, even though I wasn't super familiar with the issue. And colleagues, as I dug into the issue, I, I had meetings, a number of meetings with my director, Jason Mitchell, with uh, Dr. Glass over at MES, with, uh, at the time, the secretary, uh, Horatio Tablada, to better understand like what was going on at my wastewater treatment facility. We toured the facility. Um, so as a, as a committee, we toured the facility. We even had a briefing um, just a couple weeks ago on wastewater treatment plants. And I realized that this isn't just, while we have the larger ones, that there are also smaller wastewater treatment plants that are dealing with the same issues that happen at my specific plant. And what came out of that, I realized that capital wasn't the issue. When we went in, uh, MES was able to do an emergency procurement, Mr. Chair, and be able to address some of the capital needs that was necessary. But one of the things that I realized that kept popping up was the staffing piece. And then being on the budget committee, being on the budget committee, you realize that we supplement our public safety uh, uh, agencies a number through state operating dollars. So we do that from a retention because we want to retain police. We want to make sure that we hire police and things of that nature through our local law enforcement grants. And I question, why don't we think about that from an environmental standpoint? Why don't we think about that from our water waste standpoint? Why don't we think about that from the Chesapeake Bay? And that's where the formation of Senate Bill 392 comes from, from talking to all of these subject matter experts, and I'd say the best subject matter experts are on EEE, I uh, won't say our name, but, the, uh, uh, but helping to craft the bill to be able to uh, just move forward with this direction. And what this bill does, Mr. Chair, is it looks at what we do from a public safety standpoint and it applies it to the environmental. Make sure that we have the resources, that $10 million appropriation, a $3 million cap for the facility to make sure that from a staffing standpoint, and just so that you all understand the, the seriousness of this. So when I go to my plant, the reality is, is that a number of folks were there were not certified. So they didn't have that level of certification, but they were working towards that certification. And what happens is once they did get that certification, you know what they did? They went to another wastewater treatment facility. We even heard it when we had the briefing. 
I questioned uh, MES, Maryland Environmental Services, and said, hey, help me understand what does your vacancy look like? And I asked this question of everybody that came there. And then they said, hey, we do a great job. I think they were under 5%. But they also talked about Howard County plucking off one of their members of uh, 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 um, that was working for that specific space. The folks that have the resources, the folks that have this piece of it are the ones that are attracting the talent. And we need to make sure that we're bringing up all, not some of our wastewater treatment facilities, uh, colleagues. I also think about um, the point and, and just wanna leave with just applauding Baltimore City and Baltimore County, because I do think that they're working together um, to address this issue. I, I know that my county executive and our mayor have collectively come together to make sure that we can think about what does the task force look like? What does the future of wastewater look like uh, uh, from that standpoint? But I do think that the state can do a little bit more. For example, the folks that are working right next to the people at our plant that work for MES, all they're doing is receiving a premium level of pay. That's why they're able to find these folks to help supplement the services there. That's a temporary solution, Mr. Chair. That's not a longevity solution. I do think that Senate Bill 392 contributes to the longevity of how we move forward versus the temporary solutions. I have a phenomenal panel um, uh, put together. Uh, what Baltimore City, Baltimore County, environmentalists that just like to also emphasize why Senate Bill 392, and I hope that you all will vote for a favorable report. Okay, Senator McCree, why don't you, do you have a particular sequence here, I'll defer to you as a sponsor. It's probably important to start with the director. Okay, Mr. Director, why don't you tell us your name, and then you got each of you will have two and a half minutes to testify. Perfect. Good afternoon, uh, I'm Mr. Chair and, and Madam Vice Chair. Uh, my name is Jason Mitchell. I am the director of the Public Works Department in Baltimore City. I'm here with me as as Mike Holman. He's our wastewater uh, facilities chief uh, that managed both Patapsco Wastewater Treatment Plant and Back River Wastewater Treatment Plant. Uh, we are here to support Senate Bill 397. Our 392 uh, is critical for us. And I, I, I thank the gentleman, uh, Senator McRae, for bringing this bill forward. As you know, over the last uh, year and a half, we have struggled uh, to pull our wastewater treatment plants back into compliance. Um, I was here a couple of weeks ago uh, uh, speaking to the great work and the great partnership with MDE, MES, and really putting both treatment plants back in compliance. But as we look at long-term compliance of this uh, facilities in these facilities, uh, we, we must begin to look at number one, how do we shore up our staffing? As, as, as we have our Be War More Wise program, which really looking at staff development. How are we competitive with salaries? How can we give people retention bonuses so they can stay? And once we, get folks that have that certifi certification, the Senator, Senator McCray point, how do we keep them here in Baltimore City, working at some of the most sophisticated treatment plants here in the country? Uh, over the last decade or so, we have uh, implemented uh, and upgraded many assets at these facilities. Um, and as such, uh, there's been a, a huge capital investment, but with every capital, capital investment, there's an O&M investment. And what we've seen over the last five years is that O&M investment has increased 241% over the last five years. And so how do we maintain that? And that's going to be critical. And, and this bill helps support, support that. But last but not least, as we do and look at this bill, our number one concern is our ratepayers. And we don't want our ratepayers to think about, do I get good quality water for my family? or do I be able to provide a meal for my family? And by providing this level of support helps this utility be able to stabilize our rates going forward. So with that, I want to thank the Senator and we want to support uh, Senate Bill 392 um, and all the components of it. And thank you for yielding this up to me. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Any, um, well, let's go through the whole panel then we'll do some question and answer. Senator McRae, you want to designate your next witness? Sir, uh, you got two and a half minutes. Tell us your name. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Michael Holman. I'm the chief of wastewater facilities division for the city of Baltimore. I oversee the operation of uh, both the Back River Wastewater Treatment Plant and the Patapsco Wastewater Treatment Plants um, in, in conjunction with uh, a number of the conveyance pumping stations. Um, to, to, to piggyback a little bit on what Director Mitchell um, was just speaking about, uh, some of our biggest challenges while there were the necessary capital investments that we've needed to invest over the past 
year, year to year, year and a half. Um, our biggest challenge is, again, it, it involves staffing and training. As we have added these new enhanced nutrient removal facilities, which are far more complex and uh, uh, far more intensive as far as maintaining um, all of the equipment, the technology that's there, uh, you know, the, the, the real challenges come in line with uh, having the adequate staff and adequately trained staff in order to be able to uh, sufficiently operate and maintain those facilities. And we've experienced, as uh, Director Mitchell had mentioned, you know, a number of challenges along those fronts. Um, so, you know, I, I would fully support and, and the city would fully support this bill um, in an effort to help uh, the city be able to retain that talent that we're taking our time and effort and investment in um, uh, 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 to continue to retain that uh, so that way we can uh, be resilient, um, which is the, the the key message from the hearings a, a, a week or two ago um, with MDE and MES. It's always about resiliency and retention and the longevity so that way we can uh, attain those Chesapeake, uh, 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 Chesapeake Bay restoration goals. Um, and in order for us to do that, we'd have to be able to, uh, to, to staff these, these facilities. And it is an industry-wide problem. I think that anybody that would talk uh, at, at any of the conferences with any other leaders of the other municipalities, they would all hear the same thing. It would just be an echo chamber. The staffing, retention, and training are the three things that are, are missing um, in, their, in their businesses and that are absolutely difficult for them to, uh, uh, to maintain and stay competitive with our increasing regulations there um, for water quality. So I was I would I would just ask that the that 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 the committee um, support this bill um, going forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Why don't we go to the other side of the table, um, Mr. Stegman? Do you want to grab the mic? Uh, why don't you go grab it? You've got two and a half minutes. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. Uh, once again, Matt Stegman on behalf of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Uh, we're the uh, largest environmental organization in the state of Maryland dedicated to the health and water quality of the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, as a result, we've had a uh, vested interest in uh, you know, making sure that uh, our uh, local partners are doing everything uh, available and have every tool available uh, to better manage our um, uh, wastewater and stormwater systems. Uh, two things about this bill that we thought were uh, really important to highlight. Uh, one is it does have a uh, equity component uh, prioritizing uh, plants where there is the uh, greatest number of uh, customers that are uh, low income and, and that serve the greatest number of customers. And uh, secondly, that the funds provided for this grant are uh, additive to and supplemental to uh, grants provided through the Bay Restoration Fund. Uh, we want to make sure that the uh, very important programs that are uh, funded through the uh, BRF um, are uh, that that we're not making a trade off in other things that improve our water quality to address this uh, really uh, acute concern. So uh, we appreciate the bill and would ask the committee for a favorable report. Okay, why don't you pass that mic right next to you? All right. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Feldman, Vice Chair Kagan, and members of the committees. My name is Nina Themelis. I serve as Interim Director of the Mayor's Office of Government Relations for Baltimore City, and I'm here to testify in support of SB uh, 392. I want to thank the Senator for bringing forward this bill. Uh, as you know, the city of Baltimore owns and operates two of the largest wastewater treatment plants, Back River and Patapsco. Uh, these facilities provide regional service to more than 1.6 million customers. Um, I want to just underscore the points made by uh, the director of the department um, as far as the need uh, to provide additional opportunities to bring in staff um, while we look to further um, hiring and retention. Um, the, well, sorry. <laughs> So um, I really, I don't have anything additional to say. I just want to thank the Senator, thank the committee for consideration. And I uh, want to request a favorable report for SB 392. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we're going to go to our, the final part of the sponsor panel. Uh, I've got Jennifer Aosa and uh, you're from Baltimore County Executive's Office. Yes, sir. So uh, why don't you tell us your name for the record and then two and a half minutes. All righty. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, uh, Madam Vice Chair, and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Jen Ayosa. Um, I am here on behalf of Baltimore County Executive John Ofshesky, Jr., um, and we're here in support of Senate Bill 392. 
Um, I think it's important to note that before coming to the county executive's office, I spent the last 25 years working on issues of water quality here in Maryland. Um, and I agree with what my uh, my former my uh, my colleagues on this panel have said. For almost two decades, Maryland's Bay Restoration Fund has successfully deployed um, uh, up uh, funding to upgrade the largest wastewater treatment facilities across the state. Um, so that we were all reaching enhanced uh, nutrient removal to reduce pollution to the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries. These facilities often use state-of-the-art technology that requires well-trained, certified, and adequately compensated staff to operate, maintain, and troubleshoot potential problems to ensure that these facilities are operating in the way that they were intended. Recognizing that operation and maintenance um, of these advanced systems is paramount to their operations, the Bay Restoration Fund currently authorizes um, grants to certain wastewater treatment facilities with ENR to help offset some operation and maintenance costs. We see Senate Bill 392 as building on this in an important way by creating a new competitive grant program that really focuses on some of the largest facilities across the state. Um, this is gonna help overcome challenges as my colleagues uh, suggested related to staffing shortages um, and, and backlogs of, of maintenance. Um, if the pandemic taught us anything, it's that um, we all need well-qualified staff who are willing to show up every day. Um, it also requires this annual appropriation to specifically address these additional needs. It's no secret that this would certainly benefit the Baltimore region, but I do want to remind you that this would also benefit quite a few other large ENR uh, wastewater treatment facilities around the state. Um, we certainly thank Senator McCray for his leadership on this bill, and I'm here to offer um, full-hearted support from Baltimore County. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, we'll open up to questions for anybody on the panel. We're going to start uh, with Senator Hester. Thank you very much, and thank you, Senator, for bringing this really um, important bill. I, I definitely um, agree that we're short-staffed in a number of different state and county positions. Um, I have... Uh, wanted to quickly uh, point out that the cybersecurity package from last year requires our wastewater treatment uh, plants to ensure that they're to do an assessment to make sure they're not vulnerable to attacks because we don't want you know malactors attacking our drinking water and I, I believe one of the problems with this is that we lack the staff you know to, to actually you know who are qualified to do this I fully support the bill my question is around the the, the, the mechanism of the grant funding and maybe you know from the public from the police side, you know, I've heard previously that it's not great to fund staff through grants because they don't have the long-term insurance that they'll have a good, well-paying job. Um, are you confident that that this model of, of providing the grants to increase the salaries will, will work? That, that's a phenomenal question. So from my research, I do feel confident that DPW is working towards that. They've set up a number of different apprenticeship programs, a number of training programs, and they've also done, I believe, the study to kind of think about what does the forward trajectory of the wages look like. I do think that we need some level of a piece uh, of that gap at this moment. I think that uh, this isn't a one year type of thing because I think that you need it consistently over a certain period of time. I do think that we should be mindful that there are other folks that are uh, dealing with these issues. So like we think about every, the, the entire state, knowing that perhaps going back forever are some of the largest, but I do feel confident that DPW has a plan. If I look five, 10 years from now, I'm thinking about year one, year two, year three, and I think that we can have a role in it. Okay, we're going to go to our special guest, Senator Elfrith, and then we're going to go back to Senator Washington. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Senator, thank you for bringing the bill forward. I have a question for Director Mitchell, if, if that's appropriate. Um, Director Mitchell, appreciating the, the great work and investment that's gone in, uh, particularly Back River, in the last year, um, the current law allows, from my understanding, uh, O&M funding to go to wastewater treatment plants that are a year in compliance with ENR, and you're almost there for Back River. Is that correct? I just want the we heard it upstairs in the briefing a few weeks back, but um, how many months away is Back River from meeting that one year? Uh, it'll be in June. In June. Yes. Okay, so almost there. Um, just want to clarify that you're on track uh, under cur current law, but appreciating that there is a great need as well. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Washington. 
Um, thank you. And it's great to have someone for the budget committee because I actually wanted to ask a question and it probably it's actually to the panel or whoever could answer it. You, you specifically said that you did not want any of these funds to come out of the Bay Restoration Fund. Is that, that correct? So yes, we don't want them to supplant. We want them to supplement. That's right. So I, I was just looking through this section of the code and obviously we, we voted on it last year, um, but there are, are a number of transfers out of the Bay Restoration Fund to like the Clean Water Commerce account and yeah so just to just to remind me and help me you know understand um our yeah so help me understand where i guess in fiscal year 2020 we did a lot of transferring out oh, to the bay trust and okay we did a lot of transferring out of that that fund so can you where has it been or where could it should it be and if those dollars were in that account, would we need this bill? I, yeah, I'm just trying to understand sort of, and, and again, we had a priority, we had something, but if some aspects of this aren't moving forward and you know, maybe things could be put back. So I'm, I'm interested in if anybody's willing I, I, to take I that. I see uh, Ms. Ayosa, Director Ayosa, how about CJ? The um, itching, but I did want to lean in. Uh, so like, that fund is funding like majority capital. So right. like, it's like 30% of it is going towards some level of operating from that standpoint. And when we deal with these issues, like to me, the predominant issue when I tour, when I'm having the meetings is a staffing uh, uh, component. These are new dollars. So we wouldn't be taking anything from this pot or that, wow. that pot, like this would be new dollars from that standpoint. So there's no transfer. These will be new dollars that would be applied to this this grant. Are you, were you and getting the answer or no? Like, like okay. Sure? Oh, okay. All right. Well, maybe afterward, just so that I, I can remember. Um, but I do want to concur a concern about using uh, about funding operating and, and using grant program to fund. So, but I, but I do wonder what uh, we are going to be looking at this uh, regional approach to the system, et cetera. But in the meantime, because that's multiple years, we have to deal right now. Yes. So. Would there be other mechanisms or places where this funding would be appropriate? Um, I, I guess the question is, are these are these considered the uh, facilities of the municipality? Are they considered sort of quasi facilities? Therefore, the management, in other words, if it's wholly if it's owned if they're owned by the state, then the state does have some responsibility for making it run, which is what the former governor did and then sent us a bill. <laughs> um, so there, that's one, perhaps, you know, Baltimore City could be made whole for that that bill uh, that was sent, um, you know, last year. What? Wh how much was that, by the way? Was the city charged for this, uh, for um, pay, uh, for the help that we, that you received? So he said it sounds like, sounds like $4 million. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna let you finish it in our Yeah, no, that's it. So it's four million dollars, and then your bill has has how much? Ten. So about forty percent there. Okay, all right, but but there those were operate. I just want to be clear: were those operating? That was labor operating dollars out of your budget that you paid to pay for state employees last year or two years ago. Is that? I just want to make sure everybody's moving in the same context that you're moving in. So I'm going to break it down a, a, I appreciate a little bit. That. So um, Senator Washington is talking about MES comes in and then we are funding people premium pay to work side by side with our folks to be able to do the job. Yes, it gets the job done because we've got Michael Jordan's and order Michael Jordan pay, I should say, um, uh, coming in, working next to folks, but we still have to pay that bill. So the city's still on the hook for that bill, even though the state said, hey, MES, come in and do these types of things. And we agreed to it. It's not like we didn't agree to it, but we're paying folks premium pay. We have to figure out how do we move everybody in that context and make sure that we have a long-term plan and not a day-to-day -day, uh, situation where MES is uh, coming into context. I, you, you touched on a couple things, uh, Dr. Washington. So 
the um, piece that I just wanted to also lean back in on is, is like what we have now does a phenomenal job of funding capital infrastructure in our wastewater treatment facilities. Where I found the gap was in reference to the the stat, the operating piece of right. it. And this is not taking anything or, or not harming anybody from that standpoint. I also have amendments that I should have uh, discussed a little bit about. So a majority of them are technical amendments, but it also says that $3 million can be awarded to the pl uh, a plant because obviously there are two big plants that we have to address needs for uh, uh, from that standpoint. And also saying that to make sure that everyone can get this, that it would be a three year cycle. So, so you wouldn't, and these are the amendments that I'm proposing, not in the right. bill. And then the other piece uh, of it is is it's a it's a trigger that has to be hit from a vacancy standpoint. Okay. That trigger just being clarifying that trigger is like from like when the bill is introduced so around that time frame to three years looking but that look back to make sure that folks know you can't just create a vacancy challenge in order to get some uh, some level of resources. Right. Um, thank you for helping to clear <laughs> clarify what I was saying. Um, but uh, given that we have two members of the budget committee, I think it would be helpful to sort of think about a sustainable uh, way to address the, the issue, not, not just for this plant, uh, you know, in some ways remove the sort of specificity and sort of have it apply to all of them. I would suspect that all of them, many of them uh, have some of these issues. Now you're gonna prioritize certain ones, of course, not, you know, but also I think it is in fact a system wide, a state, it is a statewide. So I guess I, I'll ask the panelists, do, do you think, or you, do you believe that uh, the state uh, has an interest in securing uh, the, the health and safety and access of water to all Marylanders? Um, if I may, uh, Senator Washington, I would say absolutely 100%. The state has a role in securing um, the, the health and safety of our residents and, and quite frankly, our waterways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the way that, that we're looking at this is that um, we see this as perhaps a, a relatively short term need for this additional kind of funding availability. I think the pandemic um, uh, revealed a lot of things about the way that some of these um, large complex infrastructure systems are operated and maintained. And in the Baltimore region, and I believe um, this was this was mentioned, the 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 city and the county are coming together. Um, to look at what are the long-term solutions to this challenge? Because I think you're absolutely right, um, Senator Hester, we can't necessarily rely on grants to provide ongoing funding for personnel or for any element of operations. But while we're figuring out how to get to a more sustainable way, we have, a, we have immediate needs um, at our facilities, and I would suspect that other large facilities may have similar needs. So that's where we see the real value in this bill is helping us to address these challenges so that we can accomplish long-term sustainability in these complex infrastructure systems to protect both human health and environmental health. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, any additional questions for any of the panelists? Okay, seeing none, we have two final witnesses. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sponsor. Um, two witnesses signed up favorable, um, Marissa Oshevsky, uh, mentioned that name earlier, and we've got Dominic Butchko from MAKO. And so, Dominic, Marissa, why don't you come up and you've got, each of you um, has two and a half minutes and you've both uh, signed up favorable. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Feldman. Vice Chair Kagan uh, and members of the committee. I am Marissa Olszewski. I am here on behalf of the Maryland League of Conservation Voters, and I also serve as the state lead for the Choose Clean Water Coalition. On behalf of Maryland LCB, I am urging your support for Senate Bill 392. This bill addresses the funding gap that contributed to the backwater wastewater treatment plants trouble last year by providing resources for maintenance, operation, and most importantly, employee training and retention. 
In 2004, the Maryland General Assembly established the Bay Restoration Fund to address the need to modernize our state's wastewater treatment plants. Equipping these facilities with advanced nutrient removal technologies has successfully reduced nutrient pollution to the Bay every year except last year. As Mark Hoffman, Maryland Director for Chesapeake Bay Commission, shared with this committee in the Bay Briefing earlier this month, last year proved to be an exception in the trend of nutrient decline because for at least six months of the year, the backwater wastewater treatment plant was severely out of compliance. Last July, I attended a public meeting in Essex hosted by the Back River Restoration Committee. The packed room was filled with residents who were angry and frustrated. The residents of the area immediately adjacent to the treatment plant had endured months of pollution that was a human health hazard, raw sewage entering the water beside their homes and businesses. And they were struggling to understand how a wastewater treatment plant they had been told was a state-of-the-art facility with some of the newest and best technologies could also be the same neighbor releasing human excrement into their river. Almost 20 years ago, Maryland developed the funding source to provide capital upgrades to our wastewater treatment plants. SB 392 extends that support for these plants' operations, or their urgent operations and maintenance needs. I hope you will provide a favorable, favorable report to this bill, and we can all work together to maintain the investments we have made in our wastewater treatment plants and the Chesapeake Bay. Thank you for your attention. Okay, we'll go to Mr. Butchko, and then we'll take questions after that. Yeah, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Dominic Butchko with the Maryland Association of Counties. First, I just have to say, you know you have a good bill when CBF and MAKO are in support. Um, so I just have to thank the sponsor for doing that. Didn't think hell would freeze over. All right. Um, but this, I also want to underline that this is an issue everywhere. Um, we did just hear how important it is for um, the two Baltimores, but also in a place like Frederick County. Um, I was actually just touring a facility and the uh, operators that told us that within a few years, if we don't uh, focus on recruitment and retention, you're not going to be able to run these types of facilities. I know the administrator for Kent County is in the room and we just had a conversation about this. This is true and universal everywhere. It is a major issue that the state needs to take on because counties cannot do it alone. And, and again, Again, I just thank the sponsor for putting forward such a good common sense bill and Mako urges a favorable report. Thank you. Okay, any questions uh, for our two witnesses? Okay, seeing up, oh, Senator Hester. Thank you. And in the interest of time, this could be answered offline. I don't think MDE is here today, but my question, which was triggered by your comment around the success of the Chesapeake Bay Restoration Fund, is we've completed a lot of these upgrades. And so I'm curious, you know, what is now, you know, happening with, with those dollars that are slated for capital? And, you know, while I know that we need a short term solution, um, I think we actually need to look at that. The fund. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I, just to answer your question from what my understanding is, although we have completed uh, the advanced nutrient removal technologies on the major wastewater treatment plants, there's still a whole host of minor wastewater treatment plants across the state who have yet to see that funding used for them. So um, I believe the list is on the MDE website. Okay, any additional questions for the panel? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the bill hearing on uh, Senate Bill 392, and we're going to next move to Senate Bill 517, uh, uh, Senator Gallion, on behalf of the Cecil uh, County Senators. And I'm going to call up, uh, you've got two uh, sponsor panelists signed up. I've got uh, Vicki Rekerman, uh, Rekerman, and Rinkerman. I'm sorry, yes. What is it? Rinker, Rinkerman? I apologize okay. for That's watching fine. that up. And Steve uh, Cassard. Um, Mr. Cassard, why don't you come up? My God. And so, uh, Senator Gallion, you've got the uh, floor on Senate Bill 517. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Feldman, Vice Chair Kagan. Uh, it's great to be, uh, and, and fellow members of the committee, it's great to be with you this afternoon. Uh, for the record, Senator Jason Gallion uh, here on behalf of the Cecil County Senators to introduce Senate Bill 517, Port of Deposit State Historical Park Included Areas. And if you're wondering who the Cecil County Senators are, it's a pretty short list. It's myself and uh, Senator Hershey. Uh, this is a corrective emergency bill that results from SB 541, the Great Maryland Outdoors Act that was passed last year. Uh, seven out of the eight Cecil legislators have signed on to the, either this or the House cross file. Uh, a little background. Very late in last year's session, the Port of Deposit State Park was amended into SB 541 Designating, designating three properties to be transferred to DNR 
on June 1st, 2023. Rather than possibly slowing down the parks bill last year, we decided to come back the following session, which is this session, to address any possible concerns with this transfer. The legislation also called for the creation of an advisory committee and a report from DNR to be presented to the General Assembly. I pro provided each of you with a copy of the official report from DNR. I believe you had, it's in the uh, bill file, but also a hard copy at your desk. Uh, what this report does is offer a number of recommendations and uh, none of this can be done uh, by June 1st, 2023, which is when the property will be turned over to DNR if no action is taken in this legislative session. Senate Bill 517 will provide the flexibility needed to accomplish these recommendations. The bill simply gives that flexibility as it goes with the number of acres, it removes a costly property, and most importantly, gives the flexibility of time to resolve these complex issues. The property listed in last year's bill, Senate Bill 541, is formerly the Bainbridge U.S. Naval Training Center which began the process of decommissioning in 1988. In 1999, the Bainbridge Development Corporation, uh, otherwise known as BDC, was established as a public instrumentality of the state to develop uh, the old training center. The BDC is managed by the executive director and governed by a 15-member board of directors composed of nine residents of Cecil County and representatives of state agencies. Uh, the property includes the historic Tome School for Boys, the Snow Hill Archaeological Site, and the Wooded Conservation Area. In the DNR report, they listed the following challenges facing the park project, which include, uh, number one, land restrictions that require a renegotiation of an MOU with the Navy. Uh, number two, property condition and environmental concerns that would be at the state's sole expense to remediate and will require the state to renegotiate the terms of the MOA with the U.S. Navy. Number three, access issues that will require the construction of a road to lead to the property and steep terrain that would make the properties difficult to connect. And number four, funding needs ranging from 10 to $100 million and an estimated $40 million for roads and infrastructure. The DNR report provided uh, five recommendations in this report to General Assembly. Reconsider the deadline, alter the size and scope of the project, address the funding considerations, address revenue opportunities, and focus on existing efforts. The DNR report concluded that, quote, more due diligence is needed to adequately determine the type and level of public access that may be possible or even practical given the physical, environmental, archeological, historical, and legal constraints on these sites. The deadlines and constraints codified in statute by the General Assembly, unaccompanied by a funding source, do not allow for that type of due diligence to occur. Allowing time and flexibility to conduct more, a more thorough planning process that includes a robust stakeholder engagement at all levels is needed. This will present the best opportunity for developing a clear, common, shared vision for the future of the sites together with the identification of potential resources to achieve the shared vision. Such a process would yield much better results and provide the greatest chance of achieving success for the community and the state of Maryland, end quote. Allowing this, prosper, this property to be transferred without addressing the many red flags listed in the report would, in my estimation, be putting forward bad policy that would no doubt fall on the backs and the wallets of our taxpayers. I believe SB 517 will allow us more time and flexibility to do our due diligence moving forward with this property. I respectfully ask the committee for a favorable, favorable report on this emergency local bill. And also we have, uh, as you mentioned, Steve Cassard is here on behalf of uh, BDC to answer any uh, technical questions about the property or the MOU agreement with the Navy. Thank you. Okay, well, why don't we go uh, uh, to your sponsor panelist, uh, yeah. witness uh, Vicki Rinkerman, and you've got two and a half minutes. And then, Mr. Uh, you just, you're just here for to answer questions? Okay. Yes. 
Ms. Rinkerman, you've got two and a half minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Feldman and uh, Vice Chair Kagan and members of the committee. My name is Vicki Rinkerman. I have served as the town administrator for the town of Port Deposit for almost 10 years. Uh, Port Deposit uh, is a very small historic town. It is on the National Historic Register of Historic Places. Um, I've been there, uh, as I said, for almost 10 years. Um, I want to, um, I'm here uh, today representing uh, Mayor Coos and the rest of our town council. Uh, they asked that I extend a thank you to Senator Gallion and Senator Hershey for sponsoring Senate Bill 517. Uh, this bill, if passed, uh, will give an opportunity to pause uh, the transfer of a portion of the Bainbridge property for a state park. This proposal, as it states now, may take up to 150 acres of the Bainbridge property off the town's tax rolls to create a state park. Town officials have worked diligently with the Bainbridge Development Corporation since 1999. Local town officials opposed this proposal and want to continue working with the BDC, state officials, county officials, and other local groups, including our citizens, to develop and to explore all potential available development options for this property. The town believes that we should develop a master plan for this property as we have done in the development of phase one and phase two of the Bainbridge property. This is a 1200 acre parcel that is within the town limits. Elected officials believe we have more flexibility at a local level to develop a more comprehensive master plan. There are funding streams available to the town, such as the Maryland Historic Trust uh, Historic Grants. We have the uh, MHT tax credits. We have DNR program open space funding that is available to us, to name a few, to implement a master plan. Our goals is to create an area through a master planning process that would be open to the public, provide a recreational component, and allow for growth while restoring and preserving the historic integrity and culture of Snow Hill, which is a free African-American community that existed in Port Deposit and the Tome School sites. I have had the privilege of serving on the DNR Stakeholder Advisory Committee. Um, so that brought together, mm, sorry. Thank you. You can could, you could finish your <laughs> yeah, thought yeah. there. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I had served on the committee that brought a lot of agencies together and we, um, obviously uh, support this and ask for a favorable response. Okay, thank you. Any question mm -hmm. for the sponsor or any of the witnesses here? Okay, Vice Chair Kagan. I just wanted to ask the, the sponsor of the bill. Um, it has a list on page four of the report of voting members. And could you just clarify, because you, the Cecil County delegation supports the bill. And I see that the county executive is going to speak against it. Could you just clarify you all you all approved this plan, and that's why the legislation's here, right? So this advisory board, and it was there was more people that weren't technically voting members, but their job was to provide input and actually DNR submitted the report. So there was no official vote taken of the advisory group. We gave our uh, oral and, and at times through email, I guess, uh, recommendations to DNR and they took all that information and then uh, they submitted a report. Just to clarify, so even though it says voting members, there wasn't a vote taken? Correct. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you for the sure. clarification, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, Senator Carroza and then Senator Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chair and um, Senator, thank you for the bill. I just want to understand the bottom line, which um, as I understand it's to by time to do due diligence, um, as opposed to, um, it's not ruling out anything. I just want to clarify that on the record. And also the uh, Cecil County dele legislative delegation is in support of this bill. Is, is that sure, correct? To clarify that. So that both senator, there's district 35 and district 36, the, you know, one center from each and, the, and there's three delegates from each five of the six delegates uh, are in favor. Uh, matter of fact, the cross file bill with well, the lead sponsor is Delegate Riley with four of the other five. So actually five out of six delegates and both senators uh, signed on to this, either the Senate or the House bill. Thank you. Okay, Senator Washington. 
<clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, yes, I want to understand it, uh, what we're talking about here. So is this, uh, I'm reading an article, it's a hundred, how many acres is it? And it's it forest that's under, it, it, that the land is currently uh, owned or in the possession of DNR now? Yeah, yeah. Can, can you help me understand? Because I'm yeah. reading something about it, but like there, there's 120 acres that's forested that yeah. looks like DNR has. And so I'm yeah. just- Mr. Cassard from BDC could give you- Thank well, you. What, what you see there is a proposal, which was part of the law to take up to 150 acres has not been transferred yet. That's what's in question. Yeah. And the time requested would be to do further due diligence on those properties to further define what is appropriate for public access, given the environmental circumstances of the site, mm -hmm. which are complex. And so the legislation passed to enable or to have this transfer happen, but it hasn't happened yet. Has not That's happened correct. yet. Um, and the idea or the proposal is to make it look like to have a forest conservation area. Is that is that that correct? Most of the parcel that's in question is not developable at this point. So it really is at not risk for development. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, without getting into detail, the Bainbridge Development Corporation's relationship with the U.S. Navy, which took a decade to come to a an agreement on to be where we are today, which is in a great spot, uh, is that the parcel should not be uh, accessed by uh, uh, citizens at because of the at-risk circumstances in some of the uh, soils. And there's discussion about remediation and how that might be addressed. But these are just many of the issues that are complex that would be addressed by, uh, obviously, by, by the, the task force recommendations by DNR. And, and to the sponsor, so nothing would happen. So say we pass this bill, no one would be able to buy the land. You, know, you wouldn't be able to sell it to someone else. You couldn't build anything else. Uh, there's some talk about a head headmaster's house and, and sure. it says Snow Hill. And, and sure. all that. Snow Hill is protected by the Maryland Historic Trust. That's absolutely a site that's of interest. It will require archeological study to further define it, but that's that's for future evaluation. But this bill, from what we understand from the sponsor's intent, is to simply, as was stated, defer a year and allow the parties to further evaluate the issues. Okay, all right, thank you. Any additional questions for the panel? Okay, seeing none. We have a number of virtual witnesses, but we do have one, uh, one in-person witness signed up favorable with amendments. Okay. Philip Hager, is Mr. Hager here? And then after that, we'll go to uh, a number of virtual witnesses. Mr. Hager, uh, you've got from DNR, you've got two and a half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. Uh, members of the committee, thank you for your time. We appreciate having this opportunity to provide feedback on Senate Bill 517. As was noted, my name is Philip Hager. I serve as the Assistant Secretary for the Department of Natural Resources. We do appreciate the work of the sponsors on this bill. The bill recognizes, as has been stated, uh, I think uh, a number of times here today, the challenges and the complexities associated with this particular facility and the, and the Greater Bainbridge property. Many of these were examined as part of the uh, last year's study. We support this bill and we would ask that you consider two minor refinements in the form of supportive amendments. Uh, they would be intended to facilitate success at, at, in, this, uh, in this enterprise and increase our overall likelihood of getting to the, the point where I think we all want to be. The First Amendment increases the flexibility by not specifying the exact parameters or exact portion of the, of the facility that would be transferred to DNR, but does maintain a 150-acre threshold. The second extends the transfer date to 2025 to provide additional time for the assessment and analysis that need to take place. We have shared these amendments with the sponsors and they are discussed in our bill report. Thank you again for this opportunity. Okay, any questions for Mr. Hager? Okay, seeing none. We've now got um, two witnesses signed up virtually favorable with amendment and then we've got uh, some unfavorables virtual. 
Moria, are we going to be able to cue this up uh, Zoom wise with without? Okay, well, yeah. first witness um, Zoom is uh, Jacqueline Gregory. Is Miss Gregory on the line? Okay, I see you, Miss Gregory. Uh, yeah. You're signed. You're signed up favorable with amendments, and you've got uh, two and a half minutes. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Honorable Chair and esteemed members of the Education, Energy, and Environment Committee. My name is Jackie Gregory. I'm president of the Cecil County Council, but I'm speaking on behalf of myself today, not on behalf of the council as a whole. My interest in the parcels at Bainbridge that were named in the original state park bill, SB 541, is to ensure that every consideration for their best use is examined. What I don't wanna see is the easiest, but not the best path for the Tome School area being implemented without the feasibility studies for more valuable alternative uses for our community being executed. I don't wanna see another warehouse go up there when there is likely a much better use for the property, which could include preservation of the historic sites and building upon the history there to educate the public and provide a destination for people who visit our county. There's been a lot of discussion over the last few years about historic preservation of the Tome School to one degree or, or another. I would li like to see that option given full exploration and an environmental and economic feasibility study conducted to show options for that property. To that end, I support the original inclusion of the Tome School in the original bill that was um, entitled SB 541 and would like to see that put back into this bill. I also support an extension of the deadline from June 1st, 2024 to at least 2025 or possibly 2026 to provide enough time for these feasibility studies and development of a plan for potential options for the property. I would also like to see the advisory committee that was established in last year's bill put into the driver's seat when determining how these properties, these historic properties will be used rather than leaving the use of these historic sites to be determined by the Bainbridge Development Corporation. I trust that the members of our delegation will work together to amend this bill and will ensure the best use of the Tome property on the Bainbridge site. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, thank you. Any questions for uh, Ms. Gregory? Okay, seeing none, we have one additional virtual witness, uh, Matthew Roth, also signed up favorable with amendments, and then we do have um, several unfavorable. So Mr. Roth, you're signed up favorable with amendments, and you've got uh, two and a half minutes. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, um... Chairman, uh, my name is Matt Roth. Uh, I'm sorry, in the in the committee. My name is Matt Roth. I'm a 43 year resident of uh, the neighboring Perryville, Maryland, a longtime member of the Bainbridge Development Corporation Board of Directors and a member of the BDC's Tome School Committee. I'm also mayor of the town of Perryville. I'm also past president of the Greater Perryville Chamber of Commerce and a Western Cecil County business owner. I share those distinctions with you only to provide credibility to my expertise on the issues of local history, Bainbridge, the historical Tome School property, local government, and the local small business community. As a disclaimer, however, I want to uh, want to state that in my in no way am I suggesting that my opinions uh, the, the opinions I share with you today represent the town of Perryville or the Bainbridge Development Corporation. I am only I aim only to represent myself and my views uh, in this bill uh, in today's proceedings. With that stated, I would like to share my support for SB 517 only with considerable revisions. The revisions I would like to request would be to to strike the provision that removes the historical Tome School campus from inclusion of the Port Deposit Historical Park, uh, I'm sorry, Port of Deposit Historical Park, and that if found viable after the additional 12 months of vetting process, the property shall be uh, turned over to the Department of Natural Resources instead of May. Um, I'll state that after many conversations with both state representatives in favor of this bill and those that oppose it, my colleagues in local government and my colleagues out on the BDC board, I feel the consensus is that the concept for report of deposit park is well intentioned, but may have been rushed and lacked the typical process and stakeholder input that usually brings uh, such projects to fruition. I admit I too was caught off guard by the passing of the original bill and was admittedly offended by the lack of communication local stakeholders received on it. However, after reconciling my feelings with the heavy benefits of the park, I have swallowed my pride and in full support of its development and the transfer of 150 acres from Bainbridge Development Corporation by June 1st, 2024. 
It is my feeling that re the removal of the Tome School campus from the park would destroy its historical value and in such would lessen the value of the park would have for the visitors. Also considering the campus is adjacent to the Snow Hill archaeological site, its removal would, also, would only lend to an illogical park design, undermining its effectiveness, beauty, and its potential impact on the area's budding tourism economy. For the park to truly have the impact worthy of state... Oh, my apologies. I, I, no, I, you I, could I, fin yeah. finish up. Finish your um, um, to remove it would destroy the project altogether. Uh, I'll also state that the park is most significant opportunity for the buildings still standing on Tome School to be secured for use. The BDC has had recent financial studies done that essentially makes the viability of private entity and coming in to rehabilitate them uh, to a necessary MHT standard, a longest of long shots. Without the immediate investment that the Port of Deposit Park would require, those buildings will likely be lost to the continued weathering and or more, uh, or more vandalism and arson that we've witnessed in the past. The BDC, unfortunately, simply does not have the focus, the organization, or the resources to secure these buildings in the future. Um, with that, um, I thank you for uh, considering my requests, and obviously can take questions if you need it. Okay, any questions for Mr. Roth? Okay, seeing none, thank you. Uh, we've got uh, four witnesses signed up unfavorable. Um, we're going to go to them next, uh, starting with the County Executive, Danielle Hornberger. County Executive Hornberger, we're going to... Try to get you up here. Okay, kind of, kind of exactly. Warrenberger, you've uh, you're signed up unfavorable, and you got you have two and a half minutes. Thank you, and good afternoon, Chair Feldman and Madam Vice Chair Kagan uh, and committee members. Nice to see you. For the record, Danielle Hornberger, Cecil County Executive, and I'm here today to request an unfavorable report on SB 517. As County Executive of Cecil County, I oppose this bill in its entirety. Let me note not a single elected official that resides in Cecil County testifying today believes this bill, as is, should be passed. The question asked, by the way, was not answered earlier, could any of this land be developed? I may get into that later, um, but let me continue. Last year, the Maryland General Assembly passed the Great Outdoors Act, which created a state and county partnership outdoor park located in my district. I served on an advisory committee and anticipated working towards funding and planning for this project. Last week, I was shocked to find out that legislators residing in other jurisdictions outside Cecil County want to bow to developer interests and pave this waterfront property over for some future possible development project. A little history. In 1999, the Maryland General Assembly created the Bainbridge Development Corporation to oversee the cleanup of the develop and the development of the then polluted 1200 acre Bainbridge Naval Base. For 20 years, very little happened. Finally, in 2022, the county signed a contract for phase one, a 3.7 million square foot project of commercial industrial space. And now in 23, we are signing the contract for phase two. There is no phase three planned for this parcel. Let me repeat, there is no phase three. The remaining land contains steep slopes, as noted, or is associated with the historic Tome School, Forest Conservation and Riparian Buffer, and a national landmark, the Snow Hill Antebellum Free Slave Archaeological Site dedicated to African-American slaves, which partially overlays the Tome School proper, property, which is noted to be removed in this current iteration. Additionally, this land is in the Chesapeake Bay Critical Zone. For these reasons, the General Assembly directed this acreage as the basis for the Port Deposit State Park, Port of Deposit State Park. Passage of Senate Bill 517 will grant the Bainbridge Development Corporation members the power to sell off these sacred sites to developers. I categorically oppose selling state park land to developers. As Cecil County reside, residents recover from COVID, I'm reminded how important it is for people to get outside and enjoy nature and open spaces. This is the wrong time, if any, to sell a state park to developers. In addition, Port Deposit 
will receive a financial windfall from phase one and phase two, so much so that their citizens may never have to pay municipal taxes again. Okay. Any discussion Ma that- Madam, Madam County Executive, you, you know, blew through the two and a half minutes if oh, you could wrap up, yes? Sure, yep, yeah, I'm almost done, thank you. Okay. Selling the state park to developers in hopes that they will somehow preserve these treasures, including the African-American Snow Hill site. And Tome School Campus is hurtful, racist, and has no basis in today's conversation. For 20 plus years, all we've seen is vandalization and dilapidation, and I don't have enough words to express my dismay, disappointment, and anger. For all these reasons, I oppose SB 517 and plead that you issue an unfavorable report for this misguided bill. Thank you very much. Okay, any, any questions for the county executive? Uh, Vice Chair Kagan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Madam County Executive, nice to see you. Thank you for taking the time to testify. I'm gonna ask you, uh, I'm gonna start with a question that I asked of uh, my colleague, Senator Gallian. On page four of the report, it says voting members and Senator Gallian indicated that there was no vote taken. Do you have that same position? Yes, it's my understanding okay. that there was no vote taken. And, and by the way, that, um, that group of those members are are a, a great, vast, and and uh, and good representation for moving okay. forward. Mm -hmm. So speaking of good representation, so you mentioned, and so people here have heard me say a million billion times that I'm very proud to be the senator for Gaithersburg and Rockville. I don't live in Gaithersburg. Uh, I live in Rockville but I work my butt off for the residents of Gaithersburg. Um, and I even have a Gaithersburg council member uh, here shadowing me today. And so it seemed what I heard, and I'd like you to correct me if I didn't get it right, but if legislators who don't live in Cecil County can't act in the best interest of Cecil County, is that kind of what you said or what you implied? No, what I, what I will say is what I said again and what I've implying flat out is that the residents of Cecil who are representing Cecil County and do live here today in this testimony are not testifying in support of this bill as it stands. That's what so, I'm saying. Okay. I just want for the record, um, Senator Galley and Senator Hershey may not live in Cecil, I was taught by Delegate Rudolph, Cecil County. So that's that's the way I call it. <laughs> um, so I, my understanding, I mean, I think what I've heard is that Senator Galley and Senator Hershey believes that this is a good bill. <clears throat> and as the delegation, the Senate delegation that they support it, they may not live in the in that county, but they support it and are representatives of the county. So I just want that. They're entitled to do so for sure. And okay, I appreciate today. it. Thank you, Madam County Executive. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, Senator Carroza. Um, thank you, Madam County Executive. Um, just again, trying to understand um, the pieces of this local bill um, and the, the back and forth on um, the county's role and uh, the state um, options has, have you or has the county made um, a, co a financial commitment to to the park or to this project overall? Is that I don't know where you are in the process. I'm just trying to understand. Yeah, we're so in the process being on that committee. Um, so not only myself, but our director of parks and recs and, and you know, other um, members are uh, as well as Jackie, president, vice sorry, president, council president, Jackie Gregory, um, are, are all members of that committee. And that is one of the issues that we would, you know, be looking at and working towards. And that's where we should be headed as opposed to, you know, um, kind of giving this back to a, uh, an, a board that's really been inactive with it for over 20 years. We, we, we look forward to working together on finding those funding sources and figuring out the best use of this property. And it's time for us to, to be able to do so, which is what's currently in place in law now. Okay, do uh, uh, you have a follow-up, Senator Corozo? Yeah, just one follow-up. So at this point, there's not a firm financial county commitment to the park? 
we don't have anything firm because we haven't had enough meetings to make that happen just because of the the nature of of how things and I think also maybe with the uh, change in the administration um DNR so forth there we haven't had the the meetings to do do more than that but but I guess internally you you haven't that you haven't necessarily put anything aside in anticipation of it. That's what I, I think I'm just from the, the county financial standpoint. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm not really willing to to say that without the council approving a budget. Okay. So, you know what I mean? Right, it, that's that fair. Time frame, okay. Yeah, it's it's okay. I just wanted to know if there was, you know, a, a number here. So thank you. Yeah. Okay, Senator Washington. Um, thank you, County Executive. And this is a, a, a new position, right? Are you the relatively you know new were just elected was it every four years yes. Mm -hmm. yes and I've been here for two years thank you yes okay so the honeymoon is over so now you're you know in it it's all, right. all the problems from before are now your problems that's right um so just in that vein one of the people testifying kind of said seemed like they were trying to position themselves as in the in the middle like if there's nothing moving right now and there can be you know, strong assurances that, you know, nothing's going to happen, uh, you know, to, to uh, develop the 120 acres of the, I guess the 1400. Just help, help me feel, uh, yeah, help me understand why you can't wait a year or just tell me, tell me why, what's the. the I'm not saying we can't wait a year. That's, that's the part that's the most reasonable to me, but okay. changing, changing this from a may to a shall effectively can make mm -hmm. it never happen. And that's very mm -hmm. scary because mm -hmm. we're, we're having, you know, a group of uh, citizens who are should be at the table come together and try to figure out what the best use is, the, is for this, including the town and um, other key stakeholders. So I I just I think that the um, the may versus shall is very important, and uh, you know keeping this moving with with the committee that's stated in, in the current law makes sense, but reverting back to um, all of the, taking the Tome School away, which does remove the Snow Hill site, taking right. um, taking away the uh, shall and making it a may, uh, reverting it back to the BDC, those are all, those are all bad plans to me, really yeah. bad plans. Yeah, um, I, I guess I, I'm just asking, I think we'd be asking to, um, you know, not force our committee to sit. So it's so split in, you know, within the, you know, the county exec versus the, the, the senators. And sure. we don't want to to do that. But um, you would have to admit that, you know, it did happen kind of quickly. I mean, it was an interesting move. I mean, you know, so so maybe there's an opportunity to roll it back and and uh, get people bought in in a way, um, you know, it's just put in there very last minute. and no one really even noticed it was there. So you I can guess. understand why people might feel yeah, I, I guess that they'd like a chance to revisit it. So sure, you would you sure. would consider that as the as the leader um, to make sure everybody um you know in your that you represent uh, can feel good about this, right? Well I can say for for all the residents that I've spoken to and you know that's what we have to do, right? Is is you know put our own personal feelings aside yeah. for, for the people. Um, right. in Cecil County, they love more open space in Cecil County. Right. They don't want someone to say, well, maybe we're going to develop there. And we'd really like that to be something else. Right. And if right. we revert this back to, um, what this is calling for, which is basically the, the BDC to still remain in charge of those decisions that could happen. And that this law was put in place um to move this forward and be open space and there's that it those things make sense the way it took place sure i can agree maybe not the best way for sure but sometimes the sausage is made in an ugly it, way it does and you got a chance to maybe do it right so something good. take that yeah. opportunity yeah. all right thank you so any much any additional questions for county executive okay seeing none uh we do have a few more uh, virtual witnesses uh, signed up on favorable let's go through them 
uh, Ted Evgenitis. I think I'm not watch of it. Is Ted there? I see Ted on the Zoom. Evgenitis. There you are, sir. Okay. Why don't you tell me how to pronounce your name? I think I messed it up. And you've got two and a half minutes and you've signed up unfavorable. It uh it gets butchered every day. Don't worry about that. Um, but it's pronounced Evgenitis. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, members of the committee. Um, so just just briefly, the uh, Lower Susquehanna River Keeper Association. Uh, we are a licensed water keeper, 501c3 nonprofit, and we are dedicated to improving the ecological health of the Lower Susquehanna River watershed and the Chesapeake Bay. Um, the Lower Susquehanna River Keeper patrols the river for illegal pollution and, when necessary, enforces environmental laws to protect the river and the communities that depend on it. Um, you know, so we, we've heard a lot today so far. Um, you know, we've heard some some folks that uh, were favorable, but would like to see re revisions um, to this bill. And you know, the the point where I'm coming from is that you know there are there is just a lot of uncertainties with this bill. Um, the language that's being changed, the way it is written, um, you know, there's no guarantees or certifications. Um, you know, with this bill that would essentially allow this land to be transferred at a later time to the state. You know, the, the Great Maryland Outdoors Act mandated that the state, that the Maryland Department of Natural Resources establish a port of deposit state historical park as a partnership park that seeks to educate the public about and preserve and interpret the lives and experiences of Black Americans both before and after the abolish, ab abolition of slavery. Um, and along with the with the Tomey School property, you know, removing that, um, like has been said before, um, I don't I don't know what kind of service that does to this agreement. And when you when you look at the bill, and when I read the language and interpreting it, um, for them to remove, you know, the language around, you know, not less than 120 acres, that basically means to me that none of the site could potentially be transferred. Um, removing that language does that. Removing the language um, from shall to may, again, does not guarantee this land to be transferred to the state. Um, and again, removing that parcel with the school um, is going to leave uncertainties. Now, I think we can understand that, you know, the site does need, it needs more um, studies, it needs more research, but I don't think the language of this bill um, is providing for that. I think the language of the bill takes away um, this land potentially and could be used for, for future development. I mean, this land could potentially be sold. Um, it could be used for other purposes. The intent of this land was to be used for public purposes and to be preserved for the public benefit. Um, and we would like to see that and, to and we would like to see an unfavorable report on this bill um, and to pursue the original intentions. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, any questions for the witness? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna get next go to our next virtual witness, uh, Jason Smith, Mr. Smith. Okay, Mrs. Smith, you've got two and a half minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Feldman, Madam Vice Chair Kagan. My name is Jason Smith. I'm a lifelong resident of Cecil County, Maryland. I'm personally requesting an unfavorable report on SP 517. Um, I have major concerns about the bill as it's put into jeopardy the Snow Hill Antebellum Free Slavery Site. Um, in the bill SB 517, it explicitly removes the Tomb School property from the park. Uh, the Tomb School was built atop basically of the Snow Hill site. Um, this free slavery community was plowed over basically early in the 1900s to create the Tomb School. And all we have left now is the archaeological uh, footprint and dwellings and property lines and the church that was placed in the Snow Hill community. Um, removing the, the Tome School guarantees the site will be disturbed. And uh, when Tome School was developed by Bainbridge Development Corporation, in my opinion. Furthermore, SB 517 also reduces the minimum acreage to zero um, and changes it to basically an optional park. Uh, we know what waterfront property uh, uh, it's attractive to developers. I mean, good Lord, the U.S. Navy 
of all wanted this property due to its location. Um, so if, if we were to pass this bill, I, I feel we would lose this unique and historical iconic treasure. Um, last year, the Port of Deposit State Park was created to protect and preserve this critically important African-American historically relevant uh, site. I respectively um, ask you, please issue an unfavorable report and uh, preserve our heritage. Thank you for your time and consideration in this matter. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Any qu uh, questions for Mr. Smith? Okay, we've got uh, Senator Gallion. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Smith. Just a, a question. Um, what in this bill would preclude um, the term school site from being added back in? Because my understanding is all that does is give some flexibility. It doesn't have to be in there, but it still could be in there, correct? Uh, in my understanding, a uh, limited understanding, obviously, as just a resident and uh, me going over the bill, um, I would have to honestly look further into that. Okay. My understanding is it doesn't require it to be in, but it could be added in if it worked worked out with the uh, local officials there in, in the future. So just to put that on the record. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Any additional questions for Mr. Smith? Okay. Seeing none. Uh, the, uh, the final witness virtual signed up unfavorable on the bill is uh, Clyde uh, Van Dyke. Mr. Van Dyke. By Mr. Van Dyke. Is he? Okay, Mr. Van Dyke. Um, hello, sir. You've got uh, two and a half minutes and you're signed up unfavorable. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Clyde Van Dyke, and I'm the Director of Parks and Recreation for Cecil County. I'm here today to speak in opposition of Senate Bill 517. As written, SB 517 could nullify the ability to designate an important local, state, and national historic open space as a state park. Currently, a plan has been set in motion with defined deadlines that may assist in the resurrection of this unique landmark into a viable resource that can be utilized by the residents and visitors alike. Routinely open space of significant historical value, such as the Tome School and Snow Hill sites, have been owned and managed by government jurisdictions so that they might be revitalized and utilized to educate on past experiences and enhance future ones. Although not impossible, it is highly unlikely that the private sector, private sector dollars would be invested in this site due to its high risk of little return on investment. If owned and managed by the state, revenues could be generated through tourism dollars to help offset any tax funds that may be lost. In closing, time extensions will only lead to further decay and acts of vandalism. This valuable historic asset has sat vacant for 20 plus years with little to no interest from the private sector and has continued to be a place of interest for vandals, ghost seekers, and arsonists. As a director of Parks and Recreation, I can affirm the county's willingness and readiness to assist in the, de the development of the state park steeped in the rich history of the Tone School and the African-American heritage of Snow Hill. The law currently in place has a committee of appropriate voting members to have a seat at the table towards moving this property forward for its best use. That group consists of the county administration, two members of the Cecil delegation, the Tone Report Deposit, or the Town Report Deposit, County Council President, a member of the Cecil County NAACP, me as the Director of Cecil County Parks and Recreation, and the Cecil County Historical Society. Additionally, non-voting members include Cecil County Public Library, DNR, and the Lower Susquehanna Greenway. We need to stay the course and move forward with current plan as devised to ensure this sig significant piece of history is maximized to its full potential. I thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and for these reasons, I ask that you recommend an unfavorable re report on SB 517. Okay, any questions for Mr. Van Dyke, Senator Gallion? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good to see you, uh, Director. Um, so I know we got an uh, answer earlier as far as uh, what amount of money that the county would be willing to put into this. Uh, as the director of Parks and Rec, what would be your recommendation as to how much money the county should put into this, considering that, you know, as one of the two elected state senators for Cecil County, which I'm proud to be, uh, there's a lot of requests coming through for things such like uh, our library system uh, for our uh, police force there, uh, the sheriff's uh, deputies there in Cecil. So when you're trying to line that up, what would your request be for a park, towards a park? I couldn't give you a dollar amount today, Senator. Five million, ten. 
I, I couldn't give you a dollar amount today. Fifteen. Okay. Of course, I'm of course I'm biased toward parks and recreation. Um, and that's that's where my priority would be. Uh, personally and professionally, since I am a lifetime resident of Cecil County, I just want to make sure that this property is properly planned and utilized uh, as it should be. Okay, any additional questions for the witness? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the bill hearing on Senate Bill 517. We're going to next uh, move on to uh, Senator Reedy, who's patiently been sitting there listening to this uh, this piece of legislation. Um, we're going to move to Senate Bill 407, and you've got some sponsor panelists. I understand you have a video that you're going to yeah. line up. Mr. Just President, I'd like to bring up sponsor panel. I think we have one or two that are virtual. And then I, I will play the short video as part of my sponsor testimony. Okay. I'll, I'll call up your two in-person uh, first uh, sponsor panelists. That's Monica, Mona uh, Becker from the city of Westminster Becker, yeah. and Les Knapp uh, also signed up in person. And then we do have two virtual witnesses uh, subsequent. I, if I could ask, if I could have city councilman, uh, Mr. Pecorero also join me. Absolutely. Here. Okay, you. Mr. Pecorero, why don't you come up as well? And um, and then Senator Reedy, take the time you need, and then I don't. We've got the uh, video uh, all queued up, ready to roll. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mem uh, Vice Chair Kagan, and members of the Education, Energy, and Environment Committee. It's wonderful to be before you again today. Talk about a, a very important issue that is important for my community, uh, for one of the areas I represent, Westminster, but it's also, I believe, very important for the uh, things for the future that can be utilized for our state. So I want to talk about it briefly. I'm introducing Senate Bill 407, which is a collaboration uh, coming out of a collaboration with the Maryland Department of, of the Environment, City of Westminster, and the University of Maryland's now completed pilot program in our community for water reuse. The reason we're bringing the bill before you today is not because we're establishing actually a pilot project. It's it's so that we can uh, clarify in law how MDE should regulate water reuse for Westminster City and other areas that would be investigating this idea. It's really so that we can have MDE establish a permit in state law. Um, but we want to talk to you a little bit about what the project is and why we're here and what we've been working on. Uh, Westminster uh, is on the forefront of indirect potable water reuse in Maryland. We're on the forefront, partly I think the city is by desire, but also it was because of necessity. And some of my panelists, including Mayor Becker, are going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but this technology that has been developed with this collaboration we're talking about, and including uh, also federal partner funding, um, it has the potential to help uh, uh, stop discharge into our waterways, most importantly, protect our water supply so that in, in Westminster and in Carroll County uh, because from shortages and drought and problems with that, and also ensure safe water is, is available for use uh, and, and as well as uh, for emergencies. I, I don't want to step on my um, partners, uh, my, our group's testimony too much, but I will tell you, Carroll County is unique. Westminster is in, in part particularly, but Carroll County is unique to a lot of places in Maryland. We actually have water shortage Access to water is at a shortage. It's unusual for the state of Maryland, but Carroll County, and there are a couple of other parts of the state, but Carroll County in particular has a lack of access to, to water. Uh, and that's been an issue for a long time, uh, but it became very acute uh, for Westminster uh, and, and continues to be an issue. So what I'd like to do is play a short video clip um, that the, the city of Westminster was, was kind enough to put together their, their department uh, to sh talk about what this... Um, what this project is so you can better understand it. And then I'll conclude my comments right after that and hand it over to my panel. Like many communities, the city of Westminster has experienced drought conditions. Did you know that we had an extreme drought in 2002? Water had to be trucked in from a nearby quarry to have enough for our families and businesses. Pure Water Westminster includes the construction of a pilot project, which includes ongoing testing and monitoring of the water purification technology to confirm it's ready for use as a full-scale operation. Located at the Westminster Water Reclamation Facility, the pilot project is testing a three-step water purification process. The first step is nanomembrane filtration 
which passes the water through a porous membrane to remove very tiny particles. Then, the water goes through another filtration layer called reverse osmosis, which uses pressure to force it through a finer membrane, removing the tiniest of impurities. Finally, the third step is advanced oxidation with ultraviolet light. This step is chemical oxidation with peroxide and granular inactivated carbon, which neutralize or absorb any compounds that may still remain in the water after the filtration processes. The end result is purified water safe for drinking. Cheers. Cheers. That was really good. good. It's good. It is good. The pure water product will be stored in the cranberry reservoir and blended with the reservoir's natural water, then treated again through the cranberry surface water plant. We have studied other projects across the country and Westminster is excited to be a pioneer for water reuse in Maryland. As we move forward with this important project to improve water sustainability in our city, we are proud to serve as a model for other cities in our state. And Thank you. Thank you for the, the team that put that together is excellent. Uh, th just to clarify again, the, the, the end part of the video, because I always get people asking me, so you're doing this and then people can drink it. Well, yes, but they're not, we don't just do it. It actually goes into the reservoir for a full, the full reservoir process as well. So it's really, you know, double secret uh, probation kind of, it's going through, it's going through multiple processes to clean this water, but it's really exciting opportunity. So, um, there are some significant sponsor amendments that are that are here, and it's because we've continued to collaborate with MDE and other agencies uh, to be sure we're correctly defining the parameters for permitting and regulating this this innovative program. Uh, I'd respectfully request a favorable vote on the on the legislation. I could be happy to answer questions, but I would really love for you to let the folks who know a lot more about the technical part of this speak first, and then we we'll look. Okay, to, why don't you uh, uh, tell us who you'd like to sequence to be in I order? Have Mayor, Mayor Becker from Westminster, we want to go ahead and then we'll go down the line. Okay, Ms. Becker, you're first. Thank you. Wait, what do we need? No problem. I, mean, I think you got it. Sorry. Did you get it? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're free to start your two and a half minutes. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Feldman and committee members. My name is Dr. Mona Becker, Mayor of the City of Westminster. I'm here today on behalf of Westminster Common Council to urge your support for SB 407. I'd also like to thank Justice Senator Reedy for sponsoring this important bill. In 2001-2002, Carroll County and most of Maryland experienced extreme drought conditions, which severely reduced the water available to support the 38,000 existing customers on the City of Westminster's water distribution system. These drought conditions made it clear that we can no longer rely on natural rainwater to recharge the system. Instead, the City must find a water source that is both permanent and City-owned and operated. Our solution is Pure Water Westminster, which is an indirect potable water reuse project that the city has been designing and piloting for the last three years. The water purification process for this indirect potable reuse project includes three steps, nanomembrane filtration, reverse osmosis, and advanced oxidation with ultraviolet light, as was shown in the video. The end product is purified water that is safe for drinking. In fact, as you saw in the video, I drank the purified water myself. The purified water from the water reuse facility will be stored in the Cranberry Reservoir, blended with the reservoir's natural water, and then treated again at the Cranberry surface water plant. This type of project exists in other states throughout the country, but will be the first in indirect potable water reuse for the state of Maryland. The city has received support and funding for the construction of this facility from Senator Van Hollen, Senator Cardin, Congressman Raskin, and Congressman Rupesberger, as well as the Carroll County Board of Commissioners. Additionally, the city has submitted written testimony that outlines in detail the need and project. I'm environmental, I am an environmental scientist and educator. The technology outlined in SB 407 is innovative, yet tested and safe. 
indirect potable water reuse can offer Westminster a water source that is city owned, permanent, and drought resistant. I strongly encourage you to support SB 407. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Knapp, you're next, and we'll go through the, this panel and then we'll open up some questions. Good afternoon, Chair Feldman, Vice Chair Kagan, members of the E3 or E Quad Committee. I am Les Knapp, Senior Local Advisor at the Maryland Department of the Environment, testifying in support of Senate Bill 407 with amendments. I would also like to thank the sponsor, Senator Reedy, for introducing this important piece of legislation as clean and accessible water for all Marylanders is a priority of the department. I would like to offer three points in support of this bill. Point one, water reuse is needed in Maryland and that need is only going to grow. As was noted, Maryland has traditionally been a water rich state, but that abundance is coming to an end. Some communities like the city of Westminster have had to deal with water challenges for decades, and other communities are now facing lower water tables, requiring deeper wells to continue access. Saltwater intrusion is posing risks to some eastern shore aquifers, and climate change is disrupting our traditional aquifer recharge rates. In short, in order to remain sustainable and resilient, Maryland needs water reuse. Point two. Maryland has lagged behind many other states in implementing water reuse, and this pilot can provide valuable information about how we can move forward. The pilot program in this bill will give us valuable and practical information about what may be needed for more comprehensive water reuse laws and regulations for the future. And point three, this pilot program is about how to permit water reuse facilities in this state. It is not about testing the actual processes used to treat the reclaimed water. Those processes have previously been established and proven safe and effective in California and other states. The technology used in the pilot program to treat the reclaimed water is not new, only its use in Maryland is. In conclusion, as we combat climate change and changes in Maryland's waterscape, it is critical that we utilize available technologies and innovative ideas to ensure the health and safety of both our public and our environment. With the proposed amendments from the bill sponsor, which the department has worked extensively on, this bill can accomplish that goal. Accordingly, we request the committee give a favorable with amendments report on Senate Bill 407. Thank you. Hey, why don't you pass the mic to your left? And Mr. Chairman, we do have a couple on virtual, although. Yeah, I, I, I was hoping to uh, get the in-person folks, uh, yeah, yeah, unless you, uh, no, you know, and then go to the virtual. Uh, can I just clarify, you do, there are two other folks signed up from the city of Westminster. I don't know if they were planning uh, in person, um, uh, specifically uh, Sarah Imholz and Daniel Hoff. So they're not going to. Are they testifying because they're signed up? I think up they're testify. here for questioning. Okay, fair enough. So let's do this panel and then we'll go to your two virtual. Um, is, and why don't we start there? Sure. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. I'm Greg Pecorero and the president of the city council in Westminster. And I just want to leave you with three points on this, this indirect potable water reuse project. First is that we've been working with MDE closely for years on developing a secure water supply for the system of Westminster. And this is the result. We have strong federal support. We've gotten an earmark funding from Senators Van Hollen and Raskin with the help of uh, Congressman Ruppersberger, who is now our congressman in, replace, in replacing Congressman Raskin. And finally, it's the only realistic path forward for the city of Westminster to develop a secure water supply that our residents can count on. Thank you very much. Okay, before we go to the two virtual witnesses, is there any questions? So we'll start with um, Vice Chair Kagan, then Senator Augustine, and then Senator Reedy, we'll go to your two virtual witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Reedy, for this bill. And thank you, Mr. Pecorero, uh, Council President, uh, Madam Mayor, and always good to see you, Mr. Knapp. Um, I am looking at the testimony submitted by Sarah Impulse that has um, links to the articles about the drought um, that date back to uh, 1999 and 2002. So in the past 20 years, has there been no other drought? And as we know, in climate crisis, um, it's not just global warming anymore. So that would have been drought, but we also have extreme rain uh, events. And I'm wondering if you could give us a sense of the last 20, 21 years and uh, that update. I think I think I'm the only Westminster official who's been around that long. 
<laughs> and I remember when we trucked in the water originally, and I remember the years since then. And certainly there have been droughts conditions since then, but we've managed our way through those with water, with, with water reductions and asking citizens to conserve and you know things like that. Uh, we, we did during that time early on establish an emergency pipeline to the quarry at considerable cost to the city, but there's a time limit on, on how much longer we'll be able to use that. You know, there's a, we have a lease with the quarry and that's gonna run out in I think about eight years. And so that's why we need to have some alternative in place. Second part of the question, have there also been on the other side, have there also been floods and other extreme weather on the other end? We've had extreme weather, but and, but not and not really flooding in the city. I mean, we're on pretty high ground mostly. I, I would I would add that um, more than not, we've seen not the drought conditions of 2001, 2002, but we have had drought, more of a drought sort of setting in Westminster and Carroll County than the excess rains. A question, um, is this scalable? If it starts in Westminster and it goes super, will it be able to be rolled out to other jurisdictions around the state? So from MDE's perspective, we believe uh, absolutely so, that this is a good test case for this technology in Maryland for us to figure out how to permit it. But this is scalable technology. There is, of course, an initial set cost for any facility, but you can treat a little bit of water or a lot depending on how you build the facility. Okay, Senator Augustine. Thank you, Chair Feldman. Um, Vice Chair Kagan took one of my questions about the scalability of this, but I just think this is awesome. First, I just want to say that. I think this is really cool. Thank you. I really like what you guys are doing here. Um, and I would love to be able to, for us to receive and to learn more. So right now you have it such that the report just goes to the governor and not, is, is that correct um, right now, sponsor? Yeah, and that's probably a function of working uh, with MDE, you know, thinking it goes, we, we certainly could have a report go to the, to the, either the, the committees of jurisdiction or the General Assembly, I mean, it's, it, it's certainly open to, we've, we've got plenty of other sponsor members. That you got to so deal with? Okay. We're happy to. I, I mean, I think that would be yeah. great. I mean, because I think this is really, you know, it's really, really cutting edge stuff. I think it is important for us to stay a part of this process. And I really am grateful that you brought it forward. Well, and for me, thank you. And for me, looking at it, I didn't know much about it when I started, you know, working and, and getting to know what they were doing in Westminster. But, um, you know, knowing that it's being done in states all over the West and in places like, like Jacksonville, Florida, they do it. So knowing that they're, you know, it's been tested a lot. So it's not, it's new, but it's not new for everybody. So it's good to be able to, and it's a solution possibly for situations that other towns and counties may face. Thank you, Senator. If I, if I can just add, I, I believe the bill is introduced does require the department shall report to the governor and in accordance with Section 2125 of the state government article, the General Assembly. On okay. the, So you, you will get the report. OK, any additional questions of any of the panelists? OK, seeing uh, seeing none, we are going to go uh, now to the new uh, two virtual witnesses are part of the sponsor panel, uh, Ben Movahead. Mr. Mohead, sir, uh, you're signed up as part of the panel favorable and you've got two and a half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Vice Chair and the committee for the opportunity. Good afternoon. My name is Ben Mohead. I'm president of Watek Engineering with over 35 years of water treatment experience. I'm pleased to testify in support of Senate Bill 407 for drinking water in innovative potable reuse pilot program. We assisted the city of Westminster with performing a series of bench and pilot scale investigations to verify the effectiveness of the membrane-based advanced technologies for purification of the current effluent of the city's secondary and soon to be treasury treated wastewater. Based on the extensive testing and piloting that was uh, conducted last year, the purified water was proven to meet and surpass all EPA primary and secondary drinking water standards prior to discharging to the Cranberry Reservoir, which is used for augmentation of the drinking water source at the uh, current drinking water treatment plant. 
The project consisted of a series of uh, advanced technologies, ultrafiltration, reverse osmosis, advanced oxidation, ultraviolet disinfection, and granule activated carbon. These types of advanced treatment projects meet all criteria for indirect potable reuse applications and provide the necessary public health and address the water supply shortages as a sustainable source of water. Thank you for your time and efforts and looking forward to a favorable vote on this very important Senate Bill 407. Okay, thank you, sir. Any questions for the witness? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna to go to the final witness on this piece of legislation. Um, we're gonna to go to Amy uh, Sepkota. Uh, Ms. Sepkota, we do see you and we hear you. And uh, again, you're part of the sponsor panel. You're signed up actually favorable with an amendment. Um, and so in any event, you've got two and a half minutes. And if you do have an amendment, explain that as well. Great. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be here today and would like to thank the committee for allowing me time to speak. My name is Dr. Amy Sapkota, and I am a professor of environmental health sciences at the University of Maryland School of Public Health. I am also the interim director of the Maryland Institute for Applied Environmental Health and the director of the Conserve Center of Excellence, which focuses on research, extension, and education relating to agricultural and municipal water reuse. I received my master's in public health from the Yale School of Public Health and my PhD from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health Center for Water and Health. I'm here today to testify in support of Senate Bill 407, which proposes to establish the Innovative Potable Reuse Pilot Program in the Maryland Department of the Environment. This past year, my research team at the University of Maryland collaborated with the City of Westminster and Watek Engineering Corporation to evaluate the effectiveness of a pilot advanced membrane-based treatment train in removing both microbiological and chemical constituents from secondary treated wastewater. My team completed extensive testing of water samples collected throughout the treatment train, and the final purified water met or surpassed all EPA primary and secondary maximum contaminant levels for drinking water. The high quality of this purified water makes it suitable for use in an indirect potable reuse application. Moreover, the quality of this purified water surpasses the water quality of typical surface water sources such as rivers that are routinely used as surface water as source waters for drinking water treatment plants here in Maryland. I fully support Senate Bill 407 which will enable the Maryland Department of the Environment to appropriately regulate indirect potable water reuse in the state of Maryland. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, and I'm looking forward to a favorable review from the committee. And I am in support of the amendments from the city of Westminster. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Any questions for the witness? Okay, uh, seeing none, uh, that concludes the bill hearing on Senate Bill 407. Thank you, Senator Reedy. Thank you, sir. And we're going to go a little bit out of order. We've got uh, two bills from Senator Elfrith. And so I think um, other than having her sit here patiently, we're going to accommodate her and we're going to go to Senate Bill of 417, for, unless you have a preference. Do you, uh, okay, we'll go with Senate Bill of 417 first. And your sponsor panelists um, are, we've got three, Dominic Butchko, Romeko, uh, Matt Stegman, and Doug Myers are your designated sponsor panelists. So if we can get them up here. All right. Is, uh, is Dominic here? Dom? Yeah, okay, if you can bring him up here. Uh, while we're doing that, uh, Senator Elfrith, uh, feel you've got the time you need uh, to present Senate Bill 417. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair. It feels good to be an adopted member of the Triple E Committee today. Uh, glad to spend my afternoon with you. Uh, for the record, Senator Sarah Elfrith, representing District 30, here to present Senate Bill 417, Environment, State Wetlands, Shoreline Restoration. I'm going to just back up for a minute. Um, I, this committee knows better than anybody the importance of wetlands and the importance of living shorelines, not just for habitat for oysters and crabs and other uh, species that I know the Bay Foundation will talk about at length, uh, but also as our best uh, first line of defense when it comes to more severe storms, flooding that we're seeing, and also um, a little known but incredibly important um, 
uh, for carbon sequestration, the amount of carbon that is stored in our wetlands is uh, rivals the rainforest. And yet, uh, due to a number of factors, development, uh, again, sea level rise, climate change, uh, a recent study suggests that we are at risk of losing 70% of those wetlands over the next century. And we are contributing to this um, by hardening our shorelines or with armored shorelines for folks who might not represent waterfront districts. That would be our riprap, that would be the bulkheads that we're seeing across the bay. Um, the Bay Foundation will show a chart uh, in their testimony uh, presenting just the, the percentage of our shorelines that are armored across the bay is pretty alarming. Now this committee in this body in 2008, recognized the importance of living shorelines um, and, and passed the Living Shoreline Protection Act to make living shorelines the preferred method to reduce erosion, except for in areas designated by the Department of Environment as appropriate for structural shoreline stabilization measures and in areas where individuals can demonstrate the non-structural measures are not feasible. Uh, unfortunately, in many of the waivers um, that people seek, uh, particularly uh, after major storm events, are granted by MDE. I'd like to thank MDE. This is a, a new day in the General Assembly where uh, the administration is, is actively participating in, in solving some of the challenges that we have. So MDE did reach out yesterday and provide some feedback. Unfortunately, we don't have the number of waivers to present to you, but we know it's significant. What this bill does um, is four things. It seeks to reduce the number of waivers granted by MDE that authorized, again, these hardened methods. It ensures that living shorelines are designated in a manner that increases the resilience of the land and it's protecting the habitat connectivity between land and water that we know so well. It better utilizes mapping between MDE and DNR to more effectively designate priority restoration zones. Um, the two agencies could do a little bit better job of working together on this. And it creates a dedicated funding account to better fund the creation of living shorelines. Now, Mr. Chair, as a bit taken aback by the fiscal note, um, even as an appropriator, we specifically did not uh, put any money into this account in the bill. Um, found out yesterday that when we don't put designated funds into a bill, uh, our fiscal note writers go to the agency and ask them what they think it would cost, and the agency gives a number back. And so that's why you'll see in the fiscal note um, that it should cost a significant amount of money, even though we've not designated funds in, in the bill itself. So I wanted to flag that for this committee. I'm sure it's going to affect all of our bills moving forward. But I think um, the fact that we did not designate uh, any funds dedicated in this account just allow MDE and DNR to figure that out for themselves is important. Um, with that said, Mr. Chair, I look forward to the continued partnership with MDE and DNR. I understand that the new secretary of MDE in particular is equally passionate about living shorelines as this committee and myself are. So I look forward to working with them in the future to make sure that we were reversing the trend of hardening our shorelines and instead really fighting back against the potential loss of, um, frankly, the most important component to our Chesapeake Bay. And with that, I would ask for a favorable committee report. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Elforth, do you have a, a sequence here that you'd like, uh, you prefer? How about the scientist goes first? Uh, okay, it sir. Uh, each of you have two and a half minutes and uh, state your name for the record Great. and then you've got two and a half minutes. Mr. Chair, Ms. <clears throat> Vice Chair, my name is Doug Myers. I'm the Maryland Senior Scientist at Chesapeake Bay Foundation. I speak for about 100,000 humans uh, that are living in Maryland uh, that are supporting uh, our positions <clears throat> and about 3,500 species who can neither fly, crawl, or swim here for testimony today. Uh, I'd like to highlight a couple points um, that Senator Elforth brought forth. Um, I think the, the uh, information we are getting from uh, Department of Environment, we did have a very productive meeting with them yesterday, is that they are keeping track of the uh, variances and they are them themselves alarmed at the increases of them. I think it's uh, very important that we have a data-driven uh, uh, direction on this. I'd like to point out some uh, written testimony that was provided for you from uh, uh, Dr. Rochelle Seitz from Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Uh, her written testimony summarizes over two decades of research on the effects of bulkheads and living shorelines on fish, crabs, clams, worms, and other species critical to the base food web. Uh, two statistics I'd like to point out, one uh, in support of the priority conservation shorelines. Uh, for every increase of shoreline armoring of 10%, crab populations in that tributary de decrease by 4%. This is looking at 500 different studies across the bay over a 20-year period. Uh, in support of the priority restoration shorelines piece, when a living shoreline is replaced by a bulkhead, the benthic community I'm sorry, replaced a bulkhead. Um, the uh, benthic community, that's the stuff that lives in the mud, uh, closely resembled a natural shoreline after only two years. 
Uh, my own background on this uh, subject is I have about 35 years of experience working in several different states. I was in uh, Texas for about 10 years, for Washington State and uh, for 15 years. Uh, and the use of living shorelines was uh, ubiquitous in both of those areas. And in all those cases, it was very important to be able to maintain very importantly, as we are experience sea level rise, the ability to keep pace with sea level rise and still have an intertidal zone. That's important, not just for all those critters, but it's important to maintain public access to the bay, which is in itself a water of the state and public uh, land that's available to all Marylanders. Uh, so in the support of this bill, I um, would like to urge a favorable report. Okay, Mr. Stegman, why don't you go next? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Matt Stegman from the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Uh, just uh, me too to everything my colleague, the scientist, said. Uh, I obviously am not a scientist, nor do I uh, wish to uh, play one before the committee today. Uh, if I can summarize or paraphrase a, a very compelling witness that was before this uh, uh, committee earlier today, uh, when you have MAKO and CBF at the table on the same bill, you know it's a great bill, and uh, sure enough, here we are. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you for your favorable consideration. Okay. Speaking of MAKO. Uh, Dominic Butchko, Maryland Association of Counties. I hear many great things about that witness. I would definitely take everything they say word for word. Um, I just want to say, so this is a very important bill, and it's an important step, but that funding piece I want to touch on really quick. So Maryland has, we heard, you know, previous estimates think the third largest amount of coastline in the United States, but we actually critically underfund how we maintain and, and how we invest in our coastline, and this would be a major first step for conservation. Um, for a state that has the bay su as such a crucial part of our identity and our, uh, our um, economy, we need to invest in our shore and make sure it's healthy. So Mako urges a favorable report. Okay, we'll open up to questions. Any questions for either the sponsor or any of our sponsor panelists? Okay, seeing none. Uh, we only have one additional witness signed up uh, favorable with amendment. We've got uh, Annie Richards from uh, Shore Rivers. So Ms. Richards, that you come up here and um, you'll be the final witness on this piece of legislation. And you've got two and a half minutes. Thank you, Chairman Feldman and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to pre present testimony in support with amendments for SB 417. My name is Annie Richards. I'm the Chester River Keeper for Shore Rivers on Maryland's Eastern Shore, which is experiencing more acutely than any other region of Maryland an accelerated rate of erosion and pressures of sea level rise and land sub subsidence. For the river keepers at Shore Rivers, shoreline erosion is one of the most common reasons a community member reaches out for consultation from a river keeper. Whenever appropriate, we recommend implementing a living shoreline and provide information, resources, as well as designers who can help that homeowner through the process. SB 417 requires an assessment to identify where living shorelines can be installed and opens funding to convert degraded hardened shorelines into living shorelines. This priority restoration mapping and funding will be an important resource for river keepers as we continue outreach to waterfront homeowners with erosion challenges. Unfortunately, costs of living shorelines are incredibly high and variable due to few fuel prices, as well as the labor required to walk a project through the lengthy permitting process. As a result, many homeowners seek waivers to implement armored shorelines or do nothing at all. This bill seeks to curb the widespread issuance of waivers to the existing living shorelines law and, prote and will protect critical underwater habitat for estuary and life. In fact, a recent National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration study identifies that shorelines with 30% armoring or greater will negatively impact fish habitat and reproduction, a detriment to biodiversity in the Chesapeake and our local fishing economies. Shore Rivers recommends amending the restrictions on grant funding in this bill. Any property identified within the priority restoration area, regardless of existing armoring, should be eligible to apply for landowner assistance funding. This will incentivize more residents to make the right choice to implement a living shoreline and reduce the likelihood of a resident taking no action at all due to cost barriers. Proper shoreline restoration is essential for protecting against erosion and sea level rise, sustaining important intertidal habitat like marshland, submerged aquatic vegetation, and filtering nitrogen and phosphorus from surface water flowing into our rivers. To protect and sustain Maryland's shorelines, I request this committee adopts a favorable report with amendments on 417. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, for that testimony. Any questions for Ms. Richards? 
Okay, seeing none, that uh, concludes the bill hearing on uh, Senate Bill 417. And we're going to turn again to Senator Elfrith on Senate Bill 327. And I've got uh, your sponsor panelists. I've called them up Charles Rodney, uh, Paul Betito, Bedito, uh, Jack Bailey, and Bill Miles. And those are the four designated sponsor panelists. And Senator Elfrith, um, we have some other folks signed up, not part of your panel, but uh, we're going to start with you. Describe, explain Senate Bill 327. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and Madam Chair, members of the committee. Sarah Elfrith, representing District 30, here to present uh, Senate Bill 327, Hunting, Wildlife Conservation, and Outdoor Recreation, Funding, Promotion, and Management Licenses, Permits, and Stamps. I think I win the award for most commas and a bill title this year. Um, this is a little bit out of the box for me. Um, I can sit here and say I have never actually been actively hunting. I sat in a, a nice uh, goose blind with Senator Bailey and Mr. Pedito just two weeks ago to take in the experience. But um, I am presenting you this bill because I firmly believe that the more opportunities we can give Marylanders to get outside, recreate, enjoy our natural resources, the more we're gonna have people care about protecting and preserving those resources. This committee has done that with water access, parks, et cetera. Today, I'm asking you to consider uh, expansion of our hunting laws um, in that same vein. So um, with that said, Senate Bill 327 has the potential to create the next generation of conservationists by codifying and expanding out the outreach to DNR's wildlife conservation, education, and outreach program at long last giving that office the resources they need to meaningfully expand hunting and recreation opportunities to communities that have historically not had access to our outdoors. Expanding programs to engage veterans, women who hunt, and youth from communities that might not, or, uh, might not otherwise have been engaged in hunting. You know, to accomplish this necessary and critical expansion, we've worked with the hunting community to increase hunting license and stamp fees, which have not been raised since 1989. Importantly, by raising these fees, we're gonna leverage federal funds at a one to three match. So $3 for every $1 of state funding here. Projected to, to generate 6.8 million more state and federal dollars that can be invested in, like I said, expanding those prog that programming by designating eight additional pins for DNR and then expanding our land preservation um, ability by expanding the low funded and little utilized heritage conservation fund to preserve sensitive habitat. Um, even with increasing our fees, uh, we will still be incredibly competitive with our surrounding states of Virginia, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey, who average, av whose average fees is around $67. This legislation will create an average resident fee of about $53.50 uh, here in Maryland. We will also create a new sick -a stamp to help mitigate the growing concern for our neighbors on the Eastern Shore. I hope uh, Senator Addie Eckert is listening to us today because she talked at length about the growing sick -a population on the shore and our need to strategically manage that population. Uh, but it's not just that. The bill has some ancillary benefits as well to address many concerns we've heard from a, a variety of constituents. It's going to further clarify Senator Bailey's bill from last year on the liability of private landowners who allow specified individuals rather than the public at large to hunt on their property. This will give our farming community in particular a lot more certainty in allowing hunters to help mitigate deer populations that contribute in to millions of dollars in crop damage every year, and you will hear from the Farm Bureau uh, later on to that effect. It requires DNR in consultation with the Department of Agriculture to think creatively and develop, develop a plan to address the overpopulation of deer in the state, working with state parks and counties on a potential strategy for managed hunts on public lands. And as every farmer you meet will tell you, the deer very much know what is public land and they will uh, seek safe respite in those public lands, but in between wreaking havoc on crops. So providing DNR with the ability to think creatively about that managed hunt opportunity. Um, now to the controversial piece of the legislation. I'm going to address that head on. As drafted, the bill would authorize the hunting of migratory game birds on Sundays. It's important to note that based on the seasons for both geese and ducks, this would only account for eight to 10 Sundays a year. You will hear some testimony today from folks, uh, young people and stakeholders who are not able to hunt during the week and have other commitments on Saturdays who would like and appreciate this extra opportunity to experience their outdoors. However, experiencing that, uh, appreciating the counties and communities are different, and that after meeting with the Maryland Horse Council, who will be testifying today, I'm going to propose an amendment uh, that will give our counties three options. One, a county may opt in to all uh, Sunday hunting of, of waterfowl, again, only eight to 10 Sundays a year. Uh, 
A county may choose only to offer Sunday hunting for migratory birds um, from 30 minutes before sunrise to noon. So providing a kind of a split day that this committee has explored before um, or opting out entirely. I've already heard from Prince George's County and like to thank Senator Watson for having many conversations with me about this. And you'll have testimony from Kent County already seeking ways to opt out. No, Mr. Chair, with the committee's indulgence, I'd ask for one week so I can meet with all the delegations in the state and bring you a comprehensive amendment uh, based on what counties, uh, how they wish to, to participate in this. Um, I'm very proud of the wide array of support this bill has from the Humane Society, uh, Department of Natural Resources. I'd like to thank Mr. Pedito for being the expert on this, these issues. Uh, the Farm Bureau, Nature Conservancy, Maryland Votes for Animals, Sportsman's Foundation, National Deer F Association, and others. This bill is going to do a whole lot of good. It expands opportunities for Marylanders, especially veterans and young people, to experience the outdoors and a new form of recreation. It pays for itself by increasing fees that have not kept pace with the cost of the services we are providing and have not been raised in nearly my entire lifetime. And it helps our farming community. With a bit more finessing on the Sunday Hunting Amendment, Senate Bill 327 has the potential to be one of the most transformative pieces of legislation this body can pass in the name of conservation. And with that, Mr. Chair, and the uh, Sunday Hunting Amendment we will bring to you in win one week, I ask for a favorable report with that amendment. Okay, thank you, Senator Elfrith. Why don't we uh, hear from our colleague, Senator Bailey on this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the committee. Senator Bailey, for the record, representing St. Mary's in Calvert County. I support this legislation, especially since the cost of these hunting licenses hasn't been raised since 1989. I wanna make some brief but very important points as you contemplate this legislation. This bill expands waterfowl hunting to Sundays. I'm a big fan of youth activities. I'm a big fan of conservation and teaching our youth about co conservation. The conservationists that we have, a lot of them, the hunters and the fishers, have been the stewards of the Chesapeake Bay, and it's important that our youth see this. This is a way to expand our opportunities for our youth. This is truly bipartisan initiative, and it gives the ability to opt in or out. It allows our counties and our constituents to be involved in the process. This is so important to emphasize that the counties can opt out. It's not a mandate and it supports local courtesy. For the new members of this committee to hunt any day of the week, you need to have some things, right? I know some of you aren't that familiar with it. You've got to have a hunting license. You've got to pay us hunter education. You've got to have landowner permission. Hunting is an extremely regulated activity. The Sunday prohibitions on hunting are archaic. And thankfully, 46 states have followed the science and they've worked with landowners and constituents in all those other states to allow Sunday hunting. When we talked about the fee increase to our neighboring states, they allow Sunday hunting. I don't understand why any association that can already participate in hunting on Sundays would oppose any of these opportunities for other, others and young people to do so. We have with us today, I'm gonna, uh, you're gonna get to hear from my son, Taft, and uh, his best friend, uh, Nate Shaw. They're here today rather than being in school to see how our government works, how we pass bills, and how to testify on something that's very important to them. They both are more capable and they can answer many questions that you have about hunting. I request a favorable report and I'm able to answer any of your questions. Okay, Senator Bailey, why don't you hand the mic? We'll go through the whole panel and then we'll open up questions. Good afternoon. My name is Charles Rodney. I'm known all over as the rabbit hunter. That's all I do. I support everything but that both of the senators have said before me. This is a great bill. I ask for a favorable response. One of the aspects of this bill that I really like, and that is the education of people who don't know about hunting, particular rabbit hunting, young people, veterans, disabled veterans who don't get the opportunity. I am the professor and I need students. This bill will give me students so that as my hunting days are limited because I turned 73 on Saturday. So I don't know how many more years I will be doing this, but I want to pass all of my knowledge and my skills in rabbit hunting, which is the first and the foremost, I think, in hunting. And it's the best sport there is. 
So I want to pass my experience on. I ask for a favorable report. And thank you for the opportunity for allowing me to give testimony. And a belated happy birthday to you, sir. Thank you. Let you uh, sir, tell us your name. And then again, each of you has two and a half minutes. You'll see the clock on the board here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Paul Pedito. I'm the director of the Wildlife and Heritage Service at DNR. Um, I rarely admit this, but I think it's important to say it today. Um, I've been the director for 20 plus years. Uh, I started out as a wildlife biologist for the department. And um, this is the most excited I've ever been about testifying on a bill in my career. And I've done this hundreds of times for those two decades. As Senator Elfrith said, this is transformative. I think it's important to remember, and I've said this before to uh, members of the legislature, what we manage as the wildlife agency in Maryland is almost exclusively unhunted or untrapped. The vast majority of the vast majority of the species and habitats that this revenue will benefit will never be hunted. So all of the things that you appreciate as people who drive home and you're you're looking at open space, you're seeing a bald eagle, you're admiring a reptile or an amphibian, our um, uh, state bird, the Baltimore Oriole, all of those are managed with these dollars and the federal match that's associated with it. As the Senator said, we get a three to one bonus on those stateside revenues. That is effectively free money that will go to other jurisdictions if we don't have the revenue on the state side to match it. Um, so this is this is as good as it gets to, to Senator Bailey's point, follow the science. You will hear that there are any number of issues related to hunting waterfowl on Sundays. Um, as Senator Bailey said, 46 other jurisdictions have for decades hunted waterfowl on Sunday. Some of our most productive goose and duck habitats in North America allow hunting on Sunday. Um, there's just no science that supports uh, the necessity of foreclosing it here in Maryland. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, why don't you hand that? We're gonna have a cleanup at the end there and you've got uh, two and a half minutes, tell us your name. And then we'll open it up for uh, some Q&A. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, a pleasure to be here. Bill Miles on behalf of the Hunters of Maryland in support of the bill. Um, it's hard to follow the professor here over here and the good sponsor and backed up by Senator Bailey and Paul Pedito here. I've probably been representing the hunting community about as long as Paul has been the wildlife and heritage director. And I will underscore and reiterate what he said and what others have said. The fact that we have this kind of a pad on this kind of support for hunting is something that I've never seen in my two decades plus, and it's absolutely heartwarming to see it. Um, in terms of the bill itself, please know, everybody, that there's something called, it's in our testimony, Hunters of Maryland was submitted, that there's something called the American System of Conservation Funding. And what does that mean? It's basically a user pay model. The Hunters of Maryland, like all across America, are the ones that basically underwrite 100% of all wildlife management cost. Some would say that's fair. Some would say it's not so fair. But this bill makes it clear that the hunting community, once again, is stepping up since 1989 to actually pay more for the management of wildlife. And it's, it's you know, the public trust doctrine says wildlife belongs to no one. It belongs to everyone. But yet the hunters themselves are the ones that willingly and are here today in support, as, as the good sponsor said, we are here 100% support. we got to increase these fees. The 8 or $9 million we can put in wildlife and heritage will do so many incredible things. And um, it, it's just something that is just so very long overdue. And if we can get this, I think you'll see management in Maryland take off like you've never seen before. And we stand 100% behind the bill as introduced, and we ask for a favorable report. Okay, thank you, Mr. Miles. Uh, any questions for either our two senators or the three panelists? Senator Carozza, uh, Senator Augustine, and then Senator Carozza. All right. Thank you, um, Chair Feldman. I'm definitely new to this committee and to this subject matter. And um, I would ask for some additional information from you all um, because I have anecdotal experience of seeing more folks out hiking and stuff like that on Sunday. And I acknowledge like it's anecdotal versus, you know, but I have seen that mm -hmm. where you, you see an area, which is an area where people are able to hunt and stuff like that. But then you know, there are those days where more folks are out there actually hiking, still seeing nature, right. 
but not, but you don't go there when you hear, you know, you hear, you hear the shots, you know what I mean? It's like, that means it's time to like, you maybe to go. So I would really be grateful, you know, for more information to get more comfortable with why it doesn't have a chilling effect on other outdoor activities that would be out there with regard to the Sunday hunting. Senator, that's an excellent question. And I, I will tell you, part of the reason I spent two hours in a goose blind with my colleague here is because I wanted to see firsthand just where where these waterfowl hunting, this hunt, waterfowl hunting would occur and the kind of guns that are used, the range, et cetera. So um, I'm going to ask either Paul or Mr. Miles to elaborate on um, the habitats we're talking about specific to waterfowl hunting that would be impacted by this bill. Thank you, Senator. Um, so I think the the easiest answer to your question is that the the existing subtitle um, precludes the hunting of uh, hunting on state park lands on Sundays. So that's already in the law that we are not uh, afforded the ability to even open any of the lands in the state park portfolio. So that's your state parks, your natural resource management management areas, uh, natural environmental general, yeah environmental areas. Um, so you have a big portfolio of land that's not in the mix by law already. The vast majority of the hunting that occurs after that are on um, undeveloped wildlife management areas or open spaces to, to Senator Elfer's point, open spaces that are owned by private landowners who provide um, hunters permission or lease those rights to them. I understand that. What about those places, like, like you said, an open space we have basically paid for, you know, to have that. What about those places that are held in land trust um, and, and places like that? Again, because these are places where I've gone hiking before on Sunday, but then you see the signs which they allowing hunting on those other days. Indeed, there are, there are places that um, would have hunting, say, on a Saturday for deer management purposes on a limited basis, including our state parks. But never on a Sunday by existing law. With this for birds? It does not. The, so the, no, I mean, I'm places that are not, I understand what you're saying with regard to the state, I'm talking about things like that are, that we've held in preserve the land trust and things like that, those different areas, which are not the state parks, the way that it is currently structured, then that wouldn't, those wouldn't be a part of what you're saying with regard to the state parks and everything. Well, correct? what wouldn't change is if if it is a land trust, right? So Eastern Shore Land Conservancy holds a piece. Um, it is they are the landowners, so it's their decision whether they allow hunting there um, Monday, Tuesday, Saturday, or Sunday. So the landowner is still required to give written permission to those hunters to be there, no matter what. Not, none of that changes here, if that makes sense. Okay, we're going to go to Senator Carroza, then Senator Brooks after that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I wanted to ask, um, this is a very extensive bill, and I represent um, all of Somerset County, all of Worcester County, and more than half of Wicomico County with an outstanding number of hunters. Um, and when, kind of going through it and trying to understand the different pieces of it, um, I wanted to know if, number one, um, and again, I know the bill sponsors are from different parts of the state, but um, Senator Johnny Mounts is someone that I frequently consult with on these issues because he is an avid hunter and really has the pulse of a lot of the local hunters. So I wanted to first ask um, either the bill sponsors, yes, the bill sponsors and Bill Miles, what the, um, like, what the input was from the shore. Um, which hunt clubs were um, consulted. Um, and, you know, um, I appreciate the local options on the um, Sunday hunting, but as um, I know some of the members here know, I've been working on an equitable issue for Sunday hunting in my um, district that when I see other counties that are more urban than Worcester and Somerset, uh, that have all day Sunday hunting and we're trying to get Sunday hunting, but not for migratory birds, which is a different piece as well. So I just, you know, something this extensive 
Um, and I obviously will do my due diligence because of the complexity of the bill, but I really would like to um, better understand what type of input came from the shores, you know, especially the ones in, in my district. And I don't know if the bill sponsors, I don't know what the coordination's been on the shore, um, you know, Mr. Miles. Um. Senator Carosa, that's a fair, fair, fair question to ask. Um, could you uh, put the mic a little closer because we're you know, <laughs> streaming this out? The, the question is whether, what, what degree has the Eastern Shore groups and outfitters and guides and hunters been actually if solicited in terms of what their position is on the Sunday hunting piece? Um, yeah, well, you, you know, Senator, uh, I'm sorry, I cannot speak to that. So, Senator, I'd like to, I'd like to go ahead and uh, take a stab at that. Uh, I'm sure that you're aware that uh, I do a lot of youth activities for whether it be deer hunting or waterfowl activity. We just had one last Sunday that was in Delta. And uh, almost even though it was uh, frigid temperature on the last day, we had almost 75 children that showed up and stood outside all afternoon. Number one topic that came up uh, from everybody there, because in our area, we don't have uh, guides. We all have uh, very few, very few waterfowl guides. We have all private property and private property uh, owners that were taking their children. They were all there and you'll hear from some of the children that are gonna testify. There's very limited opportunity for them to be able to hunt with their children that are involved in sports or other activities if they don't have Sundays. And uh, that was one of the uh, big issues. Now, the other thing was we heard from guides and you're gonna hear from some on both sides of the panel today from the Eastern shore that are here, some to support this and have some have provided written testimony and some to say against it. But I will have to say, in my opinion, and you know, I, I was a, as anybody in here, if this was a, a game, right? I was a natural resource officer for 30 years. So I was distinctly involved in this. And the one thing that uh, I have seen is the fact that the guides hunt on Sunday already whether it be a commercial regulated shooting area or whether it be a, um, you know, if there's certain times on, on uh, tower shoots that they can actually hunt on Sundays. They receive a financial income from hunting on Sundays, taking these same children, taking these same groups hunting on their property that they lease, they can do it on Sundays. The people that can't do it on Sundays are the landowners property tax paying individuals in Maryland that want to use their own property on Sundays are the ones that are negatively affected by us not doing this. Now, under this legislation, I want to be true transparency. Will the guides lose about a week of hunting uh, financially? Absolutely. They potentially will. They can still use their regulated shooting areas. They can still use their other, but they won't be able to stop any other property owner from hunting on Sunday. The property owners will be able to go to their own property. Would this be a financial impact to some of the guides? It potentially will be, and you will see that, and that's why some of them are here to testify. But my point is, it's, you know, it's a complex bill. You know, you start with the increased fees, um, and then you get into the, the Sunday hunting. I'm not debating Sunday hunting with you. I'm trying to get that for my own rural counties. Um, you know, so um, I understand that piece. I think it's more um, the fact that I represent these three counties, that I have numerous hunt clubs and hunters in my district. And I want to make sure that they've been consulted um, on, on a piece of legislation, given that the bill sponsors aren't from the shore. So that, you know, and, and I will do my due diligence, but it's not a debate on Sunday hunting. It's more of a de debate about um, what, you know, the complexity of the bill and the input from my own constituents. So, so I'm, I'm going to definitely give this to uh, Director Pedito. And I, and uh, I think that it's very important that we give your constituents the same opportunity that we give the upper uh, other constituents to be able to hunt on Sunday. And you have the option to opt out. Okay, Mr. Medi, do you if want to I, weigh if in? If I could, Senator, I, I think it's a good question. I won't. I won't talk about the Sunday hunting issue. I will say though that um, uh, that there is a nine-member uh, advisory commission appointed by um, the governor. Those members were all appointed by Governor Hogan. They still are seated. This has been a primary topic for them 
for, for a number of years, frankly, uh, they have on behalf of their constituents and it's broad geographic distribution and sort of philosophic distribution in that body. Um, they support this. You'll hear from some of them today. And I know some of them are landowners in your district. So, um, you know, there, there, there has been outreach. Um, yeah. yeah. Senator, just uh, not being able to talk to every stakeholder possible in every bill. Uh, we're just, we have too much on our plates. I will say that we've relied on membership organizations like Hunters of Maryland, like the Sportsman's uh, Caucus that you'll hear from, um, like Ducks Unlimited, like the Deer Foundation. So we've really relied on the membership groups that obviously would have uh, membership from the shore. Okay, hey, Senator uh, Brooks, did you still have, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, Director Petito, he, he answered the question that I had during his previous Fair enough. Any Any additional questions for uh, for any of the panelists, including sponsors? We've got Senator Simon Air. Thank you, and thank you for this, Bill. Um, I have several hunting clubs in my district, and so just a couple details just to find. I think you said the average cost will be $53.50. What is the current average cost? That's an excellent question. Paul, do you have that off the yeah, top so the for the for the typical resident hunter, the price is going to go up eleven dollars and fifty cents from dollars average now. When they do their stamps, et cetera, yes, the stamp prices, except for the secret deer stamp, stayed stayed the same. So, you know, depending on what you know, it's kind of an a la carte option there. But but the base price is twenty four fifty. It's going to go up eleven um, if they buy the archery and muzzleloader stamps. Nothing changes there. So in the end, they depending on what they do, um, it could be a little bit more to Senator Bailey's number. But frankly, this is an eleven dollar bump for our resident hunters. Okay, and then to the sponsor, you mm -hmm. said you're working on an amendment to mm -hmm. opt in on that. Who would make that decision in the locals under your amendment? Uh, I imagine I'll be coming to the Anne Arundel County delegation for that conversation. Uh, so I'll be reaching out to to all the senators to to seek uh, where they would like their county to fall in this kind of three-tier system no i mean who who makes the decision to say we want to opt in or out are you saying the senators and delegates are making that or is it i, I think it'll be a combination we're gonna to have to rely on our our locals as well so i plan on having a conversation with, with our county executive for instance but beyond that i mean the, how we treat local courtesy generally is is okay. by senator and then the last point of that do you anticipate it's Obviously, Anne Arundel County, I understand that. Is it different for each county who would make that decision? Or I mean, what, what's your vision, I'm basically asking? My vision, based on our, our timeline here with the, the clock ticking, is uh, to chat with every senator and, and ask them to meet with their delegations and come to me with their recommendation and then consult with our house sponsor for them to do the same. And we'll, we'll figure this out over the remaining, I think, 53 days we have. Any additional questions for uh, any of the panelists? Okay, thank you for your testimony. Thank we're you. gonna move on. Uh, we do have several additional witnesses signed up, favorable. Uh, so I'm gonna fill up the panel. We're gonna start with Mac Middleton, familiar face uh, to everybody here. Uh, Harvey Williamson, favorable. Um, S Stephen Holt, did I, yeah, Stephen Holt, Mr. Holt. Julia Peebles. And Stephanie Boyles Griffin, is she here? Okay, I think, does that get this to five? Let's see, one more. And Taft Bailey, I think the four mentioned Taft Bailey. Assume son of Senator Jack Bailey is Taft Taft. Why don't you come up here? So this, we get the full panel. Everybody's got two and a half minutes. And then uh, after this, we'll take some questions. Everybody will testify. And then we'll move on to some additional witnesses. Okay, um, former Senator Senator Middleton, uh, we'll start with you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. It's a pleasure being back here with my former colleagues and friends. For the record, I'm Mac Middleton. I'm with Cornerstone Government Affairs Group, and I'm here today representing the Maryland Farm Bureau. We have submitted testimony. I won't go into the testimony, but first of all, I'd like to thank Senator Alfred for this piece of legislation. It's a very, very important piece of legislation for all the components that are within the bill. Uh, I wanna just underscore two very important provisions in the bill for the farming community. And that is it clears up this whole liability issue. A lot of farmers have deer problems, but they're hesitant to allow people to come in to hunt because of the liability exposure. This bill clears that up. The second most important piece to the legislation is the wildlife management fund. This provides, if the bill passed, this provides the, the state the opportunity for the wildlife management fund 
for every dollar that we leverage, we get $3 that we leverage from the federal government. We have Maryland Farm Bureau has been working with Department of Natural Resources for a number of years trying to deal with this whole entire situation, of, especially around our state parks and, and, and predominantly wooded land, which are natural haven for deer, the nighttime coming out and just destroying corn and soybean and wheat fields. Uh, this bill will allow uh, a, a dream for the farm farming community to hopefully get some type of a, a cost sharing program where we can put in some sacrificial crops to explain what sacrificial crops are. Deer would prefer certain legumes over others, for instance, they love clover. So what this would provide is along the borders of the field, especially around the wooded areas, farmers could plant those crops. When deer come out, they like to eat those, those types of, of, of legumes as opposed to eating their crops. So this is a very, very important piece of legislation for the farming community. We support it wholeheartedly. We did not discuss at our legislative meeting the whole issue of the uh, of the Sunday hunting for migrant birds. Uh, we have our last legislative meeting uh, this Monday night. We will certainly, Senator Elford, bring up that issue. Uh, I would say I like the options that the senators provide, but we'll get back to Senator Elford and the committee on that. So I urge a favorable um, committee vote. Thank okay, you very thank much. Thank you, Senator Middleton. Could you, uh, why don't you pass it to your left and we'll just go down, down the whole panel. Sir, tell us your name and. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I want to thank you for having me here. I'm Harvey Williamson. I'm an outfitter of Williamson Outfitters from down in Dorchester County. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm, a, I'm for this bill. Um, I'm for it for the simple fact that you need to get youth out into hunting. And with the extracurricular activities that happen on Saturdays, whether it's sports, um, school functions that still do happen on Saturdays. It limits the day that they can hunt so that they can't hunt. They have to choose sports or hunting. We're having it open so you could do it on Sundays. You could expose them so they could still have this day. I've been fortunate enough to hunt a good, a good portion of the country. And Sunday hunting is typically known in the West as the, as the working man day. Um, he can doesn't have to take a day off from work, doesn't have to take kids out of school. Um, more, more importantly, taking a day off of work to lose income, he can still go out and enjoy it and share the outdoors with his children. Um, that's really the only my, that's the reason I favor the bill. Thank you for having me. Okay, thank you, sir. Why don't you um, next up? Yeah. Play musical mics here. Uh, first off, uh, Chair Feldman and the members of the committee, thank you for having me today. My name is Stephen Holt. I'm the assistant director for the Maryland Sportsman's Foundation, a nonprofit here in, uh, in Annapolis. Um, so I was going to spend my testimony today kind of arguing about some of the reasons what I think you're going to hear as the ones who are against this bill. Uh, I find them to be quite selfish at the end of the day. But unfortunately, Julia Peebles was supposed to be on this panel. She came down with COVID and couldn't make it. So I thought reading her testimony would... Um, do a little better than that. So I'm going to read part of her testimony. So on behalf of Ms. Peebles, um, she is the manager of agriculture and sustainability and policy for Ducks Unlimited, the world leader in wetlands and waterfowl conservation. She's also a lifelong hunter, a new mother of a 10 month old daughter and a resident of Prince George's County. Um, she feels that this bill resonates on both a very professional and deeply personal level for her, and it's basically the farthest we have come in decades to making hunting and outdoor recreation accessible and more equitable for all Marylanders, not just a select few. Being able to hunt waterfowl on Sundays and creating a program for the DNR to engage historically underserved communities will ensure future generations from all parts of Maryland will be able to enjoy what President Roosevelt called our rightful heritage, the great outdoors. These small changes to increase access opportunities for youth, people of color, women, among others, will be a watershed moment in our state's history and will cement the reputation of Maryland's tremendous natural resources being the most accessible in the country. Right now, her daughter is too young to hunt, but she's hoping to expose her this summer, even to the outdoors, if that means playing or eating the dirt while gardening and discovering earthworms in the ground or skrinks calling around. Her daughter is older. She wants her to join her in the field and grow up with the same appreciation for the outdoors and strong conservation ethic as she has. She can't help but think that this legislation will make getting her out easier and make it easier for working parents like her to have the love of nature persist through the generations. After today, with your approval, our state will be one step closer to ensuring that our woods, waters are not just the entitlement of a few, but the birthright of the many. Thank you, Vice Chair, Chair and the committee for the opportunity to testify on behalf of this legislation. We look forward to a favorable 
Okay, thank you. Yeah. So again, uh, thank you for allowing me to provide some testimony. This is Stephanie Boyles Griffin. And I, again, I serve as a senior scientist uh, at the Humane Society of the United States and also served as a commissioner on the Maryland Wildlife Advisory Commission for 11 years. Committee has heard from hunters supporting this fee increase, but it's really important to also hear the preservation community and the critical need for reform uh, that this bill proposes. We also note that testimony submitted by Maryland Votes for Animals in support of this legislation, the broad coalition of groups that support this legislation is strong evidence of its merit. We appreciate that the bill has many pieces and we're not necessarily testifying in support of every detail. But the core of the bill is to increase access to federal dollars available for conserving, protecting, and managing Maryland's wildlife. Every dollar the state raises in hunting and trapping license fees can be matched by federal funding. And over the years, the number of licenses sold has steadily decreased, while the license fees have remained stagnant, as people have said earlier. And as a result, every year the state leaves a lot of money on the table. A modest increase in license fees alone would significantly increase the amount of revenue that the state receives in federal funding and support the very hard work of the state's wildlife and heritage service. So every year we wait to increase these fees is another year where federal dollars are left on the table. For these reasons, we urge your favorable report. Okay, thank you. Taft, you've got the uh, last word on this panel. Two and a half minutes. All right, hello. I'm Taft Bailey, and I'm a student athlete at Choptagon High School. I did soccer in the fall, and I'm doing wrestling right now. In the fall, we would sometimes have soccer tournaments on Saturdays, and, um, and, and at those tournaments, we would be there just about all day, and that would take up days of, uh, of, of early teal season. It wouldn't be a problem if, uh, it, if all the hunting community could hunt on Sundays. So, and then now I'm doing wrestling, and I've had multiple, and I've had multiple tournaments, and all three have taken away days for hunting waterfowl. And so this is tough because I can only hunt uh, on the weekends because of school. And then, and then, uh, and then that takes away um, the, the days I can hunt on Saturdays when I have sports. So then I have to wait a whole other week to hunt. In the spring, I play baseball. But the difference is in St. Mary's County, I can hunt turkeys on Sunday. I just don't understand why we can't hunt waterfowl on Sundays. But so when we, but so when we waterfowl hunt, we hunt in groups. I hunt with my dad and my grandfather. And so sometimes we take my friends. We learn about the environment, conservation, and also natural resources. Please let this bill pass so we can hunt waterfowl on Sundays like all the other states. And thank you. Okay, thank you, Taft. Um, Vice Chair Kagan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Taft, we are watching you grow up here. It's so exciting. <laughs> you are a lovely young man. And when I had to step out for a quick moment, I was so scared that I missed your testimony. So congratulations. Thank you for coming back. And it's wonderful to watch your very proud dad and mom here. Uh, so encouraging and so supportive of your being here. Um, I'm just going to ask you a question because we're supposed to ask questions and not just say nice things, right? <laughs> so you're, the very last thing you said was like all the other states. So literally 49 other states allow this and Maryland is unique in the country? Um, I do not know the exact number of states, but, um, but I'm for sure that there is other states that do uh, uh, allow um, uh, their citizens to hunt on Sundays. Their residents might be able to hunt, but it might be two or three states, or it might be 49. So I would love it if you would follow up and send me an email, do a little bit of research and check just so we know, because when you testify, we're counting on you as being the expert, right? Because I'm not expert in this bill. So you are testifying as an expert, so I want to know. Like all if right. you say all the other states or if you say three other states, that matters. So I would love for you to follow up with us. Okay, all right, Taft, I'll you'll, do that. you'll get back to us with that information. Thank you, Taft. Um, any additional questions for any of the panelists? Okay, uh, seeing none, um, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'm gonna call up, um, I'm gonna fill up the witness stand again. We've got, I'm gonna throw in a mix of favorables and then some favorables with amendment. Um, listen for your name, Nate Shaw. Carl Wagner, uh, Christy Claggett, Jane Sigler, Peter Heller. Let's see where, where that gets us. Okay, that's five. So uh, we're going to start uh, to the left there. Is that Nate? Yes. Nate Shaw, why don't you start? Everybody gets two and a half minutes. Sir, why don't you can take that middle seat? And um, so, Nate, why don't you lead off? Yes, sir. 
All right. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Nate. My name is Nate Shaw. I'm a new hunter and a student athlete. I play soccer in the fall and wrestle in the winter. With practices in the evenings and tournaments on Saturdays, it is extremely difficult to find time to hunt. I was only able to hunt ducks and geese a couple times this year. I, get, I can hunt deer on Sundays, but with deer hunting, you have to be quiet and sit still. With waterfowl hunting, we go as a group. We talk and learn about outside and nature. Please let us duck, hunt ducks and geese on Sundays just like we could if we were across the river in Virginia. Thank you. Why don't you pass that? Oh, there you go, sir. Tell us your name. Good, good afternoon, uh, panel. Com uh, excuse me, committee. Uh, my name is Carl Wagner. Uh, I am the sitting chair of the Wildlife Commission. I am also the executive director of the Maryland Sportsman Association. I can tell you that the Wildlife Commission represents the whole entire state, uh, Eastern Shore, uh, Lower Eastern Shore, Upper Eastern Shore, Lower um, South County, um, lower Western Shore, Western Maryland. We, uh, we are uh, a very diverse group. We get a lot of feedback. We represent a lot of stakeholder groups. I would tell you that every stakeholder group that we've talked to has been, um, uh, has been anxious to support us. Uh, I can tell you also that their stakeholders um, agreed and willingly accepted a increase in fees for a very small consideration, which is Sunday hunting. Um, so I can tell you across the board, uh, the statistics in the state are actually about 72 to 75 percent of waterfowl hunters want Sunday waterfowl hunting. That's just a fact. Uh, I can answer the other question, but I'll let uh, Tate, is it Tate or Taft? Tate, uh, I'll let him answer that question for you. But it is substantial. There's only a few states, and I can tell you what a few means, but a few states that don't allow Sunday waterfowl hunting in the country. Um, I, as the, as the commissioner of, of the chairman of the Wildlife Commission, my task is to represent all Maryland's, not any special interest groups. I don't get paid to represent any individual group. I represent the hunters of Maryland. And I will tell you that across the board that this bill has unprecedented support, and I hope you guys also support this bill. Okay, thank you, sir. Why don't we uh, just go down the, down the aisle? Let's see this. All right. Good, after, uh, good afternoon, Chairman Feldman and members of the committee. I take no exception to the bill as drafted for the proposed allowance of Sunday hunting. Um, yeah, did you I apologize. Did you state your name? Oh, uh, yes. I'm sorry. My name is Peter Heller. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Heller. Um, I've been a lifelong resident of the state of Maryland for 35 years, 35 years now, and have grown up on the Eastern Shore in Chestertown, um, which has a longstanding sorry, which has a long-standing history and uh, of having some of the greatest waterfowl hunting in our state, as well as uh, along the eastern seaboard. I started hunting at age eight with my family, and at age 18, I started guiding waterfowl for a local outfitter specializing in water and in, in duck hunting in particular. Uh, I worked for them for 16 years, and in that time, I've seen the adverse effects of hunting pressure as on waterfowl, especially pertaining to the movements and the overall hunting, hunter's success. Um, on any given day during waterfowl season, uh, on any given day during waterfowl season, unless there are adverse weather conditions, waterfowl, particularly puddle ducks, make two flights a day on average. Those flights include leaving the food source and heading to the refuges and leaving the refuges and heading back to the food source after legal hunting hours. This habit, this habit has been created over the years because of hunting pressure. By adding Sunday waterfowl hunting, you will add even more stress and on the resource that's already at max capacity, in my opinion, and many other folks in the area. On any given, on any given day during hunting season, my wife and I will sit there and listen to hundreds of shots go off around our waterfront farm. Even as a hunter, this can be intrusive, and I can't imagine how non-hunters feel um, on, on those days you know, that aren't used to hunting at all. Um, and they're trying to escape the area. They bought a house here. They've tried to escape the area of the hustle and bustle and try to enjoy some much needed peace and quiet. And they don't have that. Um, I, le you know, not only do the birds need a break, but, you know, landowners and, you know, the constituents of the community need a break as well. I leave you with this last thought. Put yourself in our shoes. 
We're the ones that live it day in and day out. Imagine waking up 30 minutes before sunrise during waterfowl season on your day off and all you hear is gunfire for hours. Then again in the afternoon. Why don't you finish on while you're at it? Because I, I, you know, I yep. lumped uh, the favorables and I, no, I, no, no, that's you fine. You signed up with a favorable with an amendment. I don't know if you. Yeah, uh, so I, I am in support uh, with amendment for the bill 327. I just ask that you consider taking the Sunday hunting out of the bill. Okay, well, let's pass on. And again, the, the final two witnesses are fable with an amendment. I'm trying to consolidate here, but if you have an amendment, describe exactly what you want to change. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, again, my name is Jane Sigler. I'm here for the Maryland Horse Council. The Horse Council is the statewide trade association for the entire horse industry in Maryland. In our written testimony, you'll see some information at the end about the economic impact and the size of the industry and the participants. Um, the majority of Maryland's equestrians are trail riders. We support many of the provisions in this bill, including the increase in fees and the creation of the Wildlife Conservation Education and Outreach Program. Interest in and participation in outdoor activities have skyrocketed during the pandemic and increased opportunities for education about and access to outdoor experiences of all types, including hiking, bird watching, trail riding, and hunting is an important goal. We oppose one provision, however, this, the change that will allow Sunday hunting of migratory game birds on public and private land. The, in recent years, there have been a number of attempts to achieve that. These are standalone bills and they have all failed. Embedded in this otherwise generally very good bill is a provision that would allow all day sunny hunting for waterfowl statewide, which is not currently allowed anywhere in the state, on virtually every Sunday from September through early March and in some cases mid-April. The Horse Council has always opposed Sunday hunting due to the adverse impact on all the other users, safety concerns, et cetera, who also have, for the most part, only weekends to enjoy the outdoors. We have been in discussions with the sponsor and we are hopeful that the bill can be amended to address our concerns. We also have concerns about section two of the bill, which directs DNR to develop a plan to control deer overpopulation in the state. Our concern has to do with this language, the feasibility, the plan shall include the feasibility of implementing a rotational closure hunting strategy on state land, including state park system lands and hunting state land on Sundays. Um, curiously, none of our contacts, either inside or outside DNR, has been able to explain to us exactly what that phrase means, but we are concerned that it means opening up state park land to hunting on Sundays. Uh, attendance at the parks is way up and the deer population actually is way down. It's down from 300,000 at its peak to currently about 200,000. So we are have concerns about this provision as well and would like to see some more discussion on that. Thank you very much. Hey, Ms. Sigler, could you pass that on? Afternoon, committee members and chair. I'm Christy Claggett of Harwood, Maryland, a Maryland Horse Council Legislative Committee member, a farmer, and also a member of a riding club locally. Um, as Jane stated, the Maryland Horse Council requests two amendments to Senate Bill 327. The first is to remove the allowance of Sunday hunting for waterfowl. That's page 11, line 28. Um, currently, there are eight states on along the mid-Atlantic that do not allow Sunday hunting. Uh, sorry, Ted, to do that for you. But anyway, it is eight states that don't. Um, so the hunting of geese takes place not only on the shore, but also in the middle of fields. So if you're trying to ride your horse, your bike, watch birds, anything like that, you can come across a volley of shots that will be very disruptive to that activity. Um, also, we do not, uh, we stand with Kent County and the Maryland Outfitters Guide Association. They uh, live this life. They know how stressed the birds are. They know that another day of high kill on Sunday will be very detrimental to the water population, uh, the waterfowl population. The waterfowl has not recovered even to 2018 levels yet. There's, there's still very great stress in the population. And then the second thing we uh, disagree with is page 12, line six, which speaks about Sunday hunting on state land and state parks. Um, last year, we, we just passed Senate 
Bill 541, the Great Maryland Outdoors Act. And that was addressing the surge of public use of our parks. So now we're going to close the parks on Sundays when people have just really gotten keen about going out into them. It really is not a good plan. Um, Maryland Horse Council does not oppose hunting and neither do we oppose the reduction of the deer population. We just oppose Sundays being used for this. We want safe Sundays and we want shared Sundays. So hunters are not the only recreationists that wanna use the big outdoors. Um, we they're only 2% of the population. Uh, their kids are only a part of that are very small. There are a lot of kids that wanna ride and a lot of kids that just wanna enjoy the outdoors. So please support them. Thank you. Okay. Any questions for the panel? Uh, Senator um, Carroza, and then we'll go to Senator Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Siegler, you mentioned um, some of the um, other efforts on uh, Sunday hunting, and I represent the three counties I mentioned, Somerset, Worcester, and Wicomico. And um, those are local bills. And those bills are supported by the locals. They have letters of support from the county commissioners. Um, they have letters of support from the local hunters. Um, they have actually even letters of support from some local horse riders. So when the Maryland Horse Council comes in and opposes these local bills, you know, I don't even know how many members you have in my district, but I wanted to let you know that I actually am hearing from uh, my constituents, that there is a local consensus. These are local courtesy bills. And when the Maryland Horse Council comes in more from a central Maryland approach and comes in and, and uh, shares, you know, their opposition. Um, and I'm actually, I actually have constituents who are horse riders who support Sunday hunting. You know, I think that you should factor that in before you come in and testify against a local bill. And I would be curious to know how many how many members do you have um, in Somerset County? Thank you, Senator. I, I appreciate your concerns. And um, we do have members on the Eastern Shore. I can't give you a number right off the top of my head. But um, I think when the time comes to for us to testify on, on those bills, I think we will be able to address some of your concerns. I, you know, I, I think that we... We have we are a membership organization, so we have to form our policy based on what our members members want. So obviously, there are some of our members who don't have a problem with Sunday hunting, but a lot of them do, and so that's why we have taken that position. Underscore: These are local bills. I understand that. I've been doing this a long time, Senator. I understand county bills. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go to Senator Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do want to thank uh, Miss Claggett, who who represents the. Marlboro Hunt Club, which resides in my district. And also in my district is the Equestrian Center, which is, has a huge footprint in Upper Marlboro. And hundreds of acres of land are connected for the purpose of riding in my district. I did, uh, as, as said earlier, had a conversation with the Senator who is sponsoring this bill and I appreciate her flexibility for understanding the nuances of different areas. But I did wanna thank again uh, in, in a, Thank you and appreciate you inviting me over to see firsthand where the club is and letting me know of your concerns. So I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Um, specifically that land that we showed you, there are um, duck blinds and there are uh, blinds within the fields. So if these are active on Sunday, no riding event can take place. Uh, we will be shut down and we have about 108 members. Okay, any additional questions for any of the panelists here? Okay, seeing none. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We've got two um, additional witnesses. I'm going to call up favorable with amendments. We're going to call them up. It's uh, Thomas Marvel and Webb Johnson. And then we're going to have one final witness who is signed up unfavorable. We're going to keep that separate. Um, so, Mr. Marvel, Mr. Johnson, you're signed up favorable with amendments. And so, if you have amendments in mind, feel free. Please describe them as part of your testimony. Each get two and a half minutes. Go ahead. Oh. oh. Actually, let me just qualify. Yeah, Mr. T uh, the unfavorable is now favorable with amendment. So are you Jared Thompson? Okay, so you get now. This is our final panel for uh, 
for this particular piece of legislation. Okay. Um, when we start here to my far left, or here, sir, you're in the middle. You've got the mic in front of you. Tell us who you are. Uh, I'm Thomas you. Marvel. Uh, having been born and raised and lived my entire life in Kent County, 30, 59 years. I'm a fourth generation waterfowl outfitter with a business that my great grandfather started in the late 1920s. This testimony represents the views of the blindsided waterfowl hunters, outfitters, and conservationists on Maryland's Eastern shore. We support the bill 327 with an amendment taking exception to the Sunday waterfowl hunting in Maryland. The Eastern shore of Maryland was once considered the Canada goose capital of the world, but over hunting and poor breeding conditions led to the decline of the Canada goose populations to the point of a six year moratorium on its hunting in the late 1990s. It may come as a surprise that waterfowl outfitters that take out hunting parties are opposed to Sunday hunting. This would likely mean more money in our pockets, but that's being short-sighted. We're interested in the long-term sustainability of waterfowl populations in Maryland for not only ourselves, but for our future generations. Contrary to belief, outfitters are the waterfowl managers and ground roots conservationists in Maryland. We provide food and safe haven to all of our waterfowl species. Outfitters and hunting guides likely know more about the populations of movement of waterfowl in the state than anyone else, because that's our business. It's what we do day in, day out. It's our job, it is our life. It's worth noting that the Maryland Department of Natural Resources did not consult or notify the outfitters and guides that it collects its license fees from, or even the hunting community before supporting this legislation. There has not been any in-person public comment session on the waterfowl seasons since 2019, and zero input solicited or considered from the waterfowl outfitter community and the hunters that we support. We hunt and guide other hunters on a daily basis, year after year. Adding Sunday hunting is not going to. You can finish your thought, wrap up. Adding Sunday hunting is not going to magically sell more hunting licenses. The people who hunt, who are going to hunt on Sundays, they already hunt. They already have a license. So I ask that you support the bill 327 with an amendment to exclude Sunday hunting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Why don't you uh, pass that uh, to your right and then Mr. Thompson will end up with you. Mr. Marr, will you go next? Uh, Mr. Chairman, in the Education and, and Energy and Environmental Committee, uh, I'm Webb Johnson. I am here to represent the Maryland Outfitters and Guides Association, and I'm also president of the Quaker Neck Outfitters. Um, I have to testify that I am uh, with the bill for an amendment of removal of the Sunday waterfowl hunting. Um, I understand that the fees need to be increased. They haven't done so in 34, 33 years, whatever the math was, um, and understand that we need it. And there's one thing I'd like to talk about that people think that if you get Sunday waterfowl, you add these days. Um, the feds have told us that we have what we have is a compensatory day for our Sundays that we have now and our allotted time frames of our seasons. And we would lose them 100%, regardless of what county says. So if Kent County, which I live in, said that they don't want it, I lose potentially eight days of my hunting season that I'm allotted while another county neighboring me could hunt. Um, it's a major loss in business for me if that happens, but the conservation side of it, the the waterfowl on the Atlantic Flyway, we are the smallest flyway out of all of them, and we rank six counties in the top 22. Maryland ranks fourth in harvest in the nation. Um, just some thoughts from the National Fish and Wildlife. Um, I'd love to be able to see my children 
come and hunt and run a business like I do. Uh, but I believe that Sunday waterfowl would be very detrimental and we would go back to our limited seasons and limited harvest and potentially back into the moratorium statuses, which were the only fly that's ever actually had to go through one. Um, Virginia was the last state in 2013 to pass a Sunday waterfowl. Since then, they are down 46,000 in their license sales. So there is data out there that says the three R's does not work with the Sunday waterfowl hunting. Um, other than that, it just would force more hunting, more pressure, less bird movement. They will only move when it is safe for them to move and to and from where they move. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna uh, the final witness on this piece of legislation. Um, sir, why don't you get the mic? And uh, you're Mr. Marble. I think I had you guys switched up. I'm Mr. Johnson. You're Marble, you're Johnson, Marble. You're Marble, okay. Sir, tell us your name. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Jared Thompson, and I am here in opposition to the Sunday hunting provision of Senate Bill 327. I am a lifelong resident of Maryland's Eastern Shore, avid hunter, and above all, a waterfowl conservationist. I earned my degree in wildlife and fisheries biology from Clemson University and came back to work for the Department of Natural Resources Wildlife and Heritage Service for eight years, managing habitat and conducting waterfowl surveys. I firmly believe that seasons and bag limits need to be made based on science, biology, and what is best for the species. Decisions based on hunter preference alone are biased, short-sighted, and unsustainable. A disproportionate number of waterfowl are harvested on Saturdays, and adding Sundays coupled with the recommendation to increase the goose limit to two birds and add 15 days to the season this coming year will result in overharvest. Data does not support adding Sundays. DNR conducts a survey of waterfowl that overwinter in Maryland every winter. In 2018, there were 641,000 geese, and in 2023, they counted only 320,000. Total waterfowl was almost half of the 2018 number of just over a million, down to 632,000. If this is about youth opportunity, then let's add more youth days. We started taking our children with, with us, my family, at the age of two but I know Sunday hunting is unsustainable and I would rather be able to take my children and grandchildren into the future. It is important to learn from history and not make the same mistakes. Let's not forget the goose hunting moratorium from 1995 to 2000. This was a result of increasing bag limits and seasons. Now more than 20 years later, we have not recovered to pre-moratorium numbers. Just because a species is doing well, doesn't mean we need to harvest more. The fact that surrounding states allow Sunday hunting is irrelevant. Other states are not like Maryland. Maryland is unique. The Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries and the farmland make Maryland a haven for waterfowl. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service harvest reports that Kent County is third, Queen Anne sixth, Talbot 11th, Cecil 22nd, and Dorchester County 25th out of 3,115 counties nationwide for goose harvest. Surrounding states like Virginia and New York don't have any counties in the top 100. The title of the bill includes conservation and management and Sunday hunting does not support either. You have the outfitters, guys, and clubs here who would direct financially the most from Sunday hunting telling you that this is not responsible and they don't support it. That should tell you all you need to know. Please vote no on Sunday hunting in this bill. It's time to put the resource we love first, not our wants. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, any questions for the panel, Senator Carroza, and then Senator Gallion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Marvel or Mr. Johnson, putting Sunday hunting aside, um, just with your interaction with hunters, um, are there um, any other initiatives um, that you think that hunters would benefit from, and um, such as venison donation programs? Um, as it was mentioned, maybe promoting youth hunting certification. Um, just want to kind of put that aside and just your reaction to, you know, if there are other opportunities to support hunters. Um, I wanted to ask in those areas or if you had any other um, suggestions on, you know, what could benefit um, our hunters. 
I would love to speak. Go ahead. Yeah. No? Uh, I mean, like we said, we're all about promoting uh, hunting to youth. So yeah, we would push any um, youth days. And like you said, a venison donation program, I mean, that is much needed in this uh, in this state, I believe, due to the fact that we do have a high deer population and you have a lot of farmers, especially in your district, that struggle to find a place for the deer that they shoot. I think that's a great point. It, re it really is. I think we, there should be funding for things like that. It's much needed. Hey, Senator Gallion. Brief. Uh, uh, let me throw this out there and get your response. Uh, why not? Go ahead and try adding the sunny hunting. And if it doesn't work, we come back later and adjust that to no for waterfowl. The reason we would be opposed to that is once you allow Sunday hunting, if we ever go down that road and decide we don't want it, those Sundays are no longer compensatory, which means they count during the season. So if there's eight Sundays in our hunting season, we will lose those eight days of hunting. And there's and we and we cannot go back. And the last thing, um, what happens to the total number of days for waterfowl hunting if a if a county opts out of sunny hunting? What happens to the total number of days? You go down those number of days on your season. So if you're in a duck hunter, um, this year I believe it's eight days. You would lose your eight. You would lose eight days. That county would lose those eight days. If you were in a forty five day goose season this season. Uh, you would have, I believe, six days. I have, have to double check the calendar, obviously. Um, but you lose them. There's and you don't get them back. So on a business standpoint, it's uh, pretty detrimental to the community and the outfitters and guides or public that can't go hunting on it. Okay, any additional witnesses for this panel? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the bill hearing on Senate Bill of uh, 327. And we will next turn to Senator Bailey. Um, spending a lot of time today in the committee, Senator Bailey, uh, we are here on Senate Bill 275. And um, why don't you take a seat? We don't have any sponsored panel. We do have um, some witnesses signed up favorable, but not part of a designated panel. So why don't you explain uh, Senate Bill 275 to us? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Senator Bailey, St. Mary's, Calvert County for the record. Senate Bill 275 would require a person who uses a snare, a trap, or another similar device to capture wildlife to ensure the person's Department of Natural Resource identification number is affixed to the device. This requirement can be fulfilled by the number either being stamped on the device or being on a metal tag affixed to the device. This will give the Department of Natural Resource the ability to trace or track or even identify a snare or a trap back to its owner so that the owner can be contacted should it be necessary to inform them of an issue involving their trap. The DNR identification number that would be required to be associated with the device is not public information and can only be searched by the Department of Natural Resources or the Natural Resource Police staff. So they would be the only ones to be able to identify the owner. This bill also includes a provision to report a device that does not have this number to the Department of Natural Resources or the Natural Resource Police. It's important to note that there is an exception in the bill so that it does not apply to an individual setting a trap either on their own property or property that they are renting. Trappers serve a distinct role in conserving our resources and helping us control nuisance animals. Nothing could be a better example than the elimination of the invasive species Nutra on the eastern shore that was done by trapping them. These tags will assist our trappers in retaining the public's trust of the vital role that they have in wildlife management. This requirement is already in place in many of the other states. The right to hunt, fish, and trap is an important part of Maryland's culture and a tradition, and with this right comes the duty to do so in a responsible and ethical manner. In addition to the testimony that you received in support of this leg legislation, I've also worked with and spoken with representatives of the Maryland Fur Trappers Association who informed me that they are not in opposition to this legislation. I respectfully request a favorable report on Senate Bill 275. Thank you for your consideration, and I'd be happy to take any questions. 
Questions for Senator Bailey? Okay, um, Vice Chair Kagan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Bailey, um, I'm trying to read this. I, I read the bill, I'm looking at the testimony and I'm in the fiscal note now. Can you just explain, and maybe you already said it, um, the person who is otherwise exempt from having a license or permit, um, did you indicate who that is that's exempt? So that would be um, the person that would be exempt would be, for example, um, myself or Taft, who now he's going to have to do this research. <laughs> but, but Taft, if he was going to go set a trap on our own property, right, he would not have to do the tagging. He is exempt from the hunting license. So he would not have to set it on our own property. Now, if he went to one of my uncle's farms, um, he would not be exempted there. The traps that we use there would then in fact have to be tagged. And uh, Maryland's one of the last states that has ever had um, a tagging requirement. I ask how many other states have done that? <laughs> like some of my father here. Some research. <laughs> Taft, your homework assignment just got worse. It's your dad's fault. Uh, thank you, Senator Bailey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, any additional questions for the sponsor? Okay, seeing none, we've got um, two witnesses uh, pers in person. I'm going to call up Stephanie Boyles Griffin, Jennifer Bevan Dangle. We did have one virtual witness who has not appeared into the Zoom. So these are the only other two witnesses uh, signed up on this bill. And so we're going to start with um, Ms. Griffin. Why don't you lead off? Okay. Hello again. Um, Stephanie Boyles Griffin again with the Humane Society of the United States. Um, we're proud to have worked with Senator Bailey with feedback from DNR and the Maryland Fur Trappers Association to advance this bill. The traps um, that uh, were described, they're indiscriminate and non-target animals, including family pets, protected, threatened, and endangered species and other animals can be captured, injured, and killed in these devices, and they have in Maryland. So traps that capture non-target animals may not be properly labeled, and as a result, citizens may be unsure of how to report these incidents to authorities when these non-target animals end up in snares and uh, body gripping traps. SB 275 will require that these traps be labeled with the trap owner's identification number and authorizes those who find unlabeled snares and traps to report it to DNR so they can monitor the area and identify trap operator, trappers operating without a license and outside of the law. When trapping laws are not followed, it leads to cruelty and suffering. Animals should not be left longer in trap lines than the time allows by law and traps should not be placed in locations that lead to incidental take of non-target animals. This is a common sense reform that everyone can agree to. And for these reasons, we urge a favorable vote. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Jennifer Bevan Dangle. I'm the state director for the Humane Society of the United States. You've already heard our expert testimony. I simply wanna reiterate our appreciation for the Senator for working very diligently with us to include the Trappers Association in the conversations to include DNR in the conversations so that we could have a bill that all the parties could be comfortable with. We do think that having the identification number creates a layer of protection for the trappers. We don't want personal identification, you know, laying around. And so we think that this bill sort of threads that needle. We're creating stronger protections, but it's really focused on enforcement and the ability of DNR to enforce. So we appreciate all the work that's gone into this bill in advance. Okay, any question for the panel? Hmm. Seeing none, that concludes the bill hearing on Senate Bill 275. And the final two bills of the day are both from Senator Karen Lewis-Young. We are going to start. The first bill is um, Senate Bill 4, uh, Senate Bill 390. No, I'm sorry. Do you have a preference? Which bill do you want? Uh, this is the request to go with 483. Okay, we're going to go with Senate Bill 483. And you do have four witnesses as your sponsor panel, three in person, one virtual. Uh, I'm going to call them up here, Caitlin uh, Schmidt, Bill Costelli, uh, Annie Richards, and Dom Dominic Butchko uh, are in person. Uh, let's see. I think that's it. So the... We're going to start with uh, Senate Bill, again, 483, Senator Lewis Young. Uh, you've got all the time you need to describe the bill. Thank you very much. 
This bill should sound very familiar to several of you, including those of you that crossed the street with me, because uh, it was passed by this committee last year. Unfortunately, it was on second reader at Sine Die. Uh, nevertheless, I'm going to give you a little bit of history and a reminder of what it does uh, and an update for those of you that haven't heard it before. It's called the Private Well Safety Bill. It was heard in the House in 2020, 2021, and 2022. In 2021, my cross filer established a work group uh, to bring all the stakeholders together to work out the problems with the bill. Those st stakeholders included MDE, the Center for Progressive Reform, Clean Water Action, and the Southeast Rural Community Assistance Program. So let me tell you what the problem is that this bill is designed to address. Nearly one million of Maryland residents rely on private wells as an essential resource to provide safe and clean drinking water. Private well users around the state continue to be left with contaminated water and little or no support for identification and remediation. Contaminated water frequently includes nitrates uh, and nitrates can cause a variety of diseases including cancer, um, something called blue baby syndrome, uh, which means that the uh, breathing is obstructed and it can be fatal, and also uh, pregnancy complications. So without testing resources, it's also very difficult to identify these nitrates because they're odorless, they're colorless, and they're tasteless. Uh, Maryland doesn't have a very good program in place compared to other states. So we're going to anticipate some of the other state questions. 22 other states do offer free or low cost test kits. 12 other states require testing of private wells during a property transfer. 40 states actually maintain a public database with information about the health of private wells. We have made some progress in our state, but we do lag behind many other states when it comes to private well protections. There was a report in 2020, it was released by the Center of Progressive Reform, and the research found that Maryland ranked among the five lowest states in terms of our protections. So again, our state doesn't offer free or low cost test kits, maintain a public database of well water quality testing, or offer financial assistance to economically challenged residents. And that's what the correction in this bill is aimed to do. Also, a 2020 study, which was produced by another group, identified Maryland's lower eastern, eastern shore as being particularly vulnerable. And I quote from the study, cancer patients were more likely to live in homes supplied by private well water compared to individuals in the general regional population. So what's the solution? A survey conducted in 2021 identified the fact that 98% of respondents, that's in our state, of course, would support efforts to, uh, to provide free, low-cost test kits to private well owners. 85% would support grants for cleanup or remediation. So SB 483 does three things. It creates a fund to provide eligible residents with financial assistance to cover the cost of testing and remediation, if need be, to their well. Uh, this is unfunded, so it's contingent on the governor providing funding. Just for comparison to another state, 
because you've probably looked at the fiscal note. Wisconsin, which is a similar size, provides $2 million a year for a similar program. And I do want to speak for the to the fiscal note for a minute. Um, I do think uh, the fiscal note is overstated for a variety of reasons. Uh, one being after the implementation of the program after startup, I don't see the ongoing costs being as high. Also, um, there are fees associated with the application for both the testing and the remediation, and we rarely ever see fee income in a fiscal note to balance the uh, expenses. There's a third reading uh, reason. And that is that the database um, information will be inputted by our county health department. So a large part of the, the labor will come from our county. So I'm not sure it entirely necessitates for full-time employees. The second thing the bill does is it requires MDE to create this online data database, which I've talked about. And the results I mentioned will be populated by county health departments. The third thing the bill does is it requires water quality testing during the sale of a home. The buyer is responsible for the costs, but both parties can agree to waive the testing requirements if they choose. This was a an amendment that was added last year in the bill, and I suspect that uh, one of the panel members will talk to that. Uh, MDA can establish a grant to an eligible county, and the county's obligation is to publicize the program and make our residents aware of it. And you will see in the testimony that we have a couple of counties in support of this bill and they're willing to take on that responsibility, which means both database update as well as advertising and communication. But if a county chooses not to participate, an individual can still apply, they would have to do that directly. So communication is a bit more difficult, but we still have an avenue. So in conclusion, uh, we need to take action given our standing compared to the rest of the nation, as well as our health issues for the well-being of our residents. And this bill, I believe, is really necessary to protect the thousands of our residents who utilize uh, private wells, and it would be a good step in that direction. Thank you so much. Okay, Senator, why don't you just pass it? We'll go down the aisle. Why don't you pass it to right. left the mic? Everybody's got two and a half minutes at this point. Chair Feldman, Vice Chair Kagan, my name is Caitlin Schmidt. I am a senior policy analyst here from the Center for Progressive Reform here in support of Senate Bill 483. Um, the informal work group that Senator Young referred to um, was made up of environmental and public health NGOs, county health directors, and staff from the Maryland Department of the Environment. That work group decided on three main goals, which this bill supports. One, safe drinking water for all. Two, financial assistance for residents to test and address their contaminated well water. And lastly, enhance public data on Maryland groundwater and drinking water sources. So what this boils down to is whereas public water is tested and maintained on a daily, base to daily basis to ensure that it meets safe drinking water levels, the health importance of periodic testing, appropriate treatment, and maintenance of private wells is often overlooked by residents. We put out a study um, called the Lower Eastern Shore Well Water Initiative, where we learned that most, most of the constituents on there didn't realize that they needed to test their water annually. Many had not tested their water in the last 10 years. Um, so it's just really important to educate folks on the importance of testing. So annual testing at a minimum is the most cost-effective way to ensure the ongoing water quality of a private well. 
Uh, Maryland should join the 24 other states that offer low or no cost test kits to residents. But testing isn't the only need. Um, if testing reveals that drinking water has been contaminated at, at unsafe levels, the cost of remediating can be prohibitive for many. So Maryland can help ensure safe drinking water for all by joining the 13 other states that offer assistance to residents with contaminated well water. Lastly, at least 37 other states have databases with basic information related to private wells and well water quality. Um, so Marylanders really deserve access to this basic information. I just wanted to briefly respond to the fiscal note. Um, on page seven, it mentions that um, the uh, that all the testing and sampling under this bill is intended, in, or let me uh, take a step back, all the testing and sampling under this bill is intended to be conducted by private state laboratories, not to be confused with the state laboratories within the laboratories administration. Um, so just that that point is, is, is moot. Um, and then lastly, the minimum testing criteria under the bill is actually established through the definition of water quality testing on page three. I'm running out of time, so I will just say with that, I urge a favorable report. Okay, very good. Uh, Ma'am. Good afternoon again, Chair Feldman and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to present in testimony in favor of SB 483. My name is Annie Richards. Again, I am the Chester Riverkeeper with Shore Rivers on Maryland's eastern shore, a region dominated by agriculture, shallow water tables, and sandy soils. As Riverkeeper, I provide water quality information so that individuals and families can make informed decisions about recreating in their local waterways. The creation of a well water database will allow me to connect those same communities to information about the quality of their well water. For example, communities in and around St. Michael's, which is within Shore Rivers watersheds, struggle with unusually high arsenic levels. Mapping these high arsenic readings will provide residents with important health information about consuming water from their own properties and will afford more protections to new homeowners, as will requiring a well test during the sale of a home. I myself purchased a home last year, and as a riverkeeper, I was very interested to get my well and septic inspected, and I was shocked to find that Cell, well and septic inspections are the only two inspections that are not required by the state of Maryland, nor from a mortgage lender. This database will also aid organizations like Shore Rivers in our restoration efforts. Nitrate and ammonia pollution are consistently found in our lowest performing tributaries. However, point sources for this pollution are difficult to track. The database will be a tool in our belt to help track groundwater pollution and pinpoint land for restoration efforts. A 2018 study by University of Maryland assessed well water quality in Cecil, Kent, and Queen Anne's County, all of which are in Shore Rivers watersheds, and found nitrate contamination in 3% of the wells tested. Well contamination is a safety issue across the eastern shore and for all of Maryland, though many communities may not have the information or funds to protect themselves. Establishing a well safety fund will provide under-resourced communities with financial assistance to cover the costs associated with well testing and remediation when needed. In closing, SB 483 will provide credible data to communities, establish common sense requirements for well testing, and provide resources that help solve clean water inequities across Maryland. Thank you for your consideration, and I look forward to a favorable report. Okay, Mr. Costelli, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Bill Castelli on behalf of the Maryland Realtors, and we are also in support of the bill. I'll be pretty quick. Um, we support it. It brings new resources to homeowners. We also believe that the provisions regarding uh, information in the contract um, through amendments that were offered last year really conform it to processes that are already in place, especially with FHA insured loans where they do require a well test. So we think those uh, those amendments really conform it to that process, and we would encourage a uh, favorable report. Mr. Butch Butchko. Uh, Dominic Butchko, uh, Maryland Association of Counties. Um, I'm not going to belabor the point. Thank you very much, Senator, for introducing such a great bill. Um, I just want to say Frederick County is very much in support of this. They reached out to me. Um, you know this is a good bill. Common sense, good policy. Mer Mako urges a favorable report. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think uh, any question for the panel. Okay, seeing none, I think we've got one witness signed up. Um, but Emily Ranson, is she here? Oh, there you are, Emily. Come on up here. You. I can be real fast. I guess okay. I micro microphone then... for people at home. Uh, Emily Ranson with Clean Water Action. Uh, 
Me too. Everybody said great things. We urge a favorable report. Thank okay, you. Okay, very good. We do have uh, two virtual witnesses, though, we need to get to. Uh, Gabrielle Ross has signed up favorable. Uh, Ms. Ross, you've got two and a half minutes, and you again, signed up favorable. And thanks very much. Um, I'm going to echo my colleagues and save everybody some time this evening. Uh, me too. Thank you very much, and I urge a favorable report. Okay, I like the pattern here. And um, Favor with amendment, our final witness, virtual Marie Laporte. Um, Ms. Laporte. So I'm trying to start it. my video, but the host is not letting me. Okay, she's on it. We're going to get okay. you. There you go. All right, okay, thank you. There you go. Uh, favor um, with an amendment. So you, uh, it sounds like you have an amendment you want to propose. Yes, I, I actually am an enthusiastic supporter of this particular bill. I'm just kind of hoping we can go a little further. So my name is Marie Laporte. I'm a resident of uh, Baltimore County and have been for the last 28 years. Um, 25 of those years have been in my Reister's town, town home, which my husband and I had constructed for our then young family. Our home uses a well for water as do near the nearby homes in this pastoral section of our county. I'm embarrassed to say that our well has not been tested since 1998 which was required before occupancy and has not been tested for PFAS. A couple of months ago, I learned through friends in New Jersey of the extensive PFA contamination issues in New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania. Upon further investigation, I learned that Maryland also has several of these contamination hotspots around military installations. Imagine my surprise when I read that I lived about a mile from one such inst installation and hotspot, the Isidore Jackman Armory, which is now primarily used for reservist training. In addition, the armory is located next to the Chestnut Ridge Fire Station, which has practiced fire training using PFA-filled firefighting foam for many years. While far less was known about PFAS 25 years ago, the EPA now says that they are unsafe at any detectable level. I'm very concerned that while other nearby states are actively engaged in testing to understand environmental con contamination, little is being done in Maryland. Marylanders should know if their wells are contaminated and learn what can be done to minimize our exposure to these harmful chemicals and other chemicals. We need state legislators to show leadership in testing our water and provide guidance on what we can do to protect ourselves and our families. We need to better understand our water quality, document contamination and the causes, and support and remediation of our residents. This year is the 50th anniversary of the Maryland Environmental Policy Act, MEPA which asserted that every person has a fundamental and inalienable right to a healthful environment. I hope you'll provide a favorable review to SB 483, but I do hope you'll go further and consider inclusion of PFAS. Okay, thank you. Any questions for the witness? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the bill hearing on Senate Bill uh, 483, which brings us to our final bill for today, uh, Senate Bill 390. Uh, Senator Young, we do have... Um, We've got some sponsor panelists signed up. You want me to call them up? Lisa so like Radoff. Who they are. Uh, Lisa, Catherine uh, Flory, Jennifer Bevan Dangle, and um, let's see. And while they get seated, we have I'll... one other virtual uh, sponsor okay. panelist, but we'll let's go with the in person yeah. first, and then maybe we'll pop in uh, Megan McAndrew, who's waiting virtually as part of your panel, and then we'll take it from there. So, okay. Senator Lewis Young. Thank you very much. So um, this is a bill that I'm very passionate about. They tell you not to fall in love with your bill. I am in love with the victims of not doing anything more. So that's a disclosure. But even if you're not an animal lover, this bill is important because it's proven uh, through numerous scientific studies that pet ownership um, increases our health both our mental health and our physical health. So what this bill is about is getting greater access to health care uh, for shelter animals. There's a well-documented veterinarian shortage across the United States. In fact, a recent study, and there are numerous studies that support this, uh, claim that uh, there's going to be a dearth of about 15,000 veterinarians by 2030. So veterinarians are needed to take care of our pets and 75 million individual or families will be without vet care if 
you know, we don't do something about expanding vet care options. The group that's particularly hurt the hardest is our shelters, uh, because our shelters count on uh, local cost vet care, those that are willing to provide their time and their resources, either as a donation or for very low cost. And so what this bill is expand is trying to do is to expand the way in which we get our shelters uh, more care for these homeless animals. Most of the municipal and county animal shelters in our state don't have veterinarians on staff. So they do rely heavily on volunteers who can provide routine medical care. And many of these clinics are over capacity. Well, um, not clinic shelters, but the shelters do also provide clinics. At the same time, there's very intense community uh, pressure not to euthanize homeless animals. Now, what I've learned, because I've been doing this for about 30 years, uh, is that shelters really try uh, to not euthanize animals that are healthy and not a danger to others. But when they get too overcrowded, they have no choice. So it's a very difficult balancing act. And uh, I believe this bill will help. We need to prevent unnecessarily, unnecessary delays, particularly in vaccinations, for example, rabies vaccinations, because that's the number one priority. And that's a health to humans as well as animals. So if an animal can't get it, uh, comes in homeless or abandoned to a shelter, they can't really release it or put it up to for adoption to until it's had proper medical attention. The longer some animals stay in a shelter, the less adaptable they are. It's very traumatic. Uh, I have a neurotic puppy who stayed in a um, in a shelter too long, and so I can attest to that. Hopefully, someday he'll get over it. But I uh, want to do some comparison to some other states, because essentially what we're asking for here is some expansion. This is, for all intents and purposes, a scope of practice issue. For those of you that have been on the committee before, you've heard many scope of practice issues. So let me tell you about what some other states do. 40 other states have statewide requirements for rabies vaccinations, as does Maryland, but 15, along with the District of Columbia, allow for rabies vaccinations to be administered by non-veterinarians. 14 other states share reciprocity, you know what I mean, um, with other states. And in fact, some of our neighbors, such as Pennsylvania, um, and I think we have a few other neighboring states, are states that do share that. Uh, the, uh, I have a note on that. Oh, these all include a requirement that the vets who are sharing also get licensed in the other state. and. Many of them allow them to do that simply with their license from their home state, rather than requiring any documentation or standard licensing procedure. So there's no real compelling reason why we shouldn't, at a minimum, allow vet techs to uh, administer rabies vaccines, as does many other states, uh, and allow some form of reciprocity with our neighboring states. The provisions in this bill will uh, build on some existing practices in other states and take a step forward in proactively addressing the coming crisis and expanding critical medical care. 
Um, you might remember, I had mentioned scope of practice. You might mention, if you've been on this committee before, I cross-filed two bills with Senator Lamb over the past two years to administer uh, giving pharmacists the right to administer injectables uh, in order to expand those forms of health care. And one year it was for mental health and addiction issues. And last year it uh, was for um, SDIs. So we, we do have precedents for expanding um, vaccinations. So we have, um, you know, what I would call your classic you know, turf battle issue, scope of practice issue. And I think we can reach a happy medium. I have spoken with um, a number of the stakeholders. Uh, I have met with animal protection organizations on numerous or, uh, occasions. I've had two meetings uh, with the Veterinarian Medical Association and their representatives and a meeting with the Department of Agriculture. And you will see that there are many favorables with amendments. However, there's not a lot of consistency in the amendments. So what I've attempted to do is find some middle ground and a compromise. Uh, before I share with you what that compromise is, I do want to share one other piece of information about this out-of-state resistance issue. I happen to look up who are the top 10 or top 20 veterinarian training universities in the country. And interestingly enough, our neighboring states are among the top 20. Uh, University of Pennsylvania is ranked number seven, and Virginia Tech is ranked number 17. The University of Maryland does have a veterinarian college, but it partners with Virginia Tech to form the Virginia Maryland Regional College of Veterinarian Medicine program. So I find it a little bit inconsistent that there's a resistance to reciprocate with some of our neighboring states, but yet they're among the most respected trainers of veterinarians in the country. And we even partner with one of them for our own program. So as I mentioned, I'm trying to find common ground, offer a compromise. Let me tell you the extremes without reading all the amendments. On the one hand, you have the shelters that want to expand scope of practice as much as possible because they are straining for more health care, more vaccination, more wellness exams, so they can move their animals out into forever homes. On the other extreme, we have um, a very limited desire for a expansion of scope of practice uh, that makes it very difficult to either have vet techs uh, do some vaccinations as well as to reciprocate with other veterinarians for some mineral minimal health care protections. So here is the amendment that I have offered. It does three things. I've received very positive feedback from my initial meetings, but no confirmation yet. One, it permits vet techs to administer vaccinations in shelters under the supervision of a licensed veterinarian. And we all know from scope of practice, this is not uncommon. It allows out of state vets to do vaccinations such as rabies vaccinations. 
and limited diagnostic efforts like tests for Lyme disease or um, for heartworm. Now, they wouldn't be able to correct that, but they could do the diagnostic testing. However, the third item is a process to allow them to do more functions, uh, which is at a minimum uh, a wellness exam. So if an out-of-state veterinarian is in the process of licensing in Maryland, we would allow them to do examinations as well as, well as the prior two functions that I mentioned. And why I say in the process is there has been a slowdown in licensing. We received testimony from an individual who said she had waited weeks uh, to get approval of her license in Maryland. Uh, so those are my compromise amendments. I am hoping that everybody can come together on them and that we can get our kittens and puppies into forever homes. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Why don't we pass the uh, baton down the aisle? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, my name is Jennifer Bevan Dangle. I'm the state director for the Humane Society of the United States here in Maryland. Uh, the, the senator has explained the bill possibly better than I even could, because uh, as you can tell, this is something she's very passionate about. I do want to clarify where the bill came from. How this issue came before you was a series of conversations this summer and this fall with our shelter partners, where we simply said to them, what are the greatest struggles you're facing? What are the legislative fixes that would most directly make your lives easier when we know you are inundated and overwhelmed with pets at the moment? And this was the issue that rose to the top. These two small and, and we thought sort of surgical and strategic changes to expand just the basic health care that our shelters can provide. Because if these animals don't have the vaccinations they need, if these shelters can't go into your communities and offer low cost vaccination clinics, then we're not just putting animals at risk in our shelters, but we're truly putting at risk animals in the community as well. So that is the goal of this legislation. We do think that the Senator's sort of compromise amendment threads this needle in a, in a fair and balanced way, certainly uh, compromises the art of everyone walking away a little bit unhappy. And I, I think that it probably gets us there where everyone could ask for a little bit more, but this will significantly help with the ability of the low cost clinics to go out to keep your members safe. It is really important to keep in mind that while yes, these vaccinations need to be done and they need to be done properly, the greatest danger in a shelter or in your community is a completely unvaccinated animal. And we are not talking about family members who would you know, otherwise be able to just go and make a veterinary appointment and get the care they need for their animals. We're talking about the very tragic reality that we have community members with pets who are not able to meet state law that requires these vaccinations because of financial cost burdens. We don't want those pets ending up in a shelter because the family couldn't afford to vaccinate, but we also don't want those animals remaining unvaccinated in community. So when we're talking about allowing just a little bit more ability of our shelter partners to do what they do, keeping in mind, as the Senator said, that many of these shelters do not have veterinarians on staff, that they are reliant on vet techs and the sort of charity of veterinarians to come in and do this work. We think this bill will make a significant step forward with the amendments that the Senator has proposed. So thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Feldman and members of the committee. My name is Catherine Flory. I am the treasurer of the Paul's organization, as well as the community care and advocacy director for the Maryland SPCA. Um, you have heard from, from my colleagues how important this bill is. And when we talk about passion, I'm right there too. I'm so incredibly passionate about this bill. Um, I actually am one of the people that, that talked to HSUS about how important this is. I work in a shelter in Baltimore City. I have been there for almost 18 years. I have never seen the crisis that we are in right now until this year. We can't find vets. And I really do think of my shelter specifically as more like the Disney world of the animal shelters. And we can't find vets. We have amazingly trained technicians that are unable to do a simple job of vaccinating an animal because of this law. And I under completely understand um, 
that veterinarians may be concerned about that. But but let me be clear that we're not trying to take anything away from volunteer from veterinarians. We are trying to make it easier for them to allow them to focus on the veterinary medicine where they can get the support from technicians to ensure that these animals are vaccinated. On top of that, and what I do in our shelter, we provide about uh, 13 clinics into the community. We go to the under-resourced communities where we are seeing animals that have never been vaccinated and they might be eight or nine years old. We need to ensure that we are vaccinating animals in the community as well as animals in our shelters so that we don't get into a public health crisis. And I understand the amendment of um, under supervision, which you know I think is absolutely open to talk about with that amendment. My only concern is when there is no event on staff, what does that supervision mean? Does that vet have to be over the shoulder or could they give that permission? But we really do need to, to really think about this issue. And I am asking for a favorable report and for all of you to really think about the pets and the people. We're trying to do the best for everybody and become the most progressive state when it comes to this, which I know Maryland is. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, Lisa, your last. Good evening. Um, Chair Feldman, Vice Chair Kagan, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. I know the hour is late. Um, I want you to know that, that the kind of testimony that you just heard is what we at Maryland Votes for Animals and HSUS have been hearing over the summer, which is why we feel that this is such an important bill. Um, the sponsors' amendments, we absolutely support and would be open to that. We hope that everybody can come to an agreement. We understand that there are a lot of stakeholders we're definitely not trying to step on toes. We're trying to vaccinate so and take care of animals, paws and all. So anyway, just wanted to make you think about the importance, the public health aspect to this bill, as opposed to just loving the animals. We feel that this has a wider footprint. And as for your support of SB 390, thank you so much, Senator Lewis Young. I love the sound of that um, for sponsoring this bill. Okay, Senator Gallion. Thank you. Just a few questions. So uh, thank you for bringing this bill forward and, and your willingness to work with different parties to try to make this a collaborative uh, thing. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, licensure scope of practice issues that we deal with and have dealt with for years in this committee. Um, you know, I, I farm, so deal with some large animal vets. And I know before I had a veterinarian, they were based in Pennsylvania, but they had their certifications in Maryland. So with this, as well as Pennsylvania. So with this, would I uh, say if somebody out of state, would they still have to have their Maryland license or or not? So the bill, and, and I'll speak to it as amended, which I do apologize because I know that's not in front of you, um, but the bill with the senator's proposed amendments, the goal is to allow out-of-state veterinarians to come in solely to support shelters with the bare minimum of care even if those veterinarians are not licensed, then there's a, I know there's a veterinarian on the call, on the Zoom rather, apologies, who can speak to how a lot of our shelters service across state lines and, and it's hard for the vets to, you know, come in and be responsive to come to a vet clinic. If there's a big seizure to come support that seizure, you know, these are things that pop up that sometimes test the capacity of our local shelters. But the goal is to really limit those services that can be provided. And the bill started off with a fairly narrow list and we're very willing to work with the sponsor to narrow it down even further. If we could just allow vets to come across state lines and vaccinate, it would do a world of good for our community clinics if we could allow them to come across state lines and just test for parvo and all these other sort of quick diagnostic tests it would ease up a lot of capacity and that's you know we think a very small step as far as what we're allowing out of state vets to do solely in a shelter setting and solely with these you know vaccinations and diagnostic tests to follow up on that yeah. so so like an unlicensed veterinarian be able to use or administer anesthetics no. Okay, great. And then one last thing. Um, can an unlicensed vet complete a health certificate? So as the amendment is structured, a veterinarian that is seeking um, and is actively seeking a state license could do a wellness exam. And I don't know that how we've spelled out the health certificates under that. If they're not actively seeking a, a health exam, or I mean, sorry, a license, apologies, the hour is late. They aren't actively seeking the license, then they would be limited to only just vaccinations and diagnostic tests. And again, that is to the amended version. So we understand that the, the Veterinary Medical Association had concerns over the bills initially drafted, and, and we're trying to be responsive to that. 
Okay, any additional questions for the uh, panel? We've got uh, Vice Chair Kagan. Thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will be truly brief. I just wanted to say that twice I have adopted uh, cats, once from a street, once from a barn. And last August, I got my new kitty um, from a shelter. And the fact that she had the whole spay neutering thing, I didn't have to deal with the vaccination. I didn't have to deal with, I mean, there were other issues from coming with a, uh, a shelter kitty, but, uh, but there was a lot that I didn't have to deal with. So little public service announcement for folks who are thinking about getting, uh, getting a little one. Um, shelters are a good way to go. Thank you for the, for the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. We've got one uh, virtual witness signed up as part of your uh, panel. So why don't we try to get her on the line and then we'll knock out the in-person folks. Uh, Megan McAndrew, is Ms. McAndrew on there? Is she signed up uh, favorable? Yeah. Uh, Ms. McAndrew, you are part of the sponsor panel and you've got two and a half minutes. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, as stated, my name is Dr. Megan McAndrew and I'm the National Medical Advisor for Humane Rescue Alliance um, in DC, but we currently support um, partners across the nation, including here in Maryland, uh, particularly here in Maryland. In addition to speaking on behalf of Humane Rescue Alliance, I'm also here today speaking as a Maryland licensed veterinarian and resident of Charles County. Um, as mentioned, you know, there is an extreme veterinary shortage, which we're feeling deeply in the profession, but also those seeking veterinary care. Um, as mentioned, you know, the cost is, is awfully prohibitive um, and is becoming higher as veterinarians are becoming in more and more shortage. Um, and, and people just can't make the appointments. Um, you know, I've seen in DC many clients show up and say, I have to surrender my animal because if I don't have them vaccinated, then they can't stay in my home, but I can't get a veterinary appointment or, you know, there's all sorts of hindrances. And in DC, we are able to vaccinate in shelter, um, including for rabies. So we're able to send those people back with their animals at this, at that time. Um, I think it, it's an extremely critical community and public health, um, issue that we need to proactively address. Uh, and, and it's only going to get worse, you know, as the veterinary shortage continues. Um, there are proven and viable solutions. Uh, I've been in shelter medicine for over 15 years. And the majority of that time I've spent in North Carolina and DC. Um, in both reg regions, I've trained uh, non-veterinarians how to administer rabies vaccinations. It's technically very simple. Um, and it's just something that furthers public health. Um, you know, I know there's some opposition saying that non-veterinarians shouldn't be allowed to administer rabies vaccines because it's universally fatal if a human acquires rabies, if they get transmitted uh, rabies. But with the limitations that we have now and staff who can actually provide those vaccines, we're only going to do more harm to public health by not having the availability, availability of those vaccines to begin with. Um, I think it's a, it's a crisis, um, and I think, you know, I'm licensed in six states just so I can try to help other shelters uh, try to keep up with spay and neuter, try to keep up with vaccinations, try to keep up with ba basic health care for these animals. And meanwhile, these animals are sitting there dying, becoming ill, and, you know, Maryland is euthanizing for space. So I, I, I am supportive of the bill, and I really hope you consider passing it for both the public health as well as um, the animal side of things. Okay, any questions for the witness? Okay, seeing none. Um, thank you for your testimony. We actually, there was David Luck, uh, Luckenbaugh. Is Mr. Luckenbaugh here in the audience? He wasn't able to make it. He is the director of the Frederick County Animal Shelter, okay. and they've had some emergencies this week. So okay. he um, submitted written testimony. Okay, fair enough. Um, we're going to go then through the rest of the in person. I'm just going to call folks up fill up the stand. And I think um, we've got Ashley Nichols, Robert Silcox, Megan Noyes, Noyes, Nathaniel Bone, Christine Calvert. Okay. Uh, okay. Why don't we go that we're almost through this the witness list, but um, why don't we start in uh, far right here? Uh, okay, just why don't you grab the mic and tell us who you are? Yeah, why don't you grab the mic, tell us who you are? We're just going to go down the aisle. Okay. Hi, I'm two and a half minutes. Thank you. Uh, I'm Nathaniel Bowen. I'm with the State Veterinary Board. I'm currently the, the executive director. 
Um, I'm also here with Christine Calvert, um, who will be giving the majority of our testimony for the vet board. Um, but I just wanted to stress the importance of licensing for the board's ability to be able to regulate veterinary medicine. Um, the act of licensing is what gives us the authority to ensure that veterinarians and RVTs are upholding the standards within the state as set by our regulations. Um, registered veterinary technicians, I'm sorry. Um, uh, that, that's really all I wanted to say. Most, like I said, most of it is gonna be with uh, Christine Calvert. Thank you. Okay, well, actually, since you mentioned her and you guys are together, why don't you go next and Great. We'll, yeah. we'll rotate back. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm Dr. Christine Calvert, and I'm here um, as a member of the State Board of Veterinary Medical Examiners. Um, you know, I had a written piece, but I'm just going to kind of address some of the things that were brought up, you know, just to show our position for that. So I did have a brief chance to read the amendments that Senator Young um, put forth uh, last evening. Um, I think our biggest issue, we'll just talk about the out-of-state vets to start with, um, like Nathan had mentioned, the problem is without them having a Maryland license, we have no recourse. So if there's any type of issue with what they do, and I know they kind of took out the spay neuter because obviously, I mean, that's a major surgery, even though it's a routine surgery, it is a major abdominal surgery to do a spay on a dog or a cat. So I just want to clarify that. But even if we're doing these diagnostic tests, like she said, they, you know, anybody can run a heart room test or a Lyme disease test, but then who's going to interpret those tests and then treat those? And if there's no veterinarian at the facility, then do they have to go to their community vet to get that done? Is the community vet then going to need to repeat the test anyway, because they don't know under what circumstances that test was done or the quality or the control of that. So that's, you know, one concern I had with that. The other thing with the wellness exam, and even, you know, you alluded to the health certificates, you know, health certificates are major things, and there's different types of health certificates. There's one that's uh, USDA regulated, and you need an, a USDA certification in order to do those types of health certificates for any type of international travel. It's an AFIS 7001 form, you know, even interstate, especially Hawaii or certain states require those types of international health certificates. So I think that definitely should be off the table for unlicensed Maryland veterinary or, you know, unlicensed vets in Maryland because that requires, you know, two levels of certification in addition to the Maryland license. Um, you know, again, the process of getting a license in Maryland when they said several weeks, honestly, I had to chuckle to myself. I don't feel like that's too long to wait for a license because there are multiple steps that go into that. Um, you know, as a member of the veterinary board for the last four years, we've heard a lot of cases involving complaints with, you know, just where a vaccine is given, vaccine reactions, over vaccinating pets, um, you know, and the uh, to differentiate the rabies vaccine is unique and that that's the only one that's a legal requirement. And that is, you know, part of the state health department's requirements. It also is the only vaccine that requires a written health certificate or a written certificate of vaccination signed by a veterinarian. Distemper vaccines, Bordetella, Lyme, Lepto, veterinary assistants can give those under direct supervision even now as our statute stands, but only veterinarians can give the rabies because we have to sign that certificate. And if we allow that to people who aren't licensed, whether it be, you know, even RVTs, we're okay with that amendment for RVTs, but not just lay people to give those rabies vaccines. Okay, thank you. Why don't we, um, we'll go back over to the other side. Yeah. Tell us your name. Hi, yes. Um, my name is Dr. Ashley Nichols. I am a licensed um, Maryland veterinarian, um, as well as uh, the president of the Maryland Veterinary Medical Association, uh, or president-elect, I'm sorry. Um, I am, you know, I am here because I care, just like every one of us. So we're all veterinarians, and it's not that we want to continue to make these pets wait and things like that. It's that we want to make sure things are done properly, not um, having pets or veterinarians come in from other states that are not licensed in the state of Maryland provides a double standard that makes it so that they are not, these animals are not quote unquote worthy of having the same standard of medicine that we're practicing here in the state because they don't have the same regulations. So we need to be very careful because I believe all pets deserve proper veterinary care. Um, as for the, um, you know, increasing access and things like that, there is a way, and I believe everybody who owns a pet, who loves them, we all love our pets. Um, but increasing the access to veterinary care is a very um, important thing to do. I think everyone, we should 
the more we can try to increase um, access to veterinary care, it would be great, but we need to do it without risking animal wealth and health. Um, and by not licensing veterinarians, we're playing a very tricky thing. And by allowing um, vaccination with the rabies without proper supervision. And what I'm saying by proper supervision is currently the terminology of supervision means that they don't have to be in the building. What I'm recommending and goes along with the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Health, and the State Board of Veterinary Medical Examiners is direct supervision of registered veterinary technicians, meaning there's a veterinarian in the building, maybe spaying, maybe neutering, and the technician is over here working and things like that. But currently there's a lot of requests to not even have a veterinarian in the building, but they still have to sign off on that certificate. And I think it's very dangerous. So um, with that being said, I support this bill with the proper amendments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Dr. Robert Silcox. I'm a practicing veterinarian in Hartford County, Maryland, um, past president of the Maryland Veterinary Medical Association. I also am past president of the Humane Society of Hartford County and a volunteer veterinarian for the Humane Society of Hartford County. So I know what these uh, issues are. I am sensitive to them. Um, and uh, we are uh, favorable for this bill if we can come to the to the best amendments. Um, the the recommendations by um, the Department of Health and the State Board of Veterinary Medical Examiners are really the things that we are kind of looking for. Um, the one thing I wanted to uh, kind of comment on is the, the shortage of veterinarians in Maryland and across the country. Um, this, this bill in its current form, even allowing um, reciprocity, uh, doesn't necessarily increase the number of veterinarians really to truly ad address that shortage in this state. Um, our lawmakers, uh, the Department of Agriculture, the University of Maryland, um, the Veterinary Medical Association, um, we need to work together to obtain more seats at the Virginia Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine for Maryland students, and then consider incentives that would bring them back to Maryland so after they've graduated so that they would do this kind of work. Um, so that we can fill these needs, so that we, we can uh, plug up these holes and have a sustainable solution rather than uh, trying to bring in uh, um, unlicensed uh, veterinarians that are uh, going to potentially dilute um, our, our uh, standard of care. Um, and really that's the kind of the main thing that I wanted to get to is this bill does not necessarily address that shortage. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Why don't you? Uh... Uh, my name is Megan Noyce. I'm a practicing veterinarian here in Annapolis at the. In well, why don't you put that mic a little closer? Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, my name is Megan Noyce. I'm a practicing veterinarian here in Annapolis at the at the Anne Arundel Vet Emerge Clinic, and I live in Calvert County. Um, I think to echo a lot of the points that my colleagues have made, we are sensitive to the fact that there is a veterinary shortage. It impacts all of us in in the work that we do every day. Um, I think our concern is that, again, this does not address that shortage. It is a nationwide shortage. Every state in this country doesn't have enough veterinarians, and there are other ways to um, to try and alleviate that problem in the state, and allowing unlicensed veterinarians to practice here um, puts us at risk at reducing our standard of care. The Maryland Board of Veterinary Medical Examiners works really hard to keep our standard of care up and protect all the animals, whether they're shelter animals or whether they're our pets. Yes, shelters face very unique challenges and they do require special consideration that we get these patients seen and treated and vaccinated into a home as soon as possible. But they also deserve that we protect that standard of care and don't give them any less than what, you know, a pet going to a regular clinic would have. And yes, we support registered veterinary technicians giving rabies vaccines um, under the supervision of a veterinarian um, because we do want these animals vaccinated. But 
there's a huge concern about um, non-registered clinic staff giving vaccinations, um, both from a training standpoint. Training varies from shelter to shelter and clinic to clinic. Um, you you don't know if if a kennel assistant is trained enough to give a vaccine, and then it's our license on the line signing those rabies certificates. So it's a matter of we need to protect the animals, we need to protect the standard of care in the state, and we need to protect the liability and, and the human um, rabies is obviously transmissible to humans. So we need to protect all of these factors and, and having unregulated, unlicensed veterinarians doing these functions in the state is not the answer. Thank you. I see Senator Karen Lewis-Young itching to push her light. Um, okay. Um, I have heard the expression unlicensed veterinarians numerous times, but clearly they're licensed in their state. So I want to ask a question, and I'll focus on Pennsylvania and um, Virginia, because I'm very familiar with Pennsylvania, uh, started a not-for-profit in 1990 called Lycoming Animal Protection Society, and it's still going strong today. So I work very closely with vets in Pennsylvania. What is it about Maryland licenses versus Pennsylvania or Virginia that has some of the best veterinarian training in the country that um, you all feel uh, results in better safety and health outcomes for, for animals? Where is, is Maryland's licensing stronger? Yeah. yeah, I'm going to respond to that initially. Again, as you know, a veterinarian board member, I think it's not that we feel like those veterinarians don't have the level of care that we do here in Maryland. It's that we don't have any regulatory authority over them if they don't have a license. So say a veterinarian from Pennsylvania comes in, they you know do a spay and they leave an ovary in there, and then we get a complaint to the veterinary board. If they're not licensed in Maryland, we have no recourse. We can't do anything for that client or that owner. Okay, but you did hear that we said we were not looking for uh, veterinarians from out of state to right. do spaying and neutering, right. just very basic functions that, and to even do health wellness exams, they had to be in the process of applying for a Maryland license. And we do have numerous examples of uh, reciprocal agreements mm -hmm. with other states. Right. Understood. And that's what I said. You know, I, I mean, the regulations or the requirements to get a Maryland license aren't that hard. I mean, the main thing is you have to get letters of good standing from your other you know, states. And honestly, sometimes those states are the ones holding it up, not necessarily the Maryland you know, licensing board as far as those approvals. And like I mentioned, too, and when I was doing my initial testimony is even the, you know, you, you were mentioned the diagnostics, but then, then what, like if there is a positive, you know, then what? So, and again, it just, you know, obviously there can be vaccine reactions and that type of thing, but it just, we see a lot of issues, even as so far as the rabies certificate, like we mentioned, you know, there are certain things in the Maryland statute that have to be on there. And if that veterinarian doesn't put those on there, and then that owner has an improper rabies certificate, their animal may not be considered vaccinated. So then again, where do we go to? It's just, that, that's the accountability with the Maryland license. Okay. Uh, so, okay. Oh, just not only with that, just to pinpoint on your concern um, on that aspect, I think you were going to pinpoint yeah, on it. Just a, a real quick comment. Um, I When I first graduated, I uh, held license in New York, so I worked there for a little while and in Maryland. Um, the, the, reciprocity, uh, you, you still have to, in my understanding, you still have to have a license in, in that state. state. Yeah. Um, which means you have to go to that state, you have to fill out that application, you have to um, uh, pay the fee for that license, and then you're given that license for uh, working in Pennsylvania, Delaware, Virginia. Maryland's not any different. The, the, I think the concern that is stated within the, within the, the bill or the, the, the request that's within the bill is that we circumvent that process. And th that pathway is still there, and it's not difficult um, it took uh, me, it, it, when I was getting mine, it took me about 30 days of a couple of years ago, um, to be fully licensed in the state. 
many of the states that have the reciprocity have six months or longer to become licensed in the state. So they do reciprocity to try to shorten that or provide a temporary license. And that's not something. Okay, why don't we, uh, Senator Gallion? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and the gentleman in the middle um, mentioned about the Hartford Humane Society. So uh, a few months back, we adopted a cat there. Uh, we got a great experience, uh, did a terrific job. So we really appreciate that. A cat named Reagan to replace our cat that passed away a year ago named Lincoln, if you see any kind of pattern there. <laughs> uh, but to, <laughs> to my uh, to my question, um, the other day, and, and this is a perfect panel to answer this question. The other day I was at Tractor Supply in Aberdeen and they have like this pet vet there. And I just looked them up. They can do vaccinations, flea and tick, testing, microchipping, uh, no appointment needed, no office visit fee. How do they fit into everything like that? So they are a licensed Maryland veterinarian running what is essentially a vaccine clinic. So it's like you going, um, remember back in the beginning of COVID where they were having COVID vaccine clinics and it was, that's essentially what this is, only you're allowed to get microchipped, heartworm tested, sometimes heartworm prevention. So that is actually a licensed veterinarian performing those services. So a veterinarian on site the whole yeah. time. That, there? That's correct. Yes. yes, that's correct. There's a veterinarian on site that's giving the rabies vaccines there. Yeah. Yeah. And on top of that, the facility that they are using is also inspected to ensure that the vaccine is stored properly. OK, that, thank you for answering that. I've, last few times I've been in there, I've seen that. And I just was curious how that all worked. Thank you. OK, before we move to our final witness or two, any uh, other final questions of this panel? OK, seeing none. Um, is uh, is Keith Sobel? OK, Mr. Sobel, you have the distinction of being, I think, the final witness yes. on this piece of legislation. We warmed it up for you. And the wrap up for the day here in the committee. So you've got two and a half minutes. So glad to have everyone's full attention right at the end. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dr. Keith uh, Sobel. I'm a Maryland licensed veterinarian. Uh, I'm, a, um, I'm boarded in small animal internal medicine. I currently work for Southern Veterinary Partners. We are a, a company that uh, I oversee uh, 18 veterinary hospitals in the state of Maryland and Virginia. Um, fortunately, a lot of uh, what I have to say has been covered already. And glad to know that the amendments have removed the the uh, spay neuter aspect of of it um, again because with your question about anesthesia uh, the DEA with controlled substances taking all that away certainly makes this a much more uh, uh, um, acceptable bill in in my opinion so I was glad to glad to see that um, I, I certainly appreciate all the work that that the shelters uh, and rescue organizations do I I will tell you that the last four of my dogs came from such organizations. Um, can't live without them. In fact, I have four of them waiting at home for me tonight. Uh, and uh, I, I think the work that they do is phenomenal. It's very important. One of the things that I worry about, though, when we talk about the the um, understaffing and, and the low numbers of, of veterinarians, it is a problem that we see uh, not just in shelter medicine, but food animal medicine, rural medicine. There are other areas. And trying to circumvent how the board functions and how they work and how veterinarians are regulated by the state, I think kind of gets away from the real problem. And I think that there are other ways that we can try and address it. Again, whether it is is some sort of um, debt relief, tuition relief for those students to uh, encourage them to come back to serve in certain areas of, of veterinary medicine, certain areas of, of the state, working with shelter medicine. I think those are all great. I think the idea of circumventing how the system works uh, and allowing, bless you, and allowing for uh, unlicensed veterinarians in the state of Maryland is is definitely a problem. And I don't know that there's this great rush of people wanting to come into Maryland to, to do this work. There is a shortage everywhere. Uh, and if they do, getting a license in Maryland is very easy. It's $150. Um, you need 18 hours of CE, and it takes about a month to get. So it's very easy to do. I personally have three veterinary licenses for Maryland, New York, and Virginia, and my wife, who is an equine veterinarian, has six. So getting and maintaining these licenses is is pretty easy to and straightforward. And I think finding better ways to serve the shelter is is really what we should what we should focus on. Okay. I will now answer everybody's questions. Yes. We've got our attention. I will speak for everyone. Okay. Any um, any questions for our witness? 
our final witness. Seeing none, that no. concludes. Thank you, committee. I appreciate yes, it. That concludes the bill hearing on Senate Bill 390, and that concludes the work of the committee for today, February 2000.